Audio book title, Steel and Mana, 01-35, by Corti. Chapter 1, Death and Rebirth. My name is Leon, and currently, I am in a very long line, waiting for reincarnation. And no, I am not joking. Right now, I am floating along hundreds of others, forming a straight line on a rainbow road in the middle of the grand nothingness. I tried looking left, right, up and down, but there was nothing but the infinite cosmos and the rainbow road under my feet, or, well, under me, as my feet are mangled horridly, facing the wrong way. Both of them, I can see the bones sticking out, but I feel no pain, and they aren't bleeding, maybe because my head is also not where it should be, still, it is being held by my only remaining arm, which listens to my thoughts. It's just I am at eye level with my innards hanging out of my stomach. Dude. What the hell happened to you? I hear the man behind me ask. Turning my head around, I met the eyes of a middle-aged guy with half of his face missing and his brain hanging out like some kind of jelly, constantly trembling as he moved his mouth. I was run over by an FMTV. What the hell is that? He recoiled, almost letting the brain slip out from his skull. A military truck from the past century. The damned driver was an amateur, when we were getting it out of storage. The idiot floored it, and it ran me over and blew me into pieces like some kind of banata. Damn. But from the past century? Do you mean from the 1900s? Some kind of World War I era shit, eh? I chuckled, from the 2000s. That isn't past century. It's 2004. Dude, you got rocked in the head by that truck harder than it looks. What 2004? It's 2144. I think you have some brain damage, mixing up the numbers of the calendar. Fuck you, you mangled cheese tart, he shouted, holding one hand against his brain, ensuring it stayed there. And what happened to you? I chortled, looked into the barrel of a gun. It wasn't discharging. Bwah ha ha ha. Fucking idiot. I burst out laughing. Making some of the others turn towards us. Joining in on the fun too. Fuck you. He blew out from his nose, hitting me, and my already badly bent remaining arm slipped, and I dropped my head. I saw it falling to the deep nothingness, seeing the road grow smaller and smaller, hearing the guy say it wasn't his fault. Idiot. Not that it matters. I died, and probably these are my last hallucinations before passing. My mind's manifestation was probably displaying the idiot who rode through me with that monster of a truck in this way. Just when I was starting to get my life into order. Typical me moment. I got myself a degree in robotics of past and present, and finally, I could afford a gene enhancement from the money I made from being hired by the military. Bye bye, memorizing all the books trying to learn them, I could simply use my brain like a search engine, recalling everything I have ever read. And they say you can't pay to win in real life. I was even courting a cute girl. Everything was too good to be true. Ha. Error. Contamination on the cosmic reincarnation system. A voice said, coming from every direction. Great. Now my severed head has become nothing more but contamination. You know what? Fuck you too. Beginning cleaning process. Even if I wanted, I couldn't scream as another worldly force washed me over and made my head disappear, leaving me with only my brain there, continuing to fall downwards. I don't know how I remained conscious, but I still saw, heard, and smelled everything. Error. Contamination is passing through the realm's border. Abandoning process. Initiating emergency reincarnation. Spatial coordinates found. Commencing transfer. Huh? I wanted to ask something, but with a poof, everything was gone and turned extremely dark. Was my brain finally destroyed, too? Or? No. I was still here. W wait. I hear something. Sloshing. Muffled voices? Exclamation mark. I managed to open my eyes, and I saw tiny hands before me. Floating in some fluid in the dark while I also saw an umbilical cord attached to my body. Shit, am I an embryo? Wait. The fact I can open my eyes and look at the shape of my body. My baby body? What the hell? Am I being reborn? Did my brain get dropped into an unborn child? Was it empty? Or did I squash the previous occupant? Damn it. I need answers. Maybe it was my trashing that made it happen, but I suddenly found myself getting pushed out getting born. I wanted to curse, 
but I couldn't. I was simply hoping that if all this was real, I was not too early. 102. Chapter 2, Growing Up. It turns out I wasn't dreaming. My weird experience was not a delirious dream while I was lying on the concrete floor after being run over by a monster of a vehicle. I indeed died. My head got pushed off from whatever I was standing on, and then I got dispatched into reincarnation. It probably shouldn't have happened that way, as I retained my memories and even my modified brain box. Just after coming out of my mother, the intense light pierced my eyes, making them water up, and the loud noises around me were just as painful to my ears. I tried covering it, flailing around, voicing my discontent with the whole situation, but I only managed to utter baby-like cries. Figures. It took me a day or two to get used to using my eyes, and finally, I could survey my surroundings. In those days, I was mostly in my mother's arms, who had long, blazingly red hair. She was a short but beautiful woman with breasts that would shame anyone I knew in my previous life. And now am I had the privilege of sucking on them daily. This isn't that bad after all Tilda. When I was not immersed in sucking out my tasty daily meals, I was memorizing the words and world around me. My father was surprisingly tall and built like a tank, making me a bit jealous. To be honest, he reminded me of the ancient depictions of gods from the classical era, not to mention his straight blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. I just hope I inherited his body, including his lady killer spear between his legs. Damn it. That thing was a weapon in itself, and I saw it in use. They never bothered with covering my crib when they went at it on the bed next to me. Not that I'm complaining. Besides that, I immediately recognized I was in a room that reminded me of old images of a medieval noble's chamber. Fancy rugs on the floor. A huge canopy bed. Paintings of my father in armor or in grandiloquent robes, on with my mother. Elaborate carvings decorated all the wooden furniture, even my crib looked like it should be in a museum or something. If my predictions were correct, I managed to be reborn into a life of privilege as some kind of noble's son. First born at that, as no siblings have come to visit me so far. Learning the language wasn't hard, I managed to do so by the time I turned one, surprising the two when I started speaking. In sentences, I may have taken this a bit too far as my father threw a banquet for me, deciding to name me officially before my second birthday, which was a custom in this era, it seemed, well, it was fine, but before they could bestow me with a name that went into the registry of the country, I myself suggested that I should be named Leon, now, with that, I have truly taken it too far as never before anything like this happened in history, I think. Luckily, my parents turned out to be extremely protective and good people as I was given the name Leon, and everyone was threatened by my father. If anyone leaked that his son was a bit abnormal, they would be cut into four pieces and thrown to the pigs, watching their maids, some invited lower-ranking nobles and merchants' faces, he wasn't joking. At that point, I understood why he was named the Lion of the Frontier, Kalash, while my mother had the unofficial title of Handler of Kalash. Louise. And I got myself the title Cub of Kalish. What's up with these people? To that question, I got my answer in the following years while growing up and being allowed to tour our robust, sturdy castle and its cold, stone corridors. When I first went to the battlements and looked at the mountainous region, my jaws dropped to the floor, seeing the picturesque scenery was a true gift. I still wasn't allowed to visit the town I could see from here. But if our home was the way it is, I not just reincarnated but also journeyed back in time. A lot. Still. The first time I laid my eyes on the scenery, I was utterly mesmerized. So, it was a worthy trade-off. The horizon was dominated by tall, snow-capped mountain ranges with a lush valley before us, dotted by small villages and pastures in the distance. I was born in the summer. Yet the air was still only around 20 Celsius, which made me realize the winters must be freezing out here. Our castle was located halfway up a mountain, looking over the expansive valley we were in. It wasn't a simple castle as it was also a fortress, guarding the passageway to the territory everyone called the frontier. By the myth and sagas my mother told me, it was a place filled with wild beasts and monsters that sometimes tried to come through and harass the people of Ishilia. 
At first, I didn't take it seriously, but it was weird that Ishilia didn't ring any bells for me. I was never a history buff. But, I should know most of the kingdoms from medieval times, and I was sure that something like that never existed. Not in Europe, at least. And I swore that my parents looked European. Call me Lulu and dress me in pink. This isn't Europe was my first thought when I looked at the region's map in our study at the tender age of four. I was standing on two boxes to reach the table and glimpse at the things father left out on it, including a map of Ishilia. The region was anything but resembling any place I knew about. Holy shit, I wasn't on earth anymore. The revelation filled me with great excitement and expectations for my future. I couldn't read the text in any of the books or on the map, so I had to start learning the written language fast. I need to know more about where I am. Neither of my parents was surprised when I asked them to teach me, and my mother took on the role happily. Thanks to my brain still retaining all my previous memory and enhancements, it was easy. By the time I turned six, I was writing my own journal noting all my ideas down in one place. Even if I could remember them perfectly, I liked penning them down, it gave me a sensation of turning them partially real. What I spent the next years with was reading, reading, and more reading, learning all that I could about the world I found myself in. Oh! And with training in the sword, my father was an excellent fighter, a highly valued soldier and commander, but a small ranking noble. What I thought of as a life of privilege turned out to be not really it. My family was nothing but a Viscount tasked with overseeing the frontier region. That meant this valley and the only entrance to the wilderness, right where our castle was built. It was to be the first stop gate against incoming monsters, something that was relatively important but also would be sacrificial if it came to that. It was a glorified outpost, a stop gate, nothing but a warning bell that immediately soured my perception of this Ishilio empire or whatever. My mother came from a family of barons in the neighboring region, a vassal territory to ours, providing us with the necessary food that our soldiers consumed yearly. As to how they met, going by my father's words, he begged his parents to set up a marriage when he first saw her as a kid. Looking at it from my crib as a baby. They did love each other very much. Maybe even too much? Anyway, it turns out that my family does not really have any real power in any other place in the empire. They are nothing but glorified guard dogs of the border region. A pretty good one at that, I must say. I was nine when I first experienced what it means to watch beasts trying to get into the kingdom. In the winter, there were three to five meter tall creatures throwing themselves at the outmost walls and traps we had built up in the previous decades and by the previous owners of this castle. Father was fighting them back valiantly with the soldiers, and he even led a cavalry attack, leaving the fort, sweeping the escaping ones in one of the battles. We were eating well that winter. They mostly resemble giant felines from Earth's prehistoric days, but I also noticed some hid magical capabilities like breathing fire. It was that moment when I learned that magic existed in the world, albeit finding mages was rare as anyone with the power to control mana was a strategic resource. Going by my parents' remarks, all the mages that Ishilio had kept their identities hidden and served as secret weapons of the empire, guaranteeing national security against rival kingdoms and empires. My home, this so-called Ishilio empire, was not a peaceful place at all. While I was born into a family that guarded their back, the forefront of Ishilia was constantly expanding, gobbling up small countries and city-states. It was waging wars with its neighbors in almost every decade, puppeteering others, only resting to recoup their losses between skirmishes and campaigns. I bet we were hated for real by the others. But it also showed that my home country had superior strength to remain standing and not collapse. Good. If it's like this, then I prefer being in the rear and out of harm's way. Thinking about it, I didn't have to worry about being assassinated or some other ploy playing out to get me for another family to rise to prominence and replace us. Besides training with dad, I was anxious to try and cast magic. I was sure I would be unique. Well, I was already that, but everyone hopes for more. Don't we? This time, I had to be disappointed. I had zero magic. None. Nil. Zilch. It was proven when the local church of the Pantheon of Gods, 
the religion prevalent in the world, tested my compatibility with a strange orb. Saying that I was crestfallen is an understatement. I still asked my parents if I could read some magic books, and they somehow acquired some beginner stuff I memorized at once. Turns out magic is more complex than I first thought. It is not just waving your hand or a wand, saying the magic words, and poof, a firebolt comes out of it. No, it has multiple, long incantations and formations to adhere to, and the mage may have to hold unique crystals to support the spells and his or her powers. It is used as a kind of conduit and fuel to channel and amplify their mind, which was flowing through it. Reading the introduction showed that casting a strong fireball that could decimate multiple troops required the mage to stand still, mutter the incantation, draw a formation, and do numerous nonsensical things just to cast it. This is so bad. I bit my lips, reading it, it does have great power. But a mage is fucked if someone surprises him or her. Well. They can scribe down their spells on special paper, creating one-time use scrolls, but I found no books describing the process and things needed for it, but, it did give me an idea, looking at the beginner magic formations, at first, they looked complicated, after further study, it finally clicked for me, these were similar to blueprints and programs from my time, like how some top of the line, anti-griff, or laser weaponry functioned, mixed with old age mechanisms. I am not saying this was a one-to-one -one copy of that, but the principle was very similar. I only had to replace the energy source with mana, and the coding with formations. With a bit of modifications, I think I can replicate stuff, I murmured, studying the basics, getting a new idea rooted in my brain. I can't cast magic. But that does not mean I can't use the magical formations fueled by the mage's energy source, those conduit thingies, if I can get my hand on it, but, that would be like wanting to buy plutonium, I don't think they are available at the corner store, wait, do we even have a corner store here, I don't think so, what I have seen so far of our land is that we only have mud or stone roads, no electricity, no plumbing, and no heating system, Honestly speaking, we are living like a barbarian in my eyes. Ha, even bailing is a pain in the ass. Maybe I should worry about those things first instead of thinking about magic. 102. Chapter 3, Coming of Age. Not bad. I said to myself, standing nakedly before a mirror. Although it was not a perfect mirror, it was more like a big bronze plate reflecting my appearance. I was happy with what I was seeing. My body was improving daily. I was athletic and attractive with my slick, red hair and green eyes. A perfect mix if I say so myself. I was only 15, but damn, I looked charming. Thanks, mom, and dad, for giving me some great genes. When I turned 12, I was officially recognized as an adult, and in the past three years, I have been helping out my mother, she was the one governing the villages and I was traveling alongside her to act as a judge when disputes arose amongst the people. We were listening to complaints and problems, trying to negotiate solutions with other regions envoys, or acting as witnesses to deals and trials. It was pure politics, and I was surprised to see how fluently my mother navigated through it. I, I don't think I have the same patience that she does. Also, I never wondered why my father trusted her with it. He was much more explosive in temper and quick in making decisions. Well, it did suit him on the battlefield. Despite his size, he was fast and agile, and his reflexes were such that I suspected he was also a transmigrated soul with an enhanced body. But that did not come clutch when it was about dealing with people. For that, my mother perfectly balanced him out. Only a few days ago, when I turned 15, I was given full reign of my life. I completed my studies of our land and its functions under my mother's watchful eyes. Now, I was to act on my own and gain experience in the world. They made me sit down with them yesterday and told me that in the next three years, I will be left to my own devices. They won't step in and only help out if I come up with a sensible request. Taking it like making a deal with another region's ruler. They wanted to see how I fed before I was marked as the inheritor of the line of Kalish. Good. Exactly what I wanted, and I think they understood my happiness from the light that danced in my green eyes. First things first. I started to dress up. 
turning away from my reflection, while I murmured, reciting the points from my notebook that I had used in the past years, we need roads, running water, plumbing, and a sewer system, we are in the mountains, we have multiple rivers and places where the snow never melts, we have ample sources for it, and I bet we have big underground reservoirs that we don't know about, need to get into animal farming, our place is unsuitable for growing big swaths of wheat or whatever else, so we have to focus on what we can, we need better support besides importing food from my mother's home region, resources, we need more resources, I saw how we are being ripped off by others who provide the raw metals and weapons for our armies, soldiers who are defending their greedy asses, we need to start to open up mines and survey the mountains, the pitiful surface level operations we have is laughable, modernization, but, those things can wait, first things first, I need to survey the towns and villages under our rule to determine which points are the most important, thinking about it, I just couldn't wait to leave the castle, I already informed my parents that I plan to travel a little, I may be away for a month or so, visiting all the major cities and outposts, even if there is not much in our territory, besides the town at the foot of the mountain, which housed around 5,000 souls, the rest of the settlements had a maximum of 1,000 people in them, our whole region was as backwater as it gets, at the size of around 40,000 square kilometers and no more, in contrast, my mother's home region was double that, while the central region, where the capital city was built, was around 150,000 square kilometers, my goal with this trip was to familiarize myself with the terrain and the people and, most importantly, to search for things others missed, resources that could be useful. I had to be back before winter settled in, as traveling in the heavy snow would be more dangerous than anything. Father does keep a firm grip over the territory, so the threat of bandits should be low. They are not non-existent, as evil is always present where people live but I should be fine with the training I received, I should also try and invent something more, deadly, or would it be, too much, I thought out loudly while fastening my long sword on my waist, it was a simple, undecorated piece of metal made for killing and not for showing off, I was pretty proficient with it, learning my father's methods, by watching him and making him proud, he said that if I kept bulking, I would be able to match his raw strength, but no thanks, I like myself defined and lean, and he, well, damn, he is big, would he think of me weirdly if I brought some firearms into a world of swords and shields, or would he think of it as an improved archery, something that my mother was proficient with, he didn't look down on that, but guns, A, eh, I will put it on the end of the list, I am not here to start killing people anyway, I grinned, slapping my face before leaving my room, that's right, I am not here to conquer the world, no, I am here to build up my region, I am bound to inherit it, especially because after my birth, my mum failed to get pregnant again, was it my fault, I hope not, even if it was, then it is my duty to provide her with some grandchild, I caught them speaking about it once, thinking of getting me wives so they have more heirs, and yes, they talked about it in the plural sense, thanks, mom, you are the best, it also made me realize that the living standards are low, child mortality is high, and people don't live that long, no wonder they don't name the kids out of superstition until they turn two, my father was only 33 now, and my mom was 30, which meant when I came into this world, my dad was only 18 and my mom 15, and they were trying to make me for three years already, damn, medieval ages, you are wild, they still looked young now, but that is because they were nobles, regular people may live 40 or 50 years if they are lucky, this had to be changed, better, longer life, more kids, more time to grow, more time to gain experience, and more time to enjoy life, yes, enjoying life, that is going to be my goal, I am okay being stuck in here, enjoying the peace, the clean air, and the beautiful scenery, ah, precisely what my world already forgot about, I will also need to be careful not to mess it up, I don't want to bring in technology from my memories that would start polluting the world, but, exactly, that is what magic is for, no, I have so many ideas, 
But first and foremost, I need to get some of those magic crystal things and more refined knowledge about magic. I need to find a mage for that. How will I do it? I don't know, but everything will come to a place. If nothing else, I will just wing it. It will be fine, I'm sure. Dot. Dot. Ah. The fresh air. I took a deep breath, walking down the stone road, snaking down from the castle to the valley, watching the emerald fields and its lush grass fields, sparkling with the morning dew still sticking to it. I wasn't going alone as father made it so that Oleg, a warrior from his personal unit, was following me. I was wearing a simple leather outfit, best for traveling long distances and easily withstanding the wear and tear of the wilderness. With my height already at 180 centimeters and still growing, I was destined to reach my father's size of almost 200 centimeters at least, vertically. Then my eyes traveled to Oleg, who was even taller, with long, braided black hair and piercing blue eyes. His height was, if I had to guess, probably around 220 or 230 centimeters, and his body was just like my father's. I was wondering how he managed to get in and out of the barracks at the castle, maybe only sideways, as he was built like a rhino. Was it because of my father? Did he make every personal soldier of his Pompeian daily? Probably. Young lord, he noticed my gaze as he walked beside me. You need not worry. I will protect you with my life if it comes to that. I am not worried about that, Oleg. If I would face life-threatening attacks in my father's territory, I would be disappointed. True. He laughed, slapping my shoulders, making me feel like I was hit by a truck once again. It would be our shame as soldiers of Kalish. Soldiers, aren't you guys being called the pride of Kalish or something like that? Bwahahaha. Yes, yes, but we are not to repeat it too much. Out of humility, it is what the common folk call us, but we are just soldiers. Common folk, eh? I murmured, looking towards the most significant town we had here, the so-called capital of the region. Lionheart. Our castle was overlooking it from a bit farther away, up on the side of the mountains, and it was the picturesque image of what most medieval towns were in the history books. That was where we were heading right now. It won't be my first time coming here. I visited many of the settlements, but I did it with my mother. I entered the carriage in the castle, exited it at the local noble's courtyard. I never walked their streets. I was mainly in the background, dressed in the attire of a clerk or an insignificant helper. I wasn't really introduced, so people would ignore me, and I could survey them more easily from the back. Mother's mind did work in weird ways sometimes. I did wonder now how people would react to me. Would they recognize me? Would they see my parents' features in me? Probably yes. That is why I was wearing a hat, hiding my crimson hair. I was hoping I could pass on as an adventurer while Oleg was my companion or master. He couldn't pass on as anything else but a warrior. It simply was ingrained into his body since birth. I was so excited. Adventuring in a completely different world. I have been waiting for this since my rebirth. 99. Chapter 4. Reality. Shit. It was the first thing that came to my mind, walking into the town on the cobblestone road. When I previously visited, I exited the carriage at the mayor's house, which was in a private courtyard at the other end of the town. This time, we were coming in on foot, walking along the northern road, which was pretty deserted. It led to our castle, so not many would use it, and not many people were there to see us arrive. There were no walls here, it was pretty open built in a flat area where the houses sprung up naturally throughout the years, resulting in many sneaking roads and dark alleyways. It was a little labyrinthian, but it gave it a unique charm. Scouring my memories, our cities were all planned. Everything was straight. Meeting at a 90 degree angle. It made sense. It was clean. Lionheart before me. Anything but. I barely managed to step over the pile of shit left on the cobblestone by a horse. Who knows when. It was what prompted me for my previous outburst. For Oleg, this was perfectly normal. He didn't even notice it, nor did he wrinkle his nose as we walked over it and headed into the city, passing by the many wooden houses until we arrived on the main street. I had to repeatedly curse, dodging dung mines. Shit, I repeated under my breath as the clean, fresh air was gone, replaced by the stench of piss, 
shit, and who knows what, I was expecting a fantasy-esque town, maybe some colorful houses, none, all was brown because of the wood it was built from, only colored a little by the straw roofs they had, okay, there were a few lighter colored houses made out of cob, the mixing of clay-based subsoil, sand, straws, and water, the wealthier people managed to erect stone houses, but those were extra rare, I know that the mayor had his made out of it, and the temple of the pantheon of gods was also a beautiful and sturdy building made of lime mortar and some other stuff I didn't recognize, the roads, those were made out of cobblestone and dirt, or horse shit, I couldn't tell because everything was stinking like the nine hells, I saw people throwing buckets of, something into side alleyways, out of sight, but, fuck, this was not just looking dire or smelling nasty, it was a biohazard waiting to explode, we need a proper sewer system, and I wasn't thinking about modern things, hell, I remember reading about the Roman times, we solved the problem way earlier than, whenever this was, whatever timeline I was reborn into, is something the matter, young lord, Oleg asked, noticing me wincing and grimacing constantly as we walked towards the market square, a lot, I answered, trying not to hold my nose and look like some kind of snobbish brat, this place is a mess, I remember going to a small village with my mother, where I felt it was okay, but, this, this is a town, what the hell, this is a cesspit, young lord, he asked again, confused as he found nothing out of the ordinary or any reason I would say that, in his eyes, it was a lovely town, with many people present, so it was lively both in the daytime and at night, don't mind me, I shrugged, looking around, and most people ignored us, or me, to be honest, many did peek at Oleg, he was huge, but nobody had the gall to gaze at him for long before turning away or walking around us, I simply used to, more cleaner places, well, maids maintain the castle daily, here, that can't be done, he nodded, thinking about it, scratching his chin, not that, ah, no matter, no matter, let's go to the temple, why, he asked but still started to lead me to it, I want to see it, that is all, I was wondering about it as my father always mentions tuba this and tuba that, while my mother answers that Ariana would do this and Ariana would do that, and, young lord, they, never explained, they did, I shrugged, I know that six deities were visiting our world once, of course, I didn't mention that I believed none of it, from those six, one was a man named Tubu who was a warrior, upholding justice, hogwash, if you ask me, of course, I would also not say that out loud as everyone seemed to take it seriously, as if they witnessed it, the woman named Ariana was smart and just, but her oath could turn day into night and summon demons from hell itself. Which sounded like an angry wife to my ears. Yes, yes. Oleg nodded rapidly as we walked towards the temple. The pantheon is made up of the six deities, besides Tubu and Ariana, Willand, Valen, Elise, and Orsi are the rest. MHM, I know of their names but I will be honest, I'm not really into believing in deities, there are many proofs, young lord, Oleg explained while we arrived, entering the temple and walking into the domed, clean building, and the fresh scent of burning incense assaulted my senses, ah, the relief from the smell of shit, temples are not that bad after all, sure, I answered, not really listening to him, listing out all the marks littering our world, in my previous life or now, I wasn't interested in old fairy tales, the inner sanctum was decorated with their statues, standing in a circle, studying their figures, they were nothing extravagant, but I noticed they all wore a similar robe, colored black and purple, three of them were men, while the other three were women, I quickly lost all interest, regarding them the same as our old, ancient people's nonsense, what I was genuinely interested in was the temple itself and how it was built, I walked around and studied the walls, the seams between its blocks, the work on the statues, the marks on the floor, and the ceiling, all this pointed out that we had the technology to build something modern, something sturdy, I would bet a lot that this temple could withstand some abuse or survive a fire, the houses in the city, not so much good, then this also means it is not the problem of can we do it, instead, 
it is a problem of how much will it cost? Where did the stones come from? I asked Oleg, not expecting an answer, but I turned out to be lucky, the temple was built long ago, he explained after recalling his memories, the church was financed by the empire, they opened a mine in the mountains, a few hundred kilometers away from here, it was mined and cut to pieces there, then transported here. Why don't we do the same? I asked, turning towards him in surprise. The buildings here are ultra shabby, but young lord. We can't. He said, gobsmacked, first of all, we don't have the resources or money to buy the equipment and people to start mining and transporting. Secondly, the thing that holds stone buildings together is a national secret. Only the empire can send artisans out to build something out of stone. Even your own home, the fortress of the wild, was built and is owned by the empire. What a pain in the ass. I groaned, rubbing my head. Is everyone this paranoid here? Young lord, nothing, Oleg. I waved my hand. I saw what I wanted. Let's go, but... No prayer, young lord he asked, a bit conflicted, bowing towards the statues, none, I am not a fan of that, now, I want to see all the stone buildings in the city, can you show me around, why yes, he hurried after me, continuing to play the role of a somewhat confused guide, the whole day was about nothing else but surveying the masonry works of the empire, I studied all the buildings that were not erected by locals but by government employed artisans, it was evident that everything was determined by money, the mayor's place was only 40% close to what the temple looked like, in build quality at least, other, wealthy and nobles place was even less well built, but, at least it was made from rock and stone and had some style to it, the fact that they kept something as simple as mortar secret, was sick, paranoid beyond belief, I will need to start from scratch, by nightfall, I was in my room at the local inn, finishing washing up from cold water poured out in a bucket, using rags to clean myself, this also needs to change, I need to start introducing running water and bathhouses and personal hygiene, I don't care if they look at me weirdly that I want to bathe and clean myself daily, damn it, I'm not a barbarian, with anger, I opened up my little notebook after sitting down on the edge of my bed, naked, and started writing, there is a lot to be done, 87, Chapter 5, Turing, the following days, I did nothing else but walk up and down in the town, most people were already familiar with my face, deeming me a weirdo as I drew a street map in my notebook, muttering to myself, I spent two weeks doing it, recording all the details and amazing Oleg with my cityscape drawings, he said I could easily be a painter as my pencil sketches looked like he was staring at reality itself, I think he was simply trying to butter up to me, I don't think they are that good. But it felt nice being appreciated. I like compliments as I am a simple man. Somehow, I always missed it in my previous life. I got nothing from home and life, not until I got older, and then, when I did, I was dead the next day. Oh well, there is no point in wallowing in it. Instead, I should wallow because this is a complete mess. Not good. I moaned, sitting with Oleg in my room on the tavern's second floor, looking at the torn out pages, forming a detailed map of the whole town. I think it looks terrific, young lord. It is more detailed than what we have at the castle. No, I am talking about how this city was built. I pointed at the snaking streets, their crisscrossing form, and how it was more like labyrinth than a city it is a mess, no symmetry and no elegance, it was built haphazardly, attaching new roads, houses, and buildings to each other, wherever you felt like it, but, it's normal, young lord, this house cities are made, then we will change it, start from zero, you can't just destroy a city, that would lead to an uprising, young lord, not to mention, the empire would take it as an attack on itself, all this is the property of the ruling emperor or empress, even if it's under your control, young lord, think about it, Oleg exclaimed, going into a panic, relax, my truck sized friend, truck what, he asked, blinking his eyes rapidly, not getting it, no matter, I am not demolishing the city, I will build a new one, my own, I laughed loudly, throwing off the papers from the desk and laying out different ones, 
a whole set of them, showing a perfectly designed city. By my calculations, this new one could house at least 50,000 people, it should be enough for the whole region. I already designed it to be perfectly sensible and symmetric to look at. In the middle would be the royal sector, of course. I am everything but a saint. I need my own place. So, I totally stole the idea of the Forbidden City's plans and laid it out to be my next home. It should give enough space to live comfortably. Next, I designed it so that the homes of my future, most trusted partners would be around it, surrounding me. I need to recruit people I can rely on. I wouldn't be able to do everything alone. I need some excellent brains to help me govern this shithole KHM region. Yes, the shitting problem will be solved too, my lord, Oleg asked seeing me grinning and giggling like an idiot. Nothing. I shook my head, running my finger along the sewer system drawn on my plans. I will make a city so clean you can lick the ground and not get sick. I also designed it to have trees and a lot of green planted while building. I want colors, beautiful trees blooming in the spring, and the smell of flowers when you walk down the main street. It will be the desired holy place for anyone in this sorry world. Ha. On the outer skirts should be the rest of the housing for the people, shops, markets, whatever I need to run the city, I was expecting it to be booming and blooming every day, I want it to be the heart of the region where people come to visit and spend their money, money, I whispered my biggest opponent right now, I don't even know if the locals have enough to afford anything, ha, huh. so, I will need to ensure we get the ball rolling, if I can push it down the hill, it will snowball, I think. I'm not really a finance guru, but even I know we will need to step up our industrial sector for that to happen, which will be at a different place. I don't want to pollute my future home. It was the thought that led me to my next goal, the mountains. Recollecting my plans, I asked Oleg to lay down the map of the surrounding mountains, especially where the stone came for the building of the Pantheon. I will visit that next and see what I can do with it. I won't build from wood that can rot away and be burnt down by an invading force or monsters. Everything will be sturdy and heavy of stone to withstand the ages, nature, and magic. I need to make sure we are magic proof. As to how? Well, I will come up with something, or I will rename myself to Lulu. Dot. Dot. Traveling to the mountains was much harder than I thought it would be. The footpath was overgrown, and we had to track through a challenging, uneven terrain while getting closer to the old site where the church mined the rocks for its purposes. It took us four days of literal marching, watching the mountainous horizon getting bigger and bigger. It was a sight to behold for sure, seeing the snow-capped tips getting closer and more prominent day by day. I was loving it. The air was so clean and fresh, with one deep breath. I was rejuvenated at once. Young lord, we will need to get a bit more alert now. Oleg said, constantly surveying our surroundings as we were heading into the pine forest surrounding the basin of the mountains. His giant hand was resting on the hilt of his sword, making me furrow my brows. Are there bandits here? You can never know, he replied, walking in front of me. There are some old logging sites around here, but they have been abandoned for decades now. We switched to a different location to let the forest regenerate. There are always low lives around places like this. No matter what you do, some people choose to be evil when you can take others' property. Why work hard? True. I tilted my head, finding no fault in his words. And people like them don't do well in society, so they are drawn to places like this. Like rats, living in others' hopes and dreams, you can be surprisingly deep, Oleg. I laughed, pointing a thumbs up toward his back. Thank you, young lord. He laughed sheepishly. I try to read a lot. It is a privilege to be able to read. A gift bestowed upon us soldiers by your esteemed father. Wait. You don't learn reading? I asked, surprised, almost tripping up myself. Not really. He looked at me over his shoulder. The average citizen gets to learn a little, but most can only write their own names and read short, simple notices. Anything complicated, long, or filled with flowery words is going to be lost to them. No fucking way, I groaned, rubbing my temples with two hands. Then I will need public education, too. Shit, another problem. Okay, okay, I will deal with that too. Fuck, young lord. You want to teach the people? He asked, stopping, looking stunned. Of course, I shrugged, 
opening my arms wide, what should I do with a bunch of illiterate people? How would I be able to trust anything they do? Should I do everything by myself? I am not a mule. I need qualified people who can think for themselves, and I can delegate the tasks so I can focus on the big picture. Let my subordinates micromanage it, I will do the macro side of it. What are micro and macro, young lord? he asked, scratching his head, looking lost. No matter. The thing is, Oleg, reading and knowing numbers is something essential. I will need all of my subjects to be capable of doing it. Everyone. Everyone. I quoted a famous line, proud of myself. But I also knew he didn't understand it. But he still wiped his eyes of tears. How benevolent, my lord, you are a truly good person. A. Eh? Am I? Uh. Well. If you say it. Um. Sure, I guess. Yes, you young lord. He shouted and lunged at me. I didn't know what was happening. But when I was on the ground, shielded by his big body, I noticed the arrow landing close to us. It would have missed me, shooting at my feet instead. Honestly, it looked like a warning shot, if anything. But I was still touched by his quick reaction and going so far in protecting me. But I was not a fan of being squashed by a big, muscular guy lying on me. Why couldn't he be a beauty? Ha. Huh. Well, at least I know that I can keep my mind clear and calm even in danger. 84. Chapter 6. Shadow People. In reality, Oleg only laid on me for a brief moment before jumping up, grabbing me by the scruff, and dragging me into the forest, hiding behind one of the thick trees. With his longsword at the ready, peering out, his eyes were searching for the attacker like a hawk scans the land for prey. I wasn't complaining. A little roughing up is not something that would kill me, and he was my bodyguard anyway. It could have been a warning shot, I said calmly, looking out, watching the improvised arrow stuck in the ground. It was something that was not the work of a blacksmith but more like something thrown together haphazardly. They aimed at you, my lord. Their life is forfeit. I'm just saying. I shrugged, not wanting to argue. Oh. At ten o'clock. At what? Ha. There. I pointed it out for him, where I saw the shrubs move on the other side, they probably retreated, nice catch, we are going back and reporting this to Lord Kalish, we are going to come back with force and find these bandits, whoa, whoa, relax Oleg, bandits, why are we not surrounded then, why are we not robbed yet, they may have been only scouts, do bandits use twigs and stone arrows, because if they do, I am not really afraid of them, I shrugged, patting the authentic steel sword at my waist. You want to follow them? Oh? You are sharper than I expected. Yep, I do. I laughed, feeling excited. Young lord, that is not a good idea. You can go back and make your report. I am going after them while their trail is hot. Damn it. Oleg cursed as I was already striding forward, crossing the clearing and heading towards where I saw movement before. I was in the army previously. I mean, in my original life, I wasn't always responsible for unearthing ancient machines, no. I was part of my home country's mobile regiment and was a combat engineer on the front lines when our forces were sent to deal with insurgency. Some still thought it was the Third World War, yet that shit ended when I was four. I am trying to say that I had lived combat experience before being called back and given a safer position. It happened after proving myself and my skills with machines. And then I was killed by essentially a friendly fire accident. Wonderful. Oh? I stopped, hearing voices in the distance signaling to Oleg, who asked no questions but likewise slowed down, catching up to me. We inched forward slowly, trying to make as little noise as possible and listening into the conversation. You idiot. Why did you shoot at them? Now they know we are here. A man shouted at another. It snapped. I didn't want to shoot. I will snap you into two two. Idiot. Now they will bring people here, and we will be discovered. She will be discovered. Hey. I whispered to Oleg. Can you disarm the two? And capture them alive? Alive? Confused, he asked. We should chop their heads off and display them on peaks. Uh, no? Then we won't have a chance to question them. Or if you can evoke some kind of spell to speak to the dead. I can't cast magic. Young lord. See? So. Can you capture them or not? I think I can. Good. Do that for me. Okay. The significant advantage of being the son of the region's lord is that our subordinates, 
do listen to our orders. Seeing my order, Oleg didn't question it a second time and stepped forward faster than his big, bulky body would suggest. Before the two had any reaction, he was between them, bringing down his sword and knocking the shouting one out. Its pommel landed square on the back of his head, and it was lights out at once. Next, before his panicked, surprised partner could get anything out of his belt, Oleg punched him in the gut. I could only hear grunting and gurgling, and his body collapsed. Weak. He said, his voice betraying his surprise while I walked out looking at the two figures. Of course they are. Look at them. They are bare bones. Crouching down, turning them to their backs revealed their emaciated figures, they were grossly underweight, wearing shabby clothes that looked like what you would find on a nature-loving elf from some fantasy story, or on a sociopath, living in the forest for forty years, I couldn't tell their age, but I was sure they would be in their thirties, or forties, maybe younger, but in a hard life, let's get some vines and tie them up, I said, kicking away their weapons that looked like tools from the stone age, good idea, he nodded, and they were already tied to a tree by the time one of them was in the middle of deciding whether to wake up or not. Exclamation mark he wanted to cry but couldn't as the sharp pain assaulted his head from where Oleg hit him with the pommel of his sword. Any excuses before being dealt judgment? Oleg asked, sneering. You can't just kill us? We are the man panicked, but Oleg smacked him so hard that I saw a tooth flying out. You attacked the son of the lion himself. You will be flayed alive, your skin fed to you, and then you will be tied to a pole so the animals from the other end of the mountains come and snack on you. Uh, I spoke up, twitching my mouth. You scared him a bit too much. But it's true, my lord. He protested. A simple beheading is not enough of a punishment. Whatever, he fainted. I shrugged with a groan, rubbing my forehead. Next time, I will ask questions, you just stay alert, okay? It took me a little effort to wake up the other guy, the one who had supposedly shot the arrow at me. When he heard who I was, he fainted too. Great. I was getting annoyed, so I decided to wake them up with a splash. Of course, I won't use water on them, that would be a waste. So I simply pissed on them until they woke up. What? I asked Oleg, who looked on his jaw hanging close to the floor. My lord. You are pitiless. Efficient. I ain't wasting our drinking water on two idiots. Now. I turned to the two, who were just as dazed as what had just happened. I want to hear everything you know, or my friend here will break your legs, and we will drag you back to the city for your public execution. None of them fainted again this time, and I quickly learned of their predicament. They called themselves shadow people because they were citizens who somehow slid down to the absolute bottom and left their towns and villages, deciding to live in the forest. On paper, they didn't even exist anymore, their current base was at the old logging site, and their little collective numbered around a dozen men and women, led by their queen. It's an interesting title, to say the least. What is special about this queen? I asked, feeling the weird reverence in their voices she can. Shut up. Now, this was interesting. Suddenly they were not so keen on speaking anymore. I looked at her leg, who slapped a few teeth out of them once again, but none budged. Now, this was most interesting. Something is so special about that woman that they grow a backbone. Huh, how long would it be to send a message back? I asked, crossing my arms. If I run, I can return with people on horses by dawn. Do it. Bring enough men so we can capture everybody. I'll stay here, guarding these two, my lord. That is too dangerous. Enough. I put my foot down, looking up at him with a serious gaze. Who am I? Lord Leon, the young cub of the Lion of the Frontier. Then do as I say. The more you dally, the longer I will remain alone. Yes, young lord. He saluted and sprinted away as if his life depended on it. Now, I crouched down watching their faces with a soft smile. Won't you tell me what is so special with your queen? No. They answered, but I saw in the eyes of the more submissive one that he was ready to spill the beans. I see. Okay. I pulled out my sword and knocked out the more aggressive one with another pommel strike. I think he may have brain damage now. Oh well, let's talk. I looked at his comrade. We are going to make a simple deal. Whatever the outcome is, you won't be killed nor tortured. 
I chuckled a little, feeling like I was playing some kind of villain in a school play. You swear? He asked, already gulping the bait down with hook and sinker. How desperate can one be? On my name as the son of Kalish, our queen is special. She can. At that, he went mute for a little. I wasn't hurrying him, simply watching his face, reading his emotions. He was part hesitant, part guilty about what he was about to do. She is a mage. Really? I asked, my voice loud, scaring some of the birds away from the treetops. Tell me more. Her name is. Well, I don't know what her name is, but she was born in the capital city, in our territory, or are you talking about the Empire's capital? Here. He added quickly, a simple commoner, my lord, it was discovered early that she could do things. Sometimes tools around her levitated when she was sleeping, that is what I heard, and what is she doing in the forest with a bunch of hobos? Hobo, no matter, he murmured, thinking it was some fancy word and it best not to ask about the language of aristocrats. Her parents didn't want to give her up, so they fled into the forest and have lived here ever since. We gathered around them because she can do things. Heal injuries and make miracles. Miracles, eh? I scratched my chin, even more interested now. I don't believe in miracles, but I do believe in magic. I can't wait to meet one who can cast it. Lucky. Ah ha ha In the end, I may just get what I was missing. I whispered, walking up and down before the two men and couldn't wait for Oleg to return. 80. Chapter 7 a witch. Oleg arrived right by dawn. He looked out of breath but still full of energy, followed by a dozen warriors, all from my father's personal men. You were fast. I laughed, welcoming them, ignoring the two who were still tied to the trees, moaning, and admitting we weren't kidding about who we were. Of course, young lord. He hopped down from the horse, breathing out with relief that I was okay. We should be enough to deal with any ragtag bunch who took up residence in our forest. I already investigated where they are. I said loudly, looking at the rest, dismounting their horses. Do you all know where the old logging site is? Good. I grinned, seeing them nod, we are going to travel there on foot. Tie the horses up. I explained, showing them a drawing on the ground. While waiting, I wasn't just chatting with the prisoners. I made sure they told me everything about the place, and I drew it out, making my plans. We would surround the site and ambush them. I told Oleg that there was a wild mage inside, and his face went dark, listening to everything I said. First, he wanted to complain it was sneaky and dishonorable to do so, but after saying there is a witch, he no longer complained. That is the power of magic. I already knew it was a rare and unique gift, so much so that most people thought a mage could do anything. Don't worry, she is untrained and weak, I continued, trying to keep the men calm and collected, and we want to capture them alive. Okay, use non-lethal attacks. What? They asked, making me twitch my eyes. Don't kill, please. I need them. Think. If we can capture them, we can control the witch. If you kill them, what if she goes apeshit, and conjures something to kill us all? Huh? Think a little man, with hostages, she will come with us peacefully. My lord, are you sure? With a witch around, it will be fine. I want her to join us, not to threaten. When the initial shock has settled down, let me talk. Okay, young lord, relax. Trust me, if I come in like, oh hello, I am the son of the lord of this region. I am here to recruit you, blah blah blah. She would think I want to place a collar on her and keep her as a pet. Why else would she be out here? She values her freedom, for sure. So, I think the quickest method to get her is to be more straightforward and... Well, we need to show our strength. Show her we can do this multiple ways, and I am open to taking the cooperative route. They had no real answer to my monologue, but that was good. I was already excited to do it, so we left for the logging site after going over the plan a second time. It wasn't that far, only an hour of walking distance, following the old route now overgrown with shrubs. When we got close, we could hear the noise they were making, waking up and starting their morning routine, spreading out. I also took part in the ambush, rushing in from the front side of the place. Surveying it, it had some old warehouse. A few buildings, and many shabby tents held up by sticks, leaves, and whatnot. 
It was worse than a shanty town from my time. I think some homeless people lived better than these poor men and women. Yes, both were present. Hell, I think there were more women than men. Not that there were many of them, around twenty people at most, all of them scrawny and dirty. There, I quickly singled out who I thought must be the witch. She had a different aura covering her. Yes, her clothes were rags thrown around her bony body, her thick, bushy, dark, orange colored hair had leaves stuck to it, and her face blackened by dirty spots. But she exuded something unnatural from her paws that even I could pick up. It is hard to put it into words, but it is the same feeling when you open the door to a cool cellar on a hot summer day. I was aiming for her from the moment I noticed her coming out from one of the wooden sheds. She was clearly panicked, not knowing what to do, but I couldn't take chances. If she really was a witch, she could be dangerous. I read about how those who never were educated caused themselves and everyone around them to blow up. Of course, I had my doubts, but it never hurts to be careful. I was before her in a few seconds, using the techniques from my past life, quickly wrestling her to the ground before she could cast any spells. Don't move or try anything, if you try releasing any magic, otherwise, I will have to hurt you. I shouted, seeing and feeling her tremble while I knelt on her back, pinning her to the ground. Don't hurt them. She cried, thinking this was all caused by her. Well, it wasn't that far off the truth. I won't. Pulling her up, I held her arms locked behind her back with one hand, holding my sword with the other. She was unhealthy and slim, so much so that I think I could have broken her bones if I had twisted her a little more. Don't struggle, and you won't be hurt. We are soldiers of the lion himself. As the son of Kalush, I give my word you won't be killed if you give up now. I was surprised that my words had any effects. Many stopped struggling or trying to fight back. They were simply giving up, looking at me. My blazing red hair probably gave it away that I wasn't lying. Besides my mother, I didn't see anybody with the same scarlet color parading around this part of the country, when everybody was under control. I made them gather, and my men tied their arms behind their backs as to my instructions. I did the same with the witch, and to be extra careful, I also covered her mouth. I know they had to say incantations to cast a spell. I just hoped saying it in their head was not enough. Listen. I looked at them while Oleg and two other soldiers stood behind me, holding crossbows at the ready. Two of you attacked me yesterday. Seeing how they looked around, realizing who was missing, and the change in their faces. I knew the two, left with the horses, were probably hiccuping like mad. He he. Totally deserved. Fighting back the urge to laugh, I continued seriously, as if I was taking a huge risk here. I ought to execute all of you for this capital offense. Ignoring the loud cry for mercy, I continued on. If not that, the simple fact that you are squatting here is worthy of serious punishment. Not to mention, having a rouge which... I looked at the girl who had tears in her eyes, looking around at the others, trying to apologize with her gaze. Now I truly felt like a villain. Shit. Well, suck it up, Leon, and continue. Look, I switched to a much lower, kinder voice. I'm not here to cause you trouble. I need people. I have ambition, and tell you what. I am here to offer you two choices. I walked up and down, explaining it clearly and simply. First, you get punished, according to the law. Or, you come with me and be my subordinates. Not the church, the empire, or my family's subordinate. My subordinate. What do you say? I didn't expect a quick answer, but many of them almost immediately chose the second option. Ha! Huh. That was relieving. Of course, I wouldn't trust them just like that, not immediately. But they will have time to prove their worth and loyalty. First and foremost, I needed to secure the witch, without anyone knowing about it. I don't know if my parents would approve of it, but for the things I have planned, I will need their help, so I will find a way to convince them. Will you cooperate? I asked, but I only had the witch in my sight, who knew I was pinning this question directly to her. With a slow nod. She gave her answer, and I waved my hand, and we started to empty the camp. It was time to go home, visiting the mountains, that can wait. My travel around the countryside will also wait for me. This was much more important. I will take this out, I mumbled, 
helping her to stand, personally guarding her, loosening the cloth in her mouth, and letting it fall to her neck like a weird, saliva-soaked scarf. Just don't start mumbling a spell, or I will have to do something I don't want to. I can't really cast spells. She sniffled, looking dressed fallen, if you think you are capturing a strong witch that can level cities, you are making a big mistake. I don't need you to blast my enemies with lightning or summon a flood. I chuckled merrily. I just need someone attuned to magic to help me with my research. Studying magic is like a blind man trying to learn writing and reading for me. I can't use it. You are learning. Magic? She looked at me weirdly. Kinda. It's complicated. Listen. What I said is all the truth. I am here not to punish you all. Honestly, I am here because I heard you were capable of magic. So it was me who brought pain to everyone. Again. She lowered her head, and I saw tears falling to the ground while we walked. Temporary pain. I told you. I'm not going to hurt you, said the soldiers, before they murdered my parents. Now, that was something I didn't expect. Nor did it add up to the other two's tale. Not that they could have been important or somebody close to her. Well, I had the source walking next to me while holding her still bound arm with one hand. What is your name? Sasha. That is my real name. The one given to me by my mother. The people here call me queen, please ignore that, my lord. They don't know better. No problem. Well, I am Leon, good to meet you. We have a long road to walk, so. Care to enlighten me what happened? What if I don't want to? Fair. I shrugged. No pressure, how's life? You all look dreadful. I switched the topic immediately, making her raise her head with surprise, amusement. And anger. What? You said you didn't want to talk about it. I have other questions that need answering. No? Okay, then. How old are you? Sixteen. Or seventeen. I don't really know. TSK. Tough. Favorite color? Huh? Cats or dogs? Huh? She repeated, getting lost by now. What are your three sizes? Looking at you. They are probably in the minus category, as not even a bulimic model aspirant looks this bony. Huh? Nah. Ignore it, we will. Just stop. She moaned, half crying, half laughing, letting out a defeated sigh. I'll speak. Okay. Ha. I'm all ears, Sasha Tilda. And do take your time. I'm not in a hurry. 84. Chapter 8, Sasha. I was born in the city. My parents were simple bakers, operating a shop, selling pans, nothing more. Nothing less, Sasha explained her gaze growing distant, reminiscing about those long gone days. My gift manifested itself when I was eight. They tried to hide it because they couldn't bear the thought of me being taken away from them. All mages are whisked away and transported to the capital. Nobody knows what happens then, but they no longer appear. Never again. Well, they get a new identity from what I know, I murmured, and be used as strategical resources in wars. My parents did not want that. but. It got out when I was ten. I don't know how, I never really knew how to cast a spell for real. But heavily armored soldiers and the church came for me. Never did anything weird that others could have seen. No. Not. Consciously, I think. I don't know, I was young. Sorry, please, continue. My parents tried to plead, but they killed them. Without questions or warning, they said they wouldn't when they first arrived, but then. Swords were drawn the moment they didn't pass me over at the first order. When I was transported out, there was a storm, and my hand managed to slip out from their grip, and I ran. I don't remember how I ended up in the forest, but, when I came to, I was already far away from everything. Lost. Alone. I'm sorry to hear. You just say that because. She looked at me but stopped mid-sentence. I really meant it, and I think she could see it in my eyes. Since then. Sasha turned away, continuing, I have been living here alone, it wasn't easy, but I managed, and somehow, people started turning up year after year, we came across the logging site and built up our own home, as I see it, you didn't really improve your living standards much, at least we lived freely, until now, oi, I get that you are angry, but you will change your tune soon enough, I laughed, and seeing her face, expecting something nasty, made me grin, no, nothing like that, you are too bony for my taste, hey, oh, 
What? Want me to molest you? HMPH Swine Ahahaha <laughs> Good to see you have a temper. It will be useful when herding the people. She suddenly realized I was someone who could sentence them all dead. Lowering her head, biting her lip. What you said is the truth. I want underlings, and you are the best first candidate for it. I will provide you a better life in exchange for your loyalty. So we become servants or get killed? You can choose. Be free and miserable, or be under my rule and prosper. I won't make you stay forcefully. I am dragging you all away because I know you won't believe me otherwise. It is like rescuing strays. I need a rope, trap, or something to catch you and show you that it can be better. As to will you ever wag your tails to me? We will see. I will never wag mine towards you, he he. You are an interesting girl, Sasha. Look weak at first, but act strong afterwards. Ha, huh, I think we will get along just fine. Dot. It took almost a day to travel back to the castle, where my mother welcomed us after noticing the group of people heading up the road. Needless to say, it was a bit of a surprise, especially for the ragtag group we captured. They probably expected to be thrown into the dungeons or something, but instead, they were herded towards the barracks, given a small space where they could settle down for now. It was cramped, but even then, it was leagues above how they lived in the forest. While Oleg oversaw them and kept an eye on Sasha, I went and sat down with my parents, who looked at me questioningly but patiently waiting for my explanation. What was there to say besides the truth? So, I laid out all my findings and ideas. I slowly and clearly told them what I wanted to achieve along with building my own city. Big dreams. Mother told me, the first to speak up, preventing father from opening his mouth. But, please, this is the recipe for lime mortar, this one is Roman cement, or if I want to be fancy, opus cementicium. I interrupted her, knowing full well what she was getting on about. It's easy to procure and can stand the test of time. I am sure of it. I can do this, mom. Hey, from where I am, two thousand years have passed and people still go around taking pictures of buildings built with them. We are surrounded by mountains. Getting the resources should be child's play. I don't know what the empire is playing on keeping such a thing secret and monopolized. But I don't really care. Get me enough manpower, and I will build a better city than anything this world has seen. How? They asked. Looking at the recipe, gobsmacked. It was something that was a treasure of the empire. It was what built the capital city and made it an impenetrable fortress. Even when enemies attacked it centuries ago, their flaming arrows did nothing to it. If the history books were as honorable as I heard, weak fireballs were also repelled by its thick walls. But I could also guess there were other things to it. But. Oh well. It is far away from here, son. Ah. Yes. I flinched forgetting to think up a reason for this all. But it seems inspiration comes to my help in times like this. I found a witch. What? The two stood up at once as it seemed it was a piece of even bigger news than my recipes and plans. Those were only on paper, nothing but an amalgamation of an idea. Something yet to be proven. A witch was a tangible existence. Yeah? She has been living in the forest since childhood. Escaped from being conscripted. Ah. My parents looked at each other, quickly remembering the event. As lords, they knew every major thing that happened here, past and present. We heard they killed her. When she was escaping. Well, evidently not. I shrugged. Pushing everything onto Sasha. She is the source of the recipes. Is she now? My mother questioned while I nodded even though I could see the doubts in her eyes. But she didn't pursue the matter any further. This is a big problem, son. Why? I turned to my dad. Nobody needs to know about it. Not to mention, I plan to do this. A bit further away from here. Nobody would notice it. I see it otherwise, looking at your blueprints. My mom tapped on the table, looking at my dad. This can easily turn into high treason. He added. Only if they know about it. I retorted, sorry. But I am not content with playing the guard dog. Father, I read the history books. Your predecessor was wiped out in a nasty incident when beasts pushed through. Our family got to this position because someone got to replace the line that was gone. Not to mention. We are being taxed constantly when they instigate a war with a neighbor. Yet they do not even fund us with food. We need to produce and procure everything for our soldiers. And we defend a land that, 
in reality, is not even ours? Hell no. Hey, I will defend their backs, sure. But only because I will turn this region into my home. They don't need to know about it. We will pay the taxes as usual. If we can improve the region and cut back on spending so much on keeping our men equipped and fed, we will have more remaining in our treasury. Then, we can use that capital to invest in the land, improve it, get more back, and repeat the cycle. It's simple. Well, he is your son. My dad whispered, making my mum shake her head, but I was too engrossed in my ideas to listen to them. I want to take Sasha, the witch, with me and help her make me understand many things while I also teach her about what she doesn't know. She looks capable and smart, and nobody needs to know she is capable of using magic. How far have you planned things? Mom asked, her voice extra serious. Not that far. My first and foremost goal is to start building the new city. Honestly speaking, the living standards around here are abysmal. Hey, father snorted, watching me as if I said something equally funny and aggravating. Here, I presented my notebook, I wrote down everything. We will have roads, aqueducts, and sewers, just to mention a few things. I am not joking. If you let me, I will do my best to transform this region into something that will overshadow any city in the empire. Son, your ambitions are something that even I, your father, applaud. But, huh, my mother interrupted, her brows raised high, looking at me, then back at the notebook. Then back at me. Dear, I think we managed to produce a very quirky offspring. Huh? Asked both of us at the same time. I would say, read this, but I don't think you will understand it. Hey, my father protested, looking hurt. Didn't you always complain to me that you hate that there is no chance to advance higher in the empire? That your talents are being wasted here? Then what should I say? HMPH. Uh dear, it is. For us. When we are between the four walls of our bedroom. Mum is right. I agreed at once. It was my chance. We can become so much more. And I am starting to believe our son. She patted my notebook. This is a big chance and I think my family would also be on board, not right away, but later on, for sure. And if we fail, our heads will be placed onto spikes. Are you certain? He asked back, and I was totally ignored in the decision-making process. The risks are high. But she looked at me, his ideas did inspire me. Oh well. Father clapped, surprising me with the ease of how quickly my mother made him agree. If you think it's worth a shot, then all is fine. I trust your brain more than mine. Bwahahaha. This is why I love you Tilda. She snuggled up to him, kissing, and I think if they were alone, something else would have happened. But I was no longer a baby. KHM. I cleared my throat. So, what do you think? I needed their verbal agreement spoken to me, not just between themselves. We want to know about everything before you make any moves. They said in tandem, got it? Of course. I clapped, unable to wipe off the grin plastered straight onto my face. For starters, I need the people I brought back to rest and get back to strength. I will take care of Sasha myself, and when she gets a bit stronger, I want to return to my original plan. Get to the mountains and find a perfect source for the building blocks for my new city. 82. Chapter 9. Midnight Talks. My next meeting with Sasha happened that same night and it resulted in a bit of misunderstanding. You see, the maids made sure she was washed up, trimmed, and transformed from a bony, thin street urchin to a presentable lady. Now that her hair was clean, it was almost glowing in the color of fire. With proper clothes on, she looked human, and surprisingly beautiful. And this is where the misunderstanding started. She thought it was done because she was being prepared for me. The fact that she was led into my room at night further solidified this thought in her head, and when the maids left, she only looked at me once before closing her eyes. I was standing on my balcony, enjoying the cool air and looking at the giant moon in the sky, when I heard her starting to strip. Looking back, I was surprised to see her standing there, naked, trying hard to not cover herself. Let's get this over with, she mumbled with gritted teeth. Sure. I chuckled, walking in letting my eyes feast on her naked body while I sat down in my armchair. I didn't know you were a nudist, but oh well, each to their own. I'm not complaining. Come, sit, we need to talk. I barely could hold back my laughs, 
seeing her shocked face, realizing I wasn't going to touch her or do anything to her, but, but, you, she mumbled, turning just as red as my hair, hurriedly pulling the clothes up and starting to cover herself, you were cleaned because you stank, I articulated the fact plainly and clearly, you looked like you were taking a bath in the mud instead of water, for crying out loud, I can't have you stinking up my room, can I, bbb, boo, she stammered, unable to speak as multiple things hurt her at once, but that was the truth, also, turning a bit more serious, I continued, I have basic principles, I may be dreaming and imagining perverted things in my mind right now, but I wouldn't act on them, so you did think about it, she complained, which, was weird, given the situation, of course I did, I grinned, I am a healthy young man, and you were stripping before me, hell yeah, I did imagine things, but I am not a monster, I only indulge myself if it is permitted, otherwise, I can show restraint, now, sit, please, she walked closer in the end, finally taking her seat, looking at me but avoiding my direct eye contact, you could have still done it, I'm more aroused if my partner is moaning in pleasure and just as active as I am, I'm not into fucking a wet sponge, thank you very much, tears make me sad and not aroused, I guess having so many experiences made you know that, she asked sarcastically, I'm still a virgin, I was simply raised well, I answered honestly, well, I was a virgin in this body, for now, okay, we talked about spicy things, it's time to switch it up, as much as I find you exotic and sexy, even in your emaciated state, we have bigger things on our plates. Before she could interrupt with something unrelated again, I explained my plans to her as clearly as possible. I showed her objectives, ideas, and finally, what I was really interested in. My first magic circle design. It was made through the past few years, constantly adding to it. In reality, I had no big hopes for it to work. It was as if someone tried to paint a picture with closed eyes. I needed Sasha to be my eyes in the future, so I know what I am doing. What's this? She asked, taking over the parchment and looking at it. Ha! I groaned, fearing her answer. A magic formation I made. I have been studying basic magic to the best of my abilities. I am not magical, as I said, but I learned some entry-level theoretical stuff and with my understanding of nature and how magic operates, I came up with this, I just don't know how stable or usable it is, and, why should I know, I told you, I was never trained, I thought you may get a feeling from it, looking at it, activating some, innate connection, or something, there's nothing, I asked dejectedly, really, not even a little bit, some tingling or whatever, tingling, I don't know, this is the first time I see something like this, she mumbled, focusing on it, flipping it up and down in her hands, try, using your mana, maybe, I asked, getting more anxious, but then it happened, with a little bit of mana moving in her body, the parchment immediately reacted, bursting into flames, with a loud pop, it was gone, ash falling into her lap while nothing remained between her fingers, ah, she gasped, finally reacting, I didn't mean to, great, I laughed, a boulder falling from my heart, this was exactly what I wanted, it was, she blinked her eyes, thinking she was mishearing me, yeah, I was trying to make fire, well, it could be better, my intentions were to create a feedback loop that would transform the paper into a fireball that remains stable, using the parchment's basic energy conversation to the initial ignition and then drawing oxygen in to maintain the flow, of course, it would only be stable until it was fed with more energy to maintain its form. But if I can perfect it, I am sure to build a perfect loop so no outside interference is needed, and once it's on, it remains on perpetually, he he he, I know that is really far away, but, what the nine hells are you on about, she asked, looking at me weirdly, ah, sorry, sorry, nothing, I'm just happy, happy of what, of a paper going up in flames, exactly, don't you get it, flames, magic, it worked, made by someone who doesn't know magic, flames are symbolic, anyway, I will be Prometheus, huh, aren't you named Leon, it's from the myth, the one who brought fire down from the gods, giving it to men, never heard of it, she replied at once, I never want to hear about it either, the church can go to hell, 
It's not a church tale. I don't think they would even approve it. I chuckled as I don't think anyone knows that tale here. Then I'm interested. She switched her stance at once, looking at me with a surprisingly youthful light. So, who is this Promete guy? Prometheus. He stole fire from the gods, brought it down to men, and taught them to use it, for his sins. He was punished. Of course, tied out to a rock so birds tear him to pieces, pluck out his eyes, eat his liver, and all that. Being an immortal, he always regenerated by the next day just so it could repeat it again, the bastards. Sasha cursed suddenly, and I could feel it. She really, really hated the church and probably all authority. I will have to keep an eye on that, as such suppressed rage could cause big problems if I let it fester. What happens to the humans? Progress. They started to evolve. I continued nonchalantly. His tale is about progress. Standing against the forces of nature. He has given humanity the gifts of fire and hope. Hope helps humans struggle for a better future while fire, as the source of technology, makes success in that struggle a possibility. To rise above all challenges and even to face gods. I like this Promete. Promus. Prometheus guy. He he he. Good Tilda. I want to do the same. As I have shown you, I will build my own place with things that will make living fun and enjoyable. That is the hope part, the second will be fire. I pointed at the ashes on the floor and in her lap, I will bring fire, in our case, magic to the normal people. What if they grab you too, tying you to a rock and killing you repeatedly? She asked, watching my eyes, and when answering, I never blinked. A risk I am willing to take. If all goes right, I will have the power to resist it. I do not intend to go down without a fight. 85. Chapter 10. The First Companion. We spent a week back home, and while I spent my time teaching Sasha to read, the maids and soldiers began to whip the rest of my new retinue into shape. They would be mine to command later on, so they had to be strengthened. Not to do battle but to at least look like regular humans. Living in the forest without many skills to speak of, I was surprised they were still alive. Of course, I gave them a chance to leave. If they wanted, they could have left. Go back to the forest and do whatever they want. Seven people did so, and I never stopped them from leaving. Nor did anyone send people after them to silence the bunch, although Oleg was arguing openly with me to do so. I think the firm way I shot him down made Sasha open up a little more, as she never complained when I pressed her to start learning. I don't get this word. She came up to me, holding a parchment as we were walking on a narrow footpath, heading towards my original destination, the open mine where the church got its stones in the past. It's the word for mana, I explained to her patiently. I was surprised by the speed she was learning. Memorizing the alphabet with its 44 characters was done by a day. What she was kind of struggling with was recognizing words when those characters were written down in sequence. I say she struggled, but it meant she learned it after around 8 to 10 tries. Still doing it with lightning speed. I suspected that mana had different effects on her body besides enabling her to cast spells. Talking about that, she was shaping up beautifully. A week of normally eating and sleeping started to turn her for the better, almost making her glow. Her body began to gain back its healthy weight. In return, she was getting sexier by the day. I was a bit jealous. I had to work besides inheriting my parents' genes. She only had to eat and sleep. Not fair, thanks. Sasha chuckled, putting the parchment away, stretching, wearing a traveler's outfit, and carrying a bag on her back. No need. It is the basic I can't do with subordinates who can't read. When you can do it well, we will practice writing and move on to numbers. I can learn that too? Of course. Duh. It is the basics. I will have to teach you more complex stuff. Or how are you going to help me with my research? What if I can't do it? She asked, tilting her head, looking a bit nervous and troubled. Oh well, I will have to look for another mage and find you a profession you can excel in. I will do my best. She mumbled softly, but I did catch it. Not that I am not looking for more mages, but I am not stupid enough to think one would fall into my lap. Eventually, I will need someone who can do some advanced stuff. That would suggest something is very wrong here. Oleg chimed in, still playing the role of my bodyguard. I never heard about mage escapees before. I think they thought I was dead. Sasha shrugged, 
They did pursue me but then gave up after a while. Do you think they made a report? I asked not Sasha but Oleg, who simply shrugged. I guess they wouldn't tell the higher ups they lost a child. A witch at that. Probably their heads would have been lopped off. Good. She added, enjoying the thought. Relax with the hate train there. I patted her shoulders. Making her raise an eyebrow, and Oleg also looked back over his shoulder. What is a train? Both of them asked curiously. Oh, it's an invention. In my mind only for now. What does it do? Does it work with fire? Sasha went on, becoming more and more inquisitive after she realized I hadn't lied to her before. Well, yeah, yes, it can. I thought about it, already pondering how I could lay down tracks and use steam engines to go back and forth. The problem was, where the hell am I going to get steel from when we can't even build stone houses? Shit. This will take time, Leon. She poked me gently, drawing my attention back to her. You spaced out again. You are doing that too much. Sorry, my train of thought is led from one issue to another that I have no solution for yet. I shrugged, stopping and quickly drawing up the image of a train on the ground with the tip of my sword. This is a train. I can draw you a more detailed blueprint later if you want. Simply put, it is a carriage made out of steel, running on steel tracks. You ignite a fire in it, feed it, and then it can go along those tracks with great speed, dragging carts you can fill with whatever you want. Even people. Whoa. They exclaimed, watching it with wonder in their eyes while I started walking again. Hey. Sasha rushed after me, catching up quickly. Can you really make something like that? Not now. Too many problems prevent me from making it into reality. How much would it be able to carry, young lord? Well, I looked at her leg, thinking if he would believe me or not. So I went with an example I think was in the realm of possibilities for them to understand. It could easily drag the church and town behind it. No way, they both exclaimed, and it took me some persuasion to calm them down. I can't give you proof, so it is up to you to believe me or not. But why would I lie? Dot. It was already dusk when we finally arrived. While the two began setting up a campsite, I decided to look at the mine. Calling it an open pit mine was a kind gesture. It was. Pathetic. I recognized the work. How they chipped off or, with some unknown method, broke off the stones from the side of the mountain. A maybe 10 or 12 meter deep oval shaped pit was dug out, getting some hard stones mined from deep within, but it was nowhere near what I expected. However, I had to realize my expectations came from my previous life, something that was not applicable here. While walking closer, I was also picking up rocks, as many small chunks littered the ground around the area. What I was most surprised to find was that some had traces of iron in them. Why wasn't this area exploited yet? We certainly have an ore vein deep underground, probably running into the mountains. I could only think about other regions already having an industry built out, and it's much cheaper to mine there than to start one up here. My evidence to support my conjecture was the fact that we had to buy the equipment for our soldiers from one such region at an exorbitant price, saying it was because they had to ship it from so far away. Bullshit. This is good, I murmured, pocketing some samples before returning to the camp seeing that Oleg was cutting wood and making a fire while Sasha finished putting up the tents. Why do we only have two? One for me and one for you too, she answered casually. PFT, heck no. I'm sleeping with you. Oleg is so big I wouldn't have space next to him. Ha, he laughed, feeling proud, but Sasha was gawking at me. Relax, relax. I walked past her, sat down on a log, and started examining my little rocks but it was hard as the night settled in by now. It's inappropriate. She protested again, making me look up at her face, repeating the facts she seemed to forget from time to time. I already saw everything that there is to you, Sasha. We could go bath together, it wouldn't change a thing. Why 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 you? She stammered while I caught Oleg looking at us and showing me a thumbs up, managing to finally ignite the fire. MMM me tilde. I replied, rolling my eyes. I won't molest you. Relax. Well, she was still unhappy about the fact, but there was nothing she could do. And I won't sleep with another guy when I have a girl with me. Dinner was fine, I always liked barbecuing some meat over an open fire. Although I missed the variety of spice we had in my time. Oh well, maybe later on I can get some. Sasha, 
even though she was recovering quickly after a good dinner, became extremely sleepy, so she returned to the tent early. I remained, talking with Oleg a little, listening to how the others fared back in the castle before I also excused myself. Have a good night's sleep, young lord. I set up warning traps and will stay up for now to guard you. Wake me up when you are sleepy, I looked at him, then we will switch. Thank you, young lord. I only smiled before disappearing into my tent and settling down beside Sasha, who was lying on her back. Looking at her, she was cute and innocent, pushing down my perverted, evil thoughts. I just laid down next to her, letting sleep take over me. What I didn't expect was that my mind would make a move while I was asleep, and somewhere in the coming hours, I did climb onto her, finding a place for my head on her flat chest. I just couldn't help it. She did smell really nice. 69. Chapter 11. Starting out, 1. Waking up on her was surprisingly lovely. I mean, she smelled good. And even though she was flat as a washboard, her aura was different. I can't really put it into words, but I felt refreshed and fired up. Unlike her, you are heavy. She groaned, looking wronged, watching me sit up and stretch, wiping my mouth and drool like a dog. Somebody forgot to push me off. I added snarkily, but she simply snorted, sitting up and turning away, changing clothes. No crying to look away. What? You said it. You already saw everything. She shot back, looking over her shoulder, her face still turning red. Ahaha ha, true. When I emerged from the tent, I realized Oleg didn't wake us up, and instead, he remained up all night, guarding us. No matter. He had time to nap as I spent the day climbing down the mine, bringing Sasha along as I inspected the rocks and the walls of the open pit mine. I don't see anything but stone. What is so interesting about it? She asked, standing next to me while I took notes and pen drawings, marking them in my notebook. Think of it like this. I explained patiently, look at this as a cross section of the earth and the foot of the mountain. Have you ever seen a birthday cake? Why yes. She nodded licking her lips unconsciously. Same thing, the people here cut it up. Now we can see the different layers. Like on a slice of a cake. See these? Yeah? Rocks? No. Look closer. I moaned, tapping directly at the differently colored vein visible inside of it. Yep, still rocks. The ones that are rattling in your empty head. Wow. She flared up, looking hurt and starting to pout, stomping in place. You, you. But no retort came from her probably because she was still wary of our difference in social standings. Say it clearly, I would not be mad hearing it. I shrugged, giving her time to gather the courage. You. Boopy head. PFT. I chortled, not expecting a kinder garden level insult. But it was cute. Look, little one. Your ding dong is what little. I am as tall as you. I'm still growing for the next five years. But if you want, I can show you my ding dong, and you can measure it with your hand. Eek. Don't flinch. If you can't handle it, don't bring it up. I added with a grin before waving her to come closer, but instead of my spear, I showed her the vein of iron ore before us. See this? This is not rock. This is iron. This shows that there is a vein here that can be mined. We need only the manpower to start digging, to be honest. And I could use this mine for many other things. Like, don't you just need stone for your city? Ha. Look, I shrugged, trying to say it as simply as possible. I will go step by step. I need stone. Yes. We will start cutting here and expand on the mind. While getting the stone blocks I need, we will also create enough raw material to create cement. And I was thinking of making a blast furnace. Nothing fancy, just a smaller one, to make iron and proper tools for ourselves. Then, when we are getting work done, build more and try my hand at steel forging. We could do all that, yeah? It won't be easy, and at first, it will need a lot of manpower. I can't do shit until we have a proper flow of iron at our hands. I can't order tools from elsewhere, that would raise suspicion in the empire. So I will have to procure them myself. I will need to drain blacksmiths out of some talented people who I can trust. Anyway, when we get the tools, we will be able to equip more workers, get more people to operate at a higher level, and snowball it from there. We can easily set up pulleys around here, so getting the stuff up won't be a problem. What is a pulley? You'll see. It will make things easy. What I wanted I already got from here. 
a place where we open up our first mine and start extracting the building blocks of my, I mean, our future. I chuckled, returning to the surface, looking around, now watching the mountains and their snowy tops. Next is water. Don't tell me you will conjure a river out of nowhere, she joked, but I just rubbed my chin. No, not really. I was observing the mountains. In winter, the snow caps are spaced much lower than they are now. If you watch it, they are slowly coming down as we speak as winter gets closer and closer. Where do they go when they melt? Um, I don't know, into the air. Like how puddles disappear? Partially, yes, but not really. I hummed, tilting my head. When they melt, they don't evaporate fully like that. They have to flow down. And where that is, you ask? Underground. I pointed below our feet. I bet there is a subterranean river here. A what river? The only river I know is a bit further away. Which probably originates from somewhere here, from the one that flows underground. So, I will have to trek up the mountains soon enough, find a source we can use, and start building an aqueduct. Um, I will explain everything. I patted her head gently, lucky for us, it would be on a slope, so I would not need to set up siphons and what not to battle up hill inclines. I can tunnel the water straight into castellums. Cast. What? Distribution tanks. From then on, I can set up secondary and tertiary ones. From there, pressure takes over gravity's role and distributes water to wherever I want it. This is going to be my first and main priority. Why? She asked. And even if I saw she didn't understand much of it, she was still curious. When building my city, I will need to flatten the land. When doing the groundwork, I intend to lay down the pipings, which means many things. First, I will have to integrate a sewer system, connected to that said river. Then, we will get fresh water from the source, which will not just make it so that every building in my city will have drinking water at the ready, whenever we want, but also that it will wash the waste away. I counted the number of wells in the city. We have ample groundwater here, which gets renewed constantly. Whatever is under our feet is plenty. I don't get it. You will, in time. Or when we start executing it, it sounds more complex than it is in reality. What I am doing here is ancient. KHM, I mean, bare bones. Something that can be done by sheer hard work and by hand. It is a start. If I can, I will upgrade it later on, like adding some kind of magical filter to it so we can recycle it without wasting it. Oh well, I will focus on what I can do for now, if I am creating Rome here, I must heed the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. What is Rome? Is it something to do with Prometheus? Um, yes, I answered, jolting back to reality, lying a little, it was best to include the city in myth as, this world had no Rome of its own. Dot. Winter was coming in faster than usual this year. Luckily, when we returned to the castle, I located what I wanted. Taking a trip to the mountains and climbing up high, I recorded multiple cave entrances that were probably part of an interconnected system. I say probably because Oleg was adamant about not letting me in and investigating deeper. It was the same with Sasha, who was highly superstitious, saying there had to be monsters living in the dark. If they did, then why was my family guarding the only corridor into the valley? The beasts could have gone through the holes any time then. Anyway, the clues on the walls were clear. They were eroded by water. The snow and ice, when melting, had to flow downwards. And I had the proof I needed that it seeped into the mountain and was going under our feet. It was the perfect filtering process. This was good and bad news at the same time. On the flip side, we could start digging finding a source, and building my upcoming city's water system, but this also meant when I open up mines, I must be extra careful of flooding, this was not only a boon but also a hazard, MHM, I will deal with this in due time, I stretched, leaning back in my chair after putting down my quill, MH, Sasha moaned, waking up in her chair, sitting before the fire, balled up in multiple blankets, looking like a burrito, ah, I really would eat one now, Ha. Did something happen? She grumbled, trying to open her eyes with difficulty. Nope, I just finished my planning. I laughed, standing up and opening the door to my balcony. Close it. It's cooled. She cried again, wiggling around like a cocooned animal, only her head being visible. I know, but I need some fresh air, I said, standing there, 
letting the night's cold air blow past me. I don't know what the time was, but it was probably around midnight, and the sky was covered with dark, grey clouds. Snow was falling heavily, and it was beautiful. How did you survive the winters? After a few minutes, I asked, closing the door and walking to the fire, sitting on the adjacent armchair. It was hard. I don't want to talk about it. Now it is much better, she murmured, avoiding my eyes, watching the fire instead. I see. Well, I'm glad you have let up a little. See, I am not that bad. And I was true to my words. The rest of your people are coming along nicely. Come spring, we will start working. On the city? She asked, turning towards me, happy that I didn't press on and try to make her relieve painful memories. Yep, I have chosen the spot. Starting tomorrow, I will spread a notice through the region of hiring able bodies. I will also take some of father's men and start cutting down the forest, flattening the land. We will use the wood and everything else we dig up. Nothing will go to waste. I don't know how many people will show up. I read your draft. Paying with the opportunity of a better life? That sounds extremely vague. I know. But want the first batch of people who will come to be part of the building process. I want them to be proud of what we will build and look at it as their own. You know. I believe if people think they made it by their own hands, they will protect it to their last breath. This city will be for those who are living in it. I want to create a unity that will center around the people. The individual. You will own your own home, your own property. Something that nobody can take away from you. We will? She asked still a bit foreign to the idea. Yes, don't be mistaken. This castle is not mine, not my family's. The same is true for the people in our towns. We own nothing. It is the empire's. We are just being allowed to live here. If they ever want to come down on us, move us, replace us, they can do it. Not in my city. Owning your own home, where it can be warm when you want it. She murmured, imagining it, and I saw a happy light dance in her eyes, he he. Of course we will need rules and laws. So, when the construction starts, I will start working on that. So by the time it is finished, we will have rules set down, but that is for me to worry about. What about the tools? Did you solve it? Yes and no. I shrugged. I will select a few people and start opening up the mine that the church used. For now, I have to work with the tools we have at hand. I will be mostly present there, helping them get started. The others can cut down the forest and flatten the earth by themselves. That should be easy. Have you ever thought about resting? I will rest when I'm dead. I grinned, leaning back my head and watching the ceiling. To be honest, I was way too fired up, and I couldn't wait more for spring to come. 76. Chapter 12. Starting out, 2. I spent the winter mostly inside my room, either teaching Sasha or drawing up my plans. What I noticed was that her mind was like a sponge, quickly slurping up the knowledge and managing to retain it in the long term. Whenever I asked her out of the blue, she managed to give the correct answer, no matter when. I was starting to suspect that magic truly affected a mage's intellect which was a great boon and a requirement to remember so many incantations and draw complex formations. Now, I only had to find a way to start teaching her magic, but, with my plate so full, it had to wait. The moment the weather started to warm up, and the snow began to melt, I was ready to go out, bringing people away from the castle and collecting everyone who signed up to my notice. All in all, I had around 300 people wanting to work. Many were men with no choice, meaning they were either young or without exact skills that they could sell to anyone else. I was surprised that there were many kids between the ages of 11 and 12, and the oldest looked to be maybe 25. Well, in a place where their average lifespan is 50 at tops, I couldn't be picky. I made sure that Oleg and a few capable warriors took the more significant chunk of workers to the area I marked for them on the map. It was from a day walking from here, and I had chosen a spot where the land looked relatively straightforward, and the mountain was forming a slight U-shape. It would be a very well protected spot, and the mountain range would always protect one side of the city. By my estimation, just cutting the trees down and flattening the land would take the whole year, if not more. That gave me enough time to start the primary industry at the mining site and start producing the building blocks we will need and, if I am lucky, maybe some iron tools, too. So, with the rest, 
We headed straight to the mine, and our first move was to create a clearing. We cut out significant parts of the forest, using the wood to build houses on my instructions and erecting log cabins where the workers would stay, just that alone surprised them. Which then surprised me as I think they thought they would live in shoddy tents. Please, this will be a site where they will have to live for the foreseeable future. I am not a slaver to not care about their living conditions. Leon, come quickly. Sasha rushed up to me as I was overseeing one of the houses being built explaining to the people how to do it, as many of them were still unable to read or follow a basic blueprint. What happened? I asked, expecting that somebody already had an injury, it was bound to happen, I just didn't think it would be this soon, did someone chop off his own hand already, did a tree crush him, nothing like that, we found something incredible, oh, really now, she didn't lie. It indeed was incredible. Now that the open pit and the surrounding area were cleaned up, shrubs, vines, and tall grass mowed down, something brilliant appeared. It was a magic formation etched straight into the ground. It was already faded, and some places of it were damaged, making it incomplete, but it was there. Whoa! I exclaimed, ordering everyone to make a cordon and keep an eye out for others in the vicinity. This made my brain whirl, and now I understood that they used magic when mining. I just don't know what this did. But it was a magic formation, so it surely had a function. What is it? Can you tell? Sasha asked, her eyes twinkling with excitement. Aren't you the witch? Why do you ask me? You tell me. Uh, I don't know. I had never seen one until you showed me yours. I only recognized this because of that. Well, I don't know yet. I will draw it down and study it, maybe I can learn a thing or two. Don't try to activate it yet. I see that it's broken. Maybe it will explode and kill us all if you fuse mana into it. What? She shouted loudly, jumping backward. Ah ha ha. Don't be silly. I don't think it explodes just because you are here. Just don't excite it with your powers. I won't, I won't. She waved her hands like a windmill, now keeping at least two meters from it. Go, look around the mine with some soldiers. Start sweeping away the road and the rocks and try to see if there are more around here. An idea in my mind was slowly forming, but I needed more proof. While the group began to clear more rubble and dirt away, I was drawing the formation into my notebook, and I had already found the first problem. One part of it was missing, not because it was damaged being left here for decades, but deliberately. A chunk of it was cut out and either brought away or destroyed. It's probably a safety measure, so others won't use it. Replicating it will not be easy. But my brain was already working on it. I was referencing the different parts of it and deducting the missing one from what I was seeing. It was truly like an equation. It's a complex one, but I could work with it and, in its weird way, calculate what was taken away. There are more. Sasha came back, running, out of breath, and sweating. She wasn't used to much physical labor, but she wasn't complaining. How quaint, I murmured as there were seven more, smaller ones, etched into the ground, previously covered by decades of dirt, now swept away. These are connection or booster nodes to the main one at the top. What does that mean? Sasha asked, her eyebrows raised as high as possible. These are also damaged, but I can infer from their structure that they are all identical. It's probably the same method as setting up long-range radio signals. You need to set receiver and booster towers at intervals, or the signal gets weak. But of course, there is a difference between radio to radio and cell towers and... Leon? Sasha asked, tapping my back as I crouched down, running my fingers on the faded lines of the formation. I looked at her, blinking my eyes with question marks in them. Are you possessed by evil spirits, eh? Why? That was such an abrupt question I failed to process it at first. You were talking strange. K-H-M. Anyway, what you need to know is that these little ones are receiving the magic from the big one, transmitting it towards the bottom of the mine. So, I rushed down, following my conjecture, and lo and behold, there it was. Another big one at the bottom, same looking at the one at the top. Another one. She exclaimed with surprise while I walked around it over and over again. M-H-M. Keep up the work, and first finish building the residences. Don't worry about this for now. I stood up, telling the others and sending everybody back to work while I returned to figure this one out. Dot.
It was four days later when I finally finished it. I, well, possibly, recreated the formation with the missing part, my calculations should be correct, and I was ready to try it out. To the dismay of Sasha, as she would accompany me in this project, we filled in the missing parts, and I completed the formation with a chisel on all of them, it was crude, but it should be okay. Or I may blow this whole thing up, but I am willing to risk it. Standing back at the top, most of the others retreated to a safe distance, and I was glad that Oleg was with the other group and he wasn't here to say no to this all. The rest of my people were not brave enough to say no to me, or to progress. Stop grinning, Sasha moaned, pulling on my sleeves. It creeps me out when we may be just killing ourselves. Oh, please, I moaned, rolling my eyes. These were used here by the church and the empire. This has to be safe and not something destructive. Even if I failed, the worst that could happen is that it won't work. Are you sure? Didn't you tell me it could blow up? If incomplete. But even then, it was just a wild guess. I am not a formation master. Then how do you know that they won't blow up now? She cried out, her legs shaking. What if you turned them into something dangerous? Then we die. So what? we die, that's what, I am not ready to die, bah, don't worry, it's not a big deal, now, do it, I pushed her before me, infuse mana into the formation, no, I am ordering you, Sasha, no, I refuse to do it, come on, please, I shrugged, holding her waist, but she was like a donkey, refusing to move an inch, I'm not doing it, find someone else, girl, I grumbled, and with a hard slap, I grabbed her buttocks, slipping my fingers deep between her thighs, it was immediately effective, the sudden feeling drove her over the edge as she flared up, simultaneously feeling multiple emotions, such as shyness, anger, and maybe a little bit of excitement sprinkled on top, she was about to turn around and complain, but her unstable emotions excited her mana, which activated the formation, hi ah, she screamed, forgetting to be angry at me, and I failed to pull my hand away, watching without blinking, wanting to see everything, the formation glowed in a blue light, looking extremely beautiful, it remained active as I saw it pull energy from the air and recirculated while, one by one, the smaller ones also lit up, going in steps until arriving at the one at the bottom, then nothing, they simply remained glowing and doing nothing, we, didn't die, Sasha asked, on the verge of tears, no, we didn't, I whispered, still needing her bottom, stop it already, oh, sorry, it felt nice, I laughed, letting her go and walking forward, Leon, she tried grabbing me but missed my hand as I walked into the light, ooh, I exclaimed at once as I saw my hair be raised, and I felt my weight gone the moment I was inside its effective area, this is an anti-gravity formation, ha, huh. Now I am really getting it. I can improve this. Ah ha ha. Huh? What are you talking wa? Her scream came because, seeing how I was okay, she followed me, but the moment she lost all feeling of weight in her petite body, she panicked. And now she was floating and spinning in midair. It is an area of effect, I continued, turning towards her, letting myself float there with a grin. Nothing has weight here. They could easily mine out the rocks and transport them up from the bottom. Probably had other tools that made it extremely easy to cut it out and bring it away. Ha 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 ha. With this, building my city will be a piece of cake. Help. I'm floating away. She wailed, throwing her legs and arms everywhere, not even listening to me, her body slowly rising upwards. You are hopeless. While shaking my head, I grabbed her ankle pulling her down and stabilizing her. Clearly, the formation could be kept on for a long time without further input from anybody. My next question was, how do I turn it off? Probably with a spell. But I knew none, and I don't think Sasha could do it either. So I simply scratched a part of my added solution, and it immediately disrupted the flow and turned off at once. Ha, I can feel my body again. She exhaled with relief. This was too weird. No, my dear Sasha, I answered, licking my lips, feeling I hit the jackpot, this is something that will change my world, you'll see, 69, 
Chapter 13, First Building Blocks When we opened up the mines again and carved out the first blocks, I taught the people here how to use the pulleys we set up in the previous days. I decided to go with the safe route and lift out the smaller blocks like that, as the first job would be to start building a road, it would give a basic understanding of how it works, what to look out for, and a good training regime pump up their experience a little before we start building something more extensive. What surprised me was how quickly they learned and adapted, and after a month or so, we had a stone road leading out from the mine to the main dirt road that was frequently used. Of course, it was not a perfect, modern road, but it was a start. While they were working on it, I also perfected the magic formations, worked on it tirelessly, and figured out what to add to it to turn it on and off without damaging it. Are you sure this is going to work? Sasha asked as I was finishing up my modifications on the actual magic circles. I am. It is simple mathematics. Even if it is about magic, it follows laws, which I could infer by studying them. I just need a witch to start operating it, as I am useless when it comes to mana. I wouldn't call you useless if you managed to decode something that nobody else could. You just don't know people who could. I can't be the only one. Anyway. Enough of rubbing my ego. I laughed while grinning at her. I would be much happier if you started rubbing something else. MHM? What? She asked innocently, which in turn made me shrug. I don't know if she was serious or simply learned that I can't joke around if I feel I am abusing her innocence. Nothing. Instead, start focusing. Like how it rained. This time, I wasn't groping her buttocks. It made me a bit sad, but oh well. While working, I recalled all the old rumors of meditation and gathering kiff from my old life. A bunch of nonsense gathered from books and shows. But as magic was real here, I thought it might work. And it did. Sasha quickly exclaimed while following my retelling of fantasy concepts. She felt weird, as if little bubbles were running through her body. She did not manage to cast a spell, but she did manage to summon her mana. Her body became a bit more glossy, like being oiled up, and her eyes were glowing in the color of fire. I don't know what it really meant, but it did work. And when standing close to the formation, it reacted at once, activating. Now, with my modifications, the moment Sasha started to think about calmness and imagining a serene scenery, the magic circles picked up on it and followed suit, slowly powering down until they were dormant once more. I was already figuring out that mana had to work like some kind of wave or frequency or something similar along those lines. They can be tuned and attuned to a base frequency, from where they can be excited or calmed down. I still needed more information to get something concrete, but this was an excellent start. With it on, I ordered men at the bottom to place the first giant block of stone on it, pulling along with ropes tied to its side. It was too big to lift with any primitive pulley system we had set up here, but we didn't need that. The moment it touched the first formation at the bottom, it floated up like a balloon, no longer weighing anything. Our men just had to hold the ropes, lead it up, and follow the road and the active nodes until they arrived before us. Ha! This is pure awesomeness. I laughed, clapping while many others were looking on with mouths wide open in pure wonder at what was happening. Magic is something else, Sasha murmured, looking down at her hands. Finally realizing that her talent was not a curse and not something terrible but instead a gift with great potential. It is. I agreed, patting and rubbing her back. People, look out because it will leave the anti-gravity field in a few moments. I shouted at the others, and soon enough, when it got an arm's reach from the central circle, the stone block fell to the ground with a loud thud. By my estimations, it had to be at least around a ton in weight, if not more. And it was floating like a piece of cloud a moment ago. Wonderful. What are we going to do with it? Sasha asked me as I was rubbing my chin, wearing a big smile. I have multiple ideas about how to transport it. The first is very simple. I started explaining it, not minding that everyone else was listening in on it too. I can etch the formation onto the block itself, and we can transport it that way. Or we can create tools for transporting, like a carriage that has the formation and generates the field itself, designed for ferrying stones back and forth. The second one sounds more practical. She said only after a brief thinking, I also think so. For now, we are going to cut out similar blocks, expand the mine, and just keep bringing them up here. 
I want everyone to get used to how mining works, and we will continue to build the roads. I clapped, and with that, everyone was getting back to work, including me, trying to design this world's first heavy duty truck, and hopefully, this one won't roll over and kill me. Again. Dot. My first prototype was ready in a month. Of course, it was not a real truck. Far from it, I took the platform of one without the many confusing elements, as it would be dragged by horses anyway, but I did improve the wheels, the suspension, how it turns, and all the little, important details so it would be more sturdy and more easily controlled. It was made out of wood, as we had that resource in abundance, and it made it easy for me to grab my tools and ditch the magic formation onto it. And. This was when I ran into the first big problem. Sasha could activate it, and my new glorified cart had achieved the desired result of producing an anti-gravity field. We could even load up four giant blocks of rock onto it, tie it down, and start dragging it around. All was good. Right until it got far away from Sasha, and it simply turned off. The weight of the stones immediately crushed the whole thing, breaking it apart, scaring the horses, and causing minor chaos. Shit was the only thing I could say. I had to realize there was more to the official magic circles than I first thought. Then I remembered how my basic book told about the crystals that mages use, helping them cast powerful magic. I wanted to investigate and see if our found formations had something to do with that. See if they have something like that in them. Maybe they were made with a two law with a conduit of such properties, but I couldn't risk ruining them. My modifications alone were a significant risk, and now I felt lucky that I didn't screw it up. So, for now, I was stuck. Well, Sasha, I think it will be up to you to transfer the stones back and forth. I shrugged while waiting for a new cart to be made so I could etch my magic circle onto it. It will help me train and improve my magic. She answered, sounding fired up. I was happy to hear it and glad to see she was changing her mind. Maybe she was right. If she supplies the formation with mana, perhaps something will be triggered within her and evolve. Who knows? Magic could be unpredictable and I was helping for some good results. The first trip with the mined stones to the area where the majority of my people were clearing away the forest happened not long after my second prototype was completed. It took two days to get there, and it also showed me that building a road was instrumental. The moment we were off from the hastily built stone road, back on the dead one, it was so uneven and filled with bumps that I was afraid that the stone blocks rocking back and forth would destroy my magic circle. Then we would have been stranded. Luckily, that didn't happen. After arriving at our destination, I called for Oleg and explained to him that they would have to break the stones down and start building a road as soon as possible. I outlined it to him on the map, and if everything would go smoothly, we should have the first primary road towards the mine. While the others were amazed by the cart and by Sasha's gift, I took a walk around the now flat and empty space. I was honestly surprised at how quick they worked and managed to clear away the land escape. I had nothing but praising words leaving my mouth. Good. Good. Very good. I slapped her legs back, looking around with a grin, while working on the road. I also want you to select people who show talent, who are functioning hard and doing their tasks precisely. What are you planning, young lord? Here, I gave him multiple parchments with my drawings of the city's basic blueprints. We will have to dig these trenches to the exact same parameters as I detailed them. They have to be the same in position and match my calculations. This is really important. For now, don't worry about it. But keep an eye out for those people while building the roads. I need to start selecting people who can then lead others and break them up into working groups. Start motivating them with food. The talented ones can get a bit more every time, okay? A bit more meat and what not. Really? He asked, finding it weird. But he wouldn't go against me. I knew that meat was a bit rare in peasants' diets, but I was going to slowly switch that up. We still have some beast meat in the castle. Even you bulky bunch can't eat that much. So yes, instead of letting it rot away, I already made a deal with father. Some will be transferred here, and those who work hard and put in the extra effort will get to eat more of it. Simple. I will trust this to you, Oleg. So use it and motivate them. I want a selection of skilled workers so I can teach them easily. You can trust me, young lord. I will not fail you. Um. Can I ask what the purpose of this, 
he asked, watching my plans. Why will these holes be under the city? This, my friends, is what will make it possible that water gets to every home and also brings the waste away. No more shit stains. No more stench. This will be a clean city, you will see. 69. Chapter 14. Foundation. While the works were underway, Sasha being the carrier of the building blocks between the two sites, I took Oleg and some soldiers up the mountains. Now, it was time to get water flowing to where I wanted. Not even Oleg's complaints could hold me back this time. Following the clues on the rocks left behind by the snow and ice, I could easily infer where to look for our underground spring. It turned out I wasn't wrong as only on the second day I found a cave where I could hear water rushing after ten minutes of exploring. Gods above, Oleg exclaimed as he followed me with a torch, finding it hard to squeeze through the openings with his huge body. But he was right, what we saw was mesmerizing. It was just as beautiful as my first glimpse at this world, an enormous cavern with flowing water coming from above, rolling down in a hidden riverbed inside the mountain, rushing forward heading into a hole, disappearing to who knows where, it was like a scenery out of some movies from my time, like an ancient cave of dwarfs, I just hoped some Balrog wouldn't show up, killing us prematurely, perfect, I clapped, feeling happy but also careful not to slip, watch out, as it's not just cold here, everything is wet, you fell into the river, and you will be gone, no coming back from that, I warned the rest while finding a place to stick my torch, Besides our fire, a low, pale blue light came from some kind of moss on the walls. I wasn't a biologist, but I was sure it wasn't something weird in my world. Be careful, young lord. Oleg warned me while I lowered myself, lying on my stomach, and got close to the riverbank and put my hand into the fast-flowing body of water. Whoa, chilly. Scooping out a handful, I tasted it, and even though water doesn't really have a taste, it was the tastiest of all the waters I have ever tried. Hell, it was more refreshing than any energy drink I had while studying. Perfect. I backed off, standing up and looking at the rest. We will mark it. First, we must widen the opening so workers can come in. We will open up a new channel to the river that will lead to the outside and tunnel it down to our city. Young lord, cutting through the mountain will not be easy. It is extremely sturdy. I know, but it is a must. Plus, it's only the cave's opening. After I get my workers who are precise enough, I will start on the foundation of the city. What iron tools do we need will be imported for now, but building an advanced blacksmith's workshop will be easy after water flows towards where we want it. I can build a kiln, and we can start producing our own iron tools. Dot. Winter was coming just when we were finishing up the foundations. It was also the first time I could prove to my parents that my formula was right and produced the empire's secret formula. Cement. I laid down the first blocks myself as my people began to use the stones and my cement to build a base of my city. Mainly the future sewers and pipes. Of course, cutting out round rocks was hard, so I opted to work smart, not hard. We used big blocks that we drilled a hole into. It was much easier that way and we just laid things down like playing Lego. Although, they didn't get my reference when it slipped out loud from my mouth. Oh well, they couldn't understand why this was important, and when finished, they asked why we buried them. It would have been too much to explain, so I just smiled, saying they will see it next year. This winter, beasts attacked once again. I brought Sasha along, heading to the walls so she could witness it, and something interesting happened. The beasts noticed her very quickly and stopped attacking, like they were afraid of her presence. This made me sure that they had something magical in their blood. Probably in their meat, too. No wonder my dad and his soldiers grew this big. Eating magical beast meat. Don't eat them. I blurted out, looking at Sasha, who was thoroughly confused. Why? They are juicy and tasted good when you gave me some. Yeah? But I think it's what makes my dad and the soldiers this bulky. If you start looking like a wrestler, I ain't touching you. Who would want you to touch them? She flared up, almost screaming, drawing the nearby soldiers' attention. You, of course, I replied with a shrug. It is you who love to touch. Always climbing on me while we sleep. You are heavy, you know. No, I'm not. I rolled my eyes. You could push me off any time, yet you don't. 
If you dislike it, you are free to leave my room anytime. HMPH. Exactly. I concluded, grabbing her waist. I remember someone caressing my hair this morning. You were up? She yelped. But before we could continue, my father's loud snort interrupted us. Now the prey has gone. TSK. Go back to your rooms and produce a grandson already instead of screwing US over, son. Well. That made Sasha blush to a color that was similar to my hair. But dad was right. So I led her away. We needed a grander son. KHM, I mean, if Sasha's presence alone stops a beast from coming near us, how will we replenish our spent resources? Dot. Will this work? She asked, looking at my blueprints in our room the same night. She was wearing a puffy, thick robe while I knew she had nothing under it. Which did make my imagination wiggle a little. Yep, I answered, finishing washing my face in a bowl, wearing only towel around my waist. By now, she was somewhat used to it, even though she did complain about it on the walls. Mainly because others were around us, when we were alone. She was much more accepting. Was it because she was timid? We will run these pipes down from the mountain? She asked again, finding it inconceivable. They are called aqueducts, until better options surface. These will do. You will be surprised how effective they are. If done right, they will be there even after 2000 years. While I oversee the building of those, you will work with others on this. I explained, walking next to her and hugging her waist, which, this time, didn't result in her complaining. The big one? She picked up another blueprint, looking at it, by now. She could read it fluently and understand the numbers placed on it. Yep, that will be the main castellum. Distribution tank. Exactly. I giggled, slipping my hand down onto her buttocks. No resistance. Nice. Water will gather there, and with the pipes connected to it, it will be sent through them. Yep, with this, the city will always have running water, in every home. Want to take a bath? Open it, and water will flow. Fountains, decorative trees, and flowers. Everything is possible. It will be nice, sweet smelling and, and stop groping my ass, she moaned, pulling away as I was leaning very close to her neck, breathing down on it, bummer, I can't focus like this, I don't want to mess it up, so teach me instead of fondling me, you perv, okay, okay, I answered with a chuckle, sitting down with her and explaining how it would actually work, not just to her, but throughout the upcoming days, I also taught the selected few we invited to the castle for the winter break, dot, the moment winter was over, I led our people out, to my surprise, the moment it happened, another group was waiting for me, asking me to join up with us, looking around, I realized we essentially tripled our workforce, I hoped some new faces would show up this spring, and it did happen, with more people, I could accelerate things, I delegated them under Sasha, so she should be their overseer and make sure they work as intended. Their first job was to clean away the building site while Oleg brought the others to the mine, which had already expanded to double its original size. When Sasha ran out of materials to build with, she could go and pick up the next batch at the mine and bring it away. Easy peasy, if everything goes as planned, I will be able to finish the aqueducts by summer and connect it to the piping. I would do a test run to see how the water flows before we close it down for now. Hopefully, all will go without major issues, and I can start building the first part of the city. Or more precisely, the inner city with my own palace, and with some surrounding buildings, made out of stone for the most talented people we have. I can't just build my own as it would make me look horrible. Maybe even make them think it was all for my own place, and they will have nothing. Of course, only some of the city would be built of stone. I want variety, so I have already made plans and decided to mix a little bit of Asian and Roman architecture. My own palace will be such a mix, using stone blocks for the base and a wall surrounding it, while the actual building atop it will be built of wood, copying my knowledge about the forbidden city in my memories. The most genius thing is they made it without nails. So I won't need to waste iron on it either. My only wish was now that I would have at least ten Sasha with me. The fact that with her around me, I could carve my perfected formation into anything and turn it weightless was a godsend. It made handling the materials extremely easy, and one man could raise any blocks above his head and place them down where we needed them. 
maybe they built the pyramids with magic? I was honestly considering it. Young Lord. It was Oleg's shout that knocked me out of my things, and I saw him and Sasha run towards me, looking panicked. Not good. What happened? I asked with worry. To the mines. Quick, he said, almost pulling me away while Sasha grabbed onto my other hand. What the hell happened? I asked again, now with a raised voice. A witch. Another witch, she exclaimed, and I managed to kick out my own leg, if not for them, I would have landed face worse on the ground. What? Are you sure? Yes. Sasha nodded rapidly, she is young. Before I had a chance to activate the formations, she went close, and it came to life. She is a witch. Now. Isn't that interesting? I whispered, my excitement going through the roof, and soon, I was the one who was dragging them along to meet her. 73. Chapter 15. Merlin. Arriving at the mines, I was already fired up, wanting to meet my, I mean, our second witch. I was curious as to whether her skills would be different than Sasha's or if she had more affinity towards spells. Who knows? When we arrived, the people there already surrounded a very nervous and trembling kid who barely reached up to my waist. Damn. He was short. And young. There she is, Sasha said with excitement, explaining everything again, but I wasn't listening. My eyes were scanning the kid's features, their long, black hair that was gleaming unnaturally, the intelligent, dark brown eyes and the almost perfect, doll-like body. Yet there was a problem. My senses were not tingling. Not like when I first looked at Sasha. This one was not a witch, but a warlock. Hey, Sasha, why did you say there was a witch here? Because she stopped in her steps, looking at me, getting confused, and now multiple heads were turning back and forth between me and the evidently little boy before me. Have you asked his name? Merlin. She replied at once. Merlin, the small boy murmured, correcting her and making me almost choke on my saliva. That is what I said, Sasha protested, not finding the errors in her words. What? There. Fuck. Is he like me? Or. Is this some kind of cosmic coincidence? Is it the joke of a laughing god or something? What the hell was going on? I had to test it, so I spat out something that he would have surely heard about if he was from the same place as me. KFC. What is that? Sasha questioned me, just as lost as everybody else. But I only waved my hand. I already got my answer. Which was nothing. I was looking at him without blinking, and he wasn't faking it. He was from this world, so the name he was blessed with had to be something. Local. Hey. Maybe transmigration works both ways. Who knows. Forget it. I clapped, smiling. Merlin is a boy's name. My little dummy. I knocked on the head of Sasha who started pouting and discontent with how I spoke to her before everyone at the scene. I am a boy, Merlin nodded, reinforcing my conjecture, and to show proof, he simply pulled down his trousers. Stop it, now, Sasha cried, rushing forth, pulling it upon him, scaring the kid. Ha, while everyone laughed, I rubbed my forehead because this was not what I expected. Don't get me wrong, I am glad that there is a second witch, I mean, wizard, warlock, whatever, in my group. But, I don't want to raise a kid, not yet. Where are your parents? I asked before doing anything else, and the boy looked around as if he was searching for them. I don't see mom and dad, we came together, but they are not here, they are probably at the other construction. Sasha interjected at once. I hope so. I added, glancing at Sasha. Okay. Okay, we will get to the bottom of this, but first, Merlin, can you walk to the magic circle? Yes, he was surprisingly obedient and didn't look afraid at all. He was either a chill little guy or simply didn't comprehend anything yet. My guess was the latter option. Watching, I couldn't help but smile as the moment he got close, the formations came to life without him doing anything. Didn't have to concentrate or think about it. It just happened. This, in turn, told me he had more tremendous potential than Sasha. Or controlling its output had to be learned by anyone magical and wasn't something innate. They presumably can't handle it at first, which is how they get discovered. I think she also thought about Merlin being stronger than her as she began to shuffle around with a bit more nervous look, playing with her hair. Okay. I walked forward, bringing the kid away, 
let's go and find your parents. I smiled at him, gently stroking his head, and he was quickly at ease, smiling back at me, holding my hand while I instructed everybody to get back to work. Dot. Dot. It took me a day to finally find his parents as they were at the construction of my city. They were clearly worried themselves sick when they were separated when we split the group, but they were too afraid to go and find their kid or ask for help. They never even dared to look me in the eye when I appeared with their son. When I told them he was magical, the mother fainted, which was unexpected, but I can understand it as usually, that meant the kid would be brought away, never to be seen again. Well, not anymore, I spend hours to calm them down, tell them things are changing and that I won't take him away. But he will be under my supervision. I had to put it into terms that they would understand easily and not think it would be me who would take him away in place of the church or something. So, I made her my first squire, a knight in training, to be more precise. Hearing that, their panic and fear turned into ecstatic happiness while Merlin tried to make sense of everything happening around him turning his little head back and forth. In the meanwhile, Oleg also arrived, bringing me the information about the parents, and I learned that the mother was, well, a mother, the father was registered as a leather worker, but he has been out of work for a long time, and they were in a horrible condition as a family, no wonder they applied, going by the fact my workers received a place to live and food was already better than their current situation. After nobody wanted to look after little Merlin, they brought him along just to get separated right at the start. Lucky, yeah, I think I am. Very much so. Okay. Here is the deal. I sat down with the family once I made my plans. You three will now stay in a permanent location near the mine. I need little Merlin there so he can operate the magic formations during the day and study at night. That frees my Sashu up, and she can help here, at the city's construction, without being forced to go back and forth. Study? they asked, seemingly lost. Sasha will visit every night and teach you, and I mean you, the parents, and Merlin, how to read. I will. Sasha flinched, sitting next to me. Until now, she was lost in her thoughts, and I bet she was extremely nervous as her face was way too gloomy. Was she fearing I would replace her as the mage I fuss about? That I would pay more attention to Merlin now as he showed more incredible talent? I will be honest. She was kind of cute when worried. Duh. I flicked her forehead. You can already read, write, and count. I have too many things to focus on, so I can't babysit everybody. You are needed in the city to help out with its building. But you can travel to the mine at night and teach Merlin and the parents for an hour or two. We the parents wanted to say something, but I shot them down with a wave. I don't care about excuses. Public education will be mandatory, so I don't want to hear justifications for why I should not care about you. I don't need people who can't write down their own names. You will learn, or you will go home. Without Merlin, of course. Good. I nodded, not giving them a chance to argue. Not that they would dare go against me, I think. Merlin, you will be a good boy and learn under Sasha Chan, yes, Chan? Merlin and Sasha asked, and I flinched because I was letting my idiotic brain blurt out something stupid. It means, lady, in the magical language. I lied, and they simply nodded, believing me without questions. Good for you, Sasha, that I am a proper gentleman and don't abuse my power by giving you some idiotic title. Anyway, that is not important. What is important is that you focus on things you can do, which is studying. How old are you, Merlin? Um. She looked at his parents before the mother finally answered. Five, my lord. MHM. I see. Well, kids have to be kids. So let him play around until we need him to study or turn the formations on and off. I am not here to rob someone from his childhood. I ended the meeting with a clap and stretching while leaving. The parents couldn't stop thanking me for the incredible generosity, and I won't lie, it was getting a little bit tiring, so I left them to Oleg to escort them back. Ha! It was already dark, so I gave up ascending the mountain and overseeing the works on enlarging the entrance to the underground river. You were surprisingly kind. Was I? I asked with a smile, looking at Sasha, who walked up next to me with a gentle and warm smile. The thing you said about being a kid. I, I really liked the sound of it. Something I wish I heard when I was at the age of Merlin. Huh, I think it's how it should be, in the future, 
kids won't have to work, not until at least 16. Later on, maybe even 18, yeah? Then what about me? Or you? Not everyone can be that lucky. I laughed, hugging her waist, pulling her close, and she wasn't protesting. Instead, she went really silent. Hey, Leon, am I useless, huh? Why do you ask that? You know why? She shrugged, looking at me with worried eyes, I can do nothing. That is how I feel. I can't cast spells or come up with things you do. I can only memorize stuff and do what you say, turning things on and off. But I don't make those things. I never even came up with anything unique. Dummy. Yeah and I or? Don't pinch my butt. She complained with teary eyes, but I just laughed, continuing to knead her bottom. You are worrying too much. Yes, Merlin showcased today the clear evidence that he has mana. He has special powers. Maybe even a lot of it. But you, too, don't forget that. But he is better at it. Is he? I grinned, watching her look at me while holding on to me and ignoring my hand on her buttocks, waiting for me to continue. Or it's the effect of your life? Huh? Think. You were told not to use it, then you escaped and lived for years, suppressing your powers to not get caught. Of course, his mana displays itself differently. He was never told or taught to hide it. Your experiences are totally different, my dear Sasha. So don't worry. You are not worse, not even by a long shot. Really? Really? I leaned in, kissing her cheeks, which turned her bright red, and finally, she realized where I was continuously touching her. So she quickly broke free from my holding. She was cute when embarrassed. She was a bit chaotic. She didn't mind it when it happened, but the moment her mind switched into overdrive and met with a new impulse, or she was reminded of her position, she immediately turned bashful once again, but I didn't mind. This weird duality of her was the product of her life. She wanted to appear strong and somebody who could do anything, who can survive. Then when she got lax, she suddenly switched into a young girl, someone bashful, somebody who was still innocent. I will teach him right, she mumbled, playing with her hair and scratching her cheeks, that is what I expect from you, I can't be everywhere at any time, so I need capable people, you are one of my first trusted subordinates, Sasha, I am counting on you, um, I will, do my best, thank you Tilda, I walked past her, patting her shoulder before heading to find Oleg, as I had to talk to him about Merlin and his family, I was happy about them, but I wasn't naive. What if they are moles? Agents who keep an eye on the territories for the Empire? The chances for it were low, of course. But not zero. So I wanted trusty people who I knew I could count on to keep an eye on them at all times. 69. Chapter 16. Sasha's Thoughts. I felt confused. And afraid? I really did. I have been teaching Merlin for the past four days, and he is frightening. He learns much faster than I did when Leon began teaching me. I only had to tell him about the letters, how they look, how to write, and then he could mimic it after a few tries. Of course, copying what I do is not the same as understanding it. But after four days of learning half of the alphabet, he already recognized them in a book I brought along. He even managed to guess words with letters he didn't know about yet. He is so much smarter than I am, if he keeps this up. He will overshadow me before he turns six. Will. Will I be left behind again? Left alone? Sent back to the forest? Will he send me to the church? Or, he said he won't. But what if I start screwing things up? Nobody answered these questions. And I just couldn't ask Leon. He would say no. Of course he would. What should I do, Mr. Moon? Anytime such questions came to me, I always liked to look up at the full moon. Of course, it couldn't give me answers, I knew that, but it was something I always did. There was nobody to talk to for a long time when I was younger. Ha, huh. I feel really lost. If Merlin gets powerful and more valuable than me in magic, why should he keep me around? To clear my head, I decided to go to the place we built, and he called it a washroom or something like that. It was just a wooden shed with two big basins filled with water. One was to wash off the dirt and grime of our bodies, while the other was to rinse ourselves when finished. The others had already changed them, so both basins were filled with clear water. The task alone was a long trek back and forth from the closest water source. 
That problem will also be solved if he can build those aqueducts. Looking into one of them after lighting the candles on the walls, I saw my sorry expression looking back at me. Ha! I was ugly. My hair was messy, no matter what I did, and I was way too skinny. Small. That was the only thing I could say when I took off my clothes and looked at my tiny breasts. After eating well, I gained some weight, so my bones were no longer sticking out. I expected them to change, too. But they didn't grow. Most of the women I saw had way bigger ones. Not to mention Merlin's mother. She had a pair that were as big. As. As my head. Ugh. So unfair. No wonder Leon refused to touch me when I first visited him. Well. That was not entirely true, turning around and looking over my back, I tried to see the reflection of my butt in the water, he liked touching this part. Maybe because it was more round than my breasts, it does look more plump than those sorry bunch on the front, perhaps I should let him do it more, he did kiss me on the cheeks, yes, I should let him do more, especially now, what if another witch pops up? just as talented as Merlin, but indeed a girl, with big boobs and a wide hip, someone who is perfect for bearing children, I can also do that, yes, I have been bleeding since long ago, I can have kids, his kids, um mum, yes, I agreed to myself, shaking my bottom a little and watching it jiggle in the reflection, it was the perfect plan, if I am not good enough in magic, I can be useful in other things. Then he won't send me away, and I can stay with him forever. That would be the best. Dot. She did what? I asked, turning towards Oleg, who was standing at the entrance of the cave where at least fifty people were working with pickaxes. We were in the middle of creating the trenches that would make a new tunnel for the river to flow through straight into our stone pipes. Then, the aqueduct would sneak down from here directly towards the city. She burnt down a cabin. The fire was stopped in time, but it was completely demolished. I don't care about that. How's Sasha? She is fine, Oleg answered, gulping, and I knew there was more to it. Continue. Just tell me as it is. She said she was reading cookbooks, imagining how to make meals, making the movements with her hand. And? I urged him to continue as he stopped constantly, and I was too anxious to hear what happened. She said it just combusted. Then the fire spread and the cabin was ablaze at once. With her in it, my lord. But you said she is uninjured. I yelped, imagining her being burnt badly, disfigured. I wouldn't want that. She suffered enough while growing up. She deserved better. If nothing else, I will take care of her still. That is there. Weird thing, my lord. The fire didn't hurt her, she stood amongst the flames, unbothered, uninjured, it couldn't burn her, it consumed her clothes, but her skin remained untouched, she said she didn't even feel the heat, she just panicked that she destroyed one of your creations, oh, are you telling me, she is fireproof, or was it because it was her magic that conjured the flames, I, I don't really know, my lord, it was, frightening to watch, it burned so fiercely that it left only ash behind. Not even charcoal. The wood is. Gone. How interesting. Take me there. I want to see this. After arriving, the scene was. Magical. I mean it. The fire clearly burned in a circle, right around where the cabin was. Nobody dared to go close, afraid it would burst into flames once again. Worse. Sasha was huddled up, far away from the camp, sitting below a tree, hugging her legs face buried in her knees, she looked like a lost puppy, wait here, I told the rest, and when Oleg opened his mouth and tried to stop me, I looked back at him with eyes that told him I was not in the mood for nonsense, if you dare to tell me it is dangerous, just stop now, don't anger me, walking up to Sasha, I couldn't help but smile as I crouched down, gently patting her head, she flinched and looked up with her puffy, red eyes, I knew at once she was bawling them out just an hour ago. I didn't mean to. She sniffed, but I simply laughed, patting her head and pulling her into a hug. That was awesome, eh? She yelped, going stiff as she didn't expect something like this. I am sure of it. Oleg told me everything. Damn. I wish I could see it again. Again? But. 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 This means your magic reacted to your thoughts. I bet you focused on it really hard. I. I don't know. But Leon. I am dangerous. 
What if I burn you, or anybody else? And with that, she hurriedly pushed me away, don't be silly. I resisted and pulled her back into a hug again, I don't think you would want to burn me, so it won't happen, I trust you. But I trust you, got it? Why yes. She relaxed, hugging back, burying her head in my chest, I'm not angry, quite the opposite. This made me excited, and now am I have so many questions that need answers, but I don't know how it happened, we will figure it out. I already have ideas, but we need to check something first, eh? She yelped as I pulled her up, and when the covers fell, I realized that she was naked. Oh my. I looked her up and down, remaining unabashed and letting my gaze of its fill. You little exhibitionist. I like it, Anaxi. What? she murmured, going red in the face, but, she wasn't covering herself now, you, like it, really, duh, I do, I grinned, grabbing her waist with two hands, making her shake it, and she followed my lead obediently, sexy, come, I stopped her teasing because seeing her face, I was having trouble saying no to my sword that was unsheathing itself in my trousers, Cover yourself as we are out in the forest. I don't mind if you want to go commando around me, but let's do it when we have no more work to deal with. What is a commando? She asked again, dressing up in the blankets that were given to her, looking like some kind of ancient Greek philosopher as she followed me barefooted. Don't worry about it. I cleared my throat, looking at her. I can't molest you when we still have work to do. If you want that, come to my tent tonight, okay? She nodded, making me trip as I was just joking. Well, I wouldn't say no to it. She is a cutie and a kind girl. I would happily accept her if he accepted me. Ugh, focus Leon. He he. What? Your face went a bit red, Leon. She giggled. Finally in a good mood, as we arrived back at the scene of the fire. I was walking around it for minutes before ordering the others to bring a broom over so I could gently sweep the top of the ash away. I was careful not to touch the ground, and my first thought proved to be true. Do you see this, my dear Sasha? I asked with a wide grin. There are markings on the ground? She crouched down, looking at it curiously. Burnt into it. It is a magic circle. I nodded gently and continued cleaning the top, trying not to scratch or make it indiscernible. There was a magic circle here, one that we missed. Nope. I answered, seeing her mind work, but I continued, not waiting for her to catch up. This was left here by you, your mind and mana, to be exact. Do you know what this means? And not really. She answered honestly, lowering her head. Magic is part of nature. I whispered, licking my lips. This means that all magic circles are part of the law of nature. What you burnt into the ground, my dear Sasha is a fundamental law of nature. Now, help me carefully clean it as I want to draw it. What we have here is the world telling us one of its core laws concerning magic and mana. Ahahaha. <laughs> this. Is awesome. What I didn't see at that time was how Sasha was looking at me. As if I were. Those eyes would have made me kiss her, the look of relief and rising joy. Making her eyes glow, just made her even cuter. But, later on in life, I did have time to see her like that. Many times, in fact. 76. Chapter 17, A Steamy Night. It was at night, and I was holding a torch, coming down from the mountain, feeling extremely tired. We were making good progress, the stone pipes were all in place and being reinforced and I was using my cement solution to make doubly sure they were well sealed at the points we connected them. My day went with going up and down constantly, following the route we made, and ensuring everything was in order and up to my expected quality. The real test will be when we let the river flow into it and see where it starts leaking. Meanwhile, the people below were also surprisingly ahead of schedule, laying the foundation of my city. By now, everything was flat, the sewers and pipes were finished being connected to the first castellum. As per my instruction, they were laying down square stones at the moment and creating the streets to my exact specifications. I had to make it known multiple times that they followed my words to the letter, and the newest, talented trainees did not disappoint. I took a measure, and they nailed the width of the main street and the side streets connecting to it. 
the former could accompany four carriages side by side, while the latter was perfectly wide enough to let them go past each other. I did not bother their brains about the extra information, I just told them it would be so everyone could come and go without holding up the other. They did find it weird that everything was measured at a 90 degree angle, but they will get used to it. When I arrived back at camp, I could already see the base of my future home, the buildings taking shape in my mind's eyes. It already looked gorgeous. But, for now, the place I returned to was my personal tent. I felt battered and exhausted as I opened the flap, coming in, already in the process of undressing. I only stopped when I realized I was not alone, midway of pulling my pants down. Sasha? I asked, surprised, to see her here, wearing only a nightgown. I made bath water, she mumbled read from her toes up to her ear, but she was telling the truth. My tent had a big wooden basin, and hot water was steaming inside of it, calling me like a siren. Ha! I blinked my eyes rapidly, but I was not to refuse her and squander her efforts. With a confident move, I stripped naked, not covering anything on me, letting her stare, he he he. I won't say it was the first time she saw something like mine, but going by her eyes, it was the first one she liked Tilda thank you, I do appreciate it, I'm beaten, with an honest sigh, I sat into the tub, enjoying the water that was hot enough but not so that it would burn me, a moment later, I lay forward, letting Sasha kneel behind me with a sponge and something that counted as the most luxurious item of all, soap, of course, it was not the simple rough soap they were making here, made out of ashes from an oak tree, some tallow, lime, and whatever else, mixing and stirring to create it. I ensured ground up petals were added to it with some extra ingredients so it had a pleasant scent and wasn't so rough. In my time, this would be the choice of girls, smelling like a flower bed but damn it, I also liked it. Who wants to smell like the forest or the waves, or whatever other bullshit when you can smell really lovely instead? It was something that I mentioned in passing to mother once. And since then, my household has started producing it, albeit in very few numbers. Oh well, once my city is ready, we can mass produce it, and everyone can say bye bye to smelling like a wet hog. Wait, could I make a profit of it? The thought alone stiffened me and stopped Sasha from moving her hands, thinking she hurt me. Leon, this is nice. I moaned, not thinking about the idea further, as she scrubbed my back. Her fingers were ever so gentle that I could fall asleep amongst them. Tea thank you. She replied to me, clearly startled but also happy, continuing it with a bit more vigor. I like it when you are this caring. It is so relaxing. Why don't you come and get in, too? But, um, I, um, okay. I was surprised once again. I expected her to say no, but instead, I turned around and watched her undress while looking sideways. She tried not to glance at me while she climbed in, and in return, I had time to inspect everything about her. From up close this time. You are beautiful, you know that? No, she murmured, playing with her hair. I could see she was genuinely embarrassed this time. Back then, when she first came to my room and threw her clothes off, it was because she didn't look at it as something intimate. It was just a thing to get over with, but now, it was completely different. Come here. I smiled, holding her hand, and before she could protest, I pulled her into my lap, hugging her from behind, splashing water everywhere, but I didn't care. Kaya, she yelped, flustered, especially when her butt slid up against my sword. Sorry, can't help it. As I said, you look stunning. Will. Will you. Do. You know. That. She murmured, looking everywhere but at me letting out another yelp as I started rubbing her body all over before settling down on her perky, small breasts. Nope, nope. She stiffened, looking back at me over her shoulders while I kept grinning. Oh? Does this mean you want to do it? I never did it before. Well, I could have guessed it. And it seemed we were going in circles. It is something that is very important, Sasha. I continued talking, seeing how it was relaxing her body. Or. Was it the result of my unruly hands? Her nipples stood erect and at attention, listening to me just like her. It is not something to squander away, especially for a girl. I, I, I am glad you opened up, 
But if you are in a rush because you are afraid that you can only stay here if you catch me in your net. Then you will come to regret it. Look, I am more than happy to do it with you. I want to do it with you. But I'm not a guy who takes advantage of those I care about. I see that you are confused, I whispered, and she nodded honestly, making me chuckle as we sat in the wooden tub. Well, I'm going to help you relax a little, and maybe it will clear up your head. We will. Come back to this after you reorganize your thoughts. What do you Mia? She pressed her legs together with a loud moan, but it was too late. My right hand had already slipped between them, and my fingers were exploring a hidden valley looking for the little monument erected in it. It wasn't hard to find it and start caressing her in a way she knew nothing about. I enjoyed how she constantly wiggled in my embrace, moaning and grabbing onto my hands, her nails digging deep into my skin. She was beautiful and a bit wild, holding her right breast in my left hand, keeping her from escaping. I played with her body until she finally reached the peak of sensation. I felt something warm hitting my palm underwater, but I didn't mind. It was quite the opposite. It made me proud. I still got it. Watching her eyes go misty and her body falling limp, I just held her in my arms, letting her breathing return to normal, gently rocking her like a baby. When it did, I realized she had also fallen asleep yet still clung to me. I wasn't about to wake her up so I sat there, caressing her, and after I got out of the tub, I dried her and myself. Even through all that, she didn't wake up at all. I was still pent up, and had no outlet for it now, but, it was worth it. I wasn't in the mood to dress up, and neither did I put clothes on her. I simply carried her to my bed and snuggled up to her while pulling the sheets above us. This is the way to go to sleep, for sure. It didn't take long to doze off and relive everything in my dreams. He <laughs> he. In there. It was even more exciting as I didn't have to hold back at all. Should there be chapters like this later on? Yes. No. Total voters, 201. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Should there be chapters like this later on? 74. Chapter 18. First step complete. Waking up the next day was wonderful. Sasha was pretty silent and didn't know where to glance, but she didn't look angry. She even helped me dress up, so I guess all was fine tilde. After eating breakfast, I was at the back of the city, heading up the trail, checking the last connections of the piping before we began. I would lie if I said I wasn't nervous. Back up top, people had already carved a path into which the underground river could split. They were only waiting for my word to break away the last part. When it happened, I was rushing down, following the pipeline, watching for leaks, but miraculously, it worked like a charm. By the time I arrived at the bottom, Sasha was already waiting for me, excited, explaining how water was filling up the castellum. Great, let it be filled before opening the valves and letting it flow through the city. It was the first stress test. From here on, what would push the water forward was not gravity but simple pressure. I watched with my breath being held as it took some time, but the open ends of the smaller, thinner pipes finally burst out with water, signaling everything was working as intended. I watched as it flowed towards the finished sewers, disappearing from sight. Goodbye, shit-stained streets and the smell of pigsty. Ha! While I observed my success with a wide grin, others were also marveling at what we had just achieved. They finally realized this meant no more walking a kilometer to the river and back, digging wells, or taking a bath only once a week. They already knew that the pipes that were sticking out of the ground were where houses would be built. It meant everyone would have their own bath in their homes, which was still like a fairy tale for them. Great. I think the first step is complete, time to move on to the real work. The real work? Sasha asked thinking we were already doing that. Oh yes. I nodded, hugging her waists and pulling her close. Get to building homes. I will split up our people into three groups. The most talented ones we collected will work with me as I begin building my palace. The second group will assemble the surrounding infrastructure and housing. The third will continue the work on the roads and in the mines. I already laid out my plans. They just need to follow them and we can build up houses quickly. Maybe do it in a year? In a year? Sasha gawked, thinking it was impossible. 
Why not? The magic circle of hours that makes things weightless alone is a great tool. One man can lift up any log, block of stone, whatever, and place it where it needs to be. The hardest part of construction is out of the window like this. Oh, this reminds me, I had an idea about magic. She chuckled, and I nodded with a grin. Remember the circle you burnt into the ground before? I was studying it and comparing it with what we have at the mines. Some parts are an exact match. Which, in turn, told me a lot about how they work, so I made several new ones. I want to test them out. Should I bring Merlin here? She asked, a bit unsure and loosening her smile, which became less honest. No, I need his presence at the mines. We are still working, producing what we need. I told them to start expanding, and it turns out the iron vein we found runs deep. Anyway, he is still a kid, and I want you to work with me now. At least you can control your magic better. Um, anytime, she nodded like a chicken, I feared her head would suddenly fall off. Dot. Later that afternoon, further away from the constructions, I had my new inventions ready and set up. I call them inventions? But they were nothing more than three thick wooden logs and one blacksmith's tong. I was accompanied by Sasha, Oleg, and a few other soldiers who were here to protect me if anything goes wrong. Well, if it does, I don't think they could shield me from it. What do you expect to happen, young lord? Oleg asked, being apprehensive of it, feeling it had to be dangerous because we had come so far from the city. They are all different, and I don't know if my calculations are right or not. You see, making up magic formations is like working out an equation with too much unknown. I can think of some possible solutions going by nature's law, but I looked at them, for going to explain it further. What I am saying is that there is a high chance I messed it up and made bad alterations, so they will blow up, Sasha yelped, making me twitch my mouth. No, they will simply not work. Oh, she blushed, lowering her head and making me chuckle. Okay. There is no reason to delay the inevitable, so come Sasha, try to focus on the first log. I inscribed the formation on the back of it. Um, right. Stretching her hand out, she looked directly at the prepared specimen, and when the magic in her activated, we heard a loud, scary crunch. She quickly stopped while jumping back a meter. On the other hand, I was looking on with sparkling eyes. The thick log that should weigh multiple hundred kilograms broke apart as it collapsed in on itself. What happened? Oleg exclaimed while I waved my hand, silencing him. Success. That's what. I laughed loudly before explaining. I tried to reverse the anti-gravity properties. It doesn't work as smoothly, or else this wouldn't have happened. But you said it was a success. Sasha whispered, walking up to me, holding my shoulders, and looking out from behind my back, ready to pull me away if necessary. It was. The formation increased its weight so much that it broke apart. The problem is, the weight should have been spread out evenly. Instead, it was concentrated where I put it, so it needs tweaking. Young Lord, does this mean that the thing became heavier when activated? Much, much heavier. I nodded, happy to see that Oleg caught on quickly. What use does that have, Young Lord? Right now? I don't know. I'm just experimenting. But we could use it to drop a pebble on someone but raise its weight to that of a boulder or seal away something, and then a wooden door becomes as heavy as a mountain. We can find a use for it later. I just want to see if my modifications work as intended or not. Okay, Sasha. Now do the same with the next one. Um, the second log was a bit more fiery, literally. On it, I combined the one formation that Sasha left behind and parts of my very first invention that I showed her, in a snap. The wood has gone up in flames like it was dosed in kerosene, it burnt like the sun, and it wasn't put out even after Sasha stopped concentrating. What was strange was the fire didn't spread but remained attached to the log where the formation was placed. Pouring water over it also had no effect, it just turned it into vapor and kept burning on merrily. We had to wait until only the ash remained behind, which only took around half an hour. Fire that can't be put out. That is a potent weapon, Oleg exclaimed, rubbing his hands together, the soldier's eye. I looked at him with a smile. I had a different idea, if I can adjust its intensity and how long it can burn, 
it would be the perfect addition to the blacksmith's workshop, not to mention, I could use it to create kilns and smelt steel with less effort, and in a more eco-friendly way, huh? They looked at me, and I just waved their questioning gazes away. Next, please, I knew she wanted to ask what the eco-friendly meant, but she was also curious about the next experiment. Yet nothing happened. I, um, is it my fault? She looked at me after a minute of trying, but no result. Nah, I shrugged, patting her head, it is on me, this one, I fiddled with too much and probably messed up many things, I was hopeful, but I can't be lucky all the time, this one is a dud, okay, try the tongs, pick them up, and try to pick up the log with it while focusing and using it, eh, oh okay, I knew she wasn't getting it, not until she touched the tong, the moment her magic interacted with its handle and its embedded formation, she already realized what I wanted to do. This is genius, she yelped, and I just shook my head. You are sharp, so? Try it, we will see if it is truly genius or not. If it doesn't work, you must take the compliment back. Luckily for both of us, it worked. The moment she used the tongs to hold the log, the anti-gravity effect spread over, and she could lift it without issues. Now, just like the simple tools, the thing held with it also had zero weight. Whoa, young lord. This is magical. Oleg clapped, looking at Sasha, holding a huge and heavy object above her head with one hand like some kind of circus freak. It is magic. I winked at him, for now, it only works in a witch's hand, but I will tackle that problem later. But this would also have many uses, especially as we begin our second step. Finishing the city? Sasha asked, and I just nodded. Exactly, young lord. Is there a third step? Oleg asked curiously, and I couldn't help but grin. Of course, I can finally have a base then to start exploring magic for real. Do you think creating a city is my ultimate goal? Nah, it is just to have a headquarters to create even more wild stuff. Ahahaha, <laughs> you will see. I would say, I feel like playing a 4x game. But, none of you will get that. What are there? 4. X's? Sasha asked, putting the log down and deactivating the tongue before approaching me. Explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. I want to explore magic, expand it, exploit its features, and... Well, the last one is something I don't want to do so let's forget about it. 67. Chapter 19. Progress. 1. Working in the summer heat, people were already praising me, which, I will be honest, felt extremely good, I tried to remain nonchalant about it, but it was hard, the reason, simple, with the water system in place, the workers, when tired and thirsty, just had to go to some of the finished fountains and could fill their canteens with fresh, cold water, just like that, after the end of the day, they were ordered to take a bath, with soap, okay, it was a soap they had to share, but still, I wasn't ready to stink up my new city just yet, ha, huh? Everything was going smoothly, so much so I was worried that something would go very wrong very soon. That would be more like my luck. The last time I felt so confident in my life getting on track, I died. At the moment, I was working with the rest of the first team, building the palace where I would live. I walked amongst them, helping set up the wood and carve their shapes out perfectly, instructing them how to place them together. The foundations were already in place and as I had previously planned, I was copying many things from the forbidden city of my previous life. It was easy to create the base, made out of its stone walls and steps. The difficulty came only later, it was hard to teach them how to carve out the wood how I needed them. We wasted a few weeks until they started getting it right, but it did not matter as I expected it. What was really helpful was that all the materials were weightless with Sasha around and my formations working perfectly. We could juggle around multiple heavy and tall wooden beams and rock slabs as if they were simple feathers. I just can't get enough of magic, it seems. Young Lord Oleg walked up to me hurriedly, and I was surprised to see him back so soon. A month ago, I sent him and my parents' men to visit my mother's region to procure more tools and raw iron for us. It was best to do so discreetly, and I was surprised to see him come back so swiftly. Already back, everything went smoothly. I put down my used and old tools, ready to take inventory of my new ones. Yes, 
We hurried as fast as possible, and the men are bringing in everything as we speak. Great. We will first distribute the pickaxes and the rest to the mines to speed up their production. I want to have houses ready by the first snowfall and test out my designs. You really plan to spend the winter here? He asked, feeling unsure about my idea. It doesn't look much, but trust me. Plus, I have to spend a cold season here, I need to see how it is to modify my plans accordingly. It won't be easy, but it is crucial to do so. By then, the main room for me should be ready with a fireplace in it. I will survive. The problem is the flooring. I will have to lay down a nice parquet, but I also want some pleasant fur rugs. If we get beasts attacking us again, try to kill some and skin them carefully. We will keep an eye out, young lord. He saluted, taking it as a mission, also. There is something I think I need to report. What happened? I looked at him questioningly as his voice was strange. When coming back, we visited the mines and I don't know what the little Merlin kid is up to. He is weird. Explain. I furrowed my brows, placing my hands on my hips. The kid was weird. With a capital W. I still thought he was similar to me in a sense. But nothing happened whenever I tested him. He was gathering the people around him and teaching them. He was teaching them. That was not something I expected. Yes, reading, writing, and counting. He was even holding lessons about how to be a good citizen when getting the chance to move in here. I won't lie. It was a bit funny to see a small child standing on a stone slab, lecturing the adults. But then I forgot to look at him as a child. He was like any adult my lord. Teaching them to be a good citizen. I repeated whisperingly, and my surprise was clearly visible on my face. We didn't intervene because he was saying only good things about you, my lord, and warning everybody to behave and be thankful. He sounds like someone who will be a good negotiator. Or a teacher. Nice. You are not worried? Oleg asked, and I just smiled at him. Nope. Look, if the kid is smarter than me, has ambition and the skill. Sure, let him take over. Young lord, what are you saying? What? I laughed, I don't really care, if he can do it better. Do it. I will survive, I will find a way to thrive. We wouldn't let that happen, young lord. We would first die before abandoning your family. Oleg shouted, slapping his chest. Okay, okay, I wasn't that serious. I wouldn't just go away. I don't like to be pushed around, but I'm not a sore loser, either. If someone beats me, so be it. I'm not afraid of starting over nor of death. Please stop, young lord. This could place perilous ideas into some heads. You are right. I nodded, scratching my chin. You see, I will have to think about defending ourselves too. But, oh well. Too many things to deal with, too little time. How much raw iron did you manage to gather? Twenty ton, young lord. A whole yearly output of a small mine, he answered proudly. It did cost a lot for us, but we managed to do it. Good. You did not disappoint me, Oleg. Ha. I hope you will follow me when the city is ready. I need a general under me. It would be my honor, he replied with twinkling eyes, going to his knees immediately. We erected a temporary warehouse, go and place them there. In the winter, I plan to perfect the new magic circles and create a blacksmith's workshop. One that the world has never seen before. It sounds exciting, my lord. It does. With the new tools and with what I will be able to make, we can start up our own mine in earnest. Dig out that sweet or vein and fire up an industry. No more buying expensive shit from others. We will make our own tools and weapons. Dot. Phew. You are still just as good with your hands. I moaned as Sasha was sitting on my back. Massaging my shoulders. None of us wore anything right now. And most of the camp was already asleep. Thank you. She whispered, still a bit shy. But after what happened previously. She no longer complained when I did something. Isn't my hands rough? I have been helping with chiseling the wood, and it's... Nope. I cut in, enjoying her touch with closed eyes. It is perfect. Don't stop, please. At first, after a brief pause, she murmured. I couldn't see how the buildings would work. But now, it will be beautiful, Leon. I had never seen anything like it before and how it all comes together. It is nothing like the houses in the town. Nothing. Style over function tilde. Huh? 
What I mean is that sometimes, things have to look cool. Beauty is something to be looked at, and enjoy it. And with that, I surprised her by turning around. A moment later, I was lying on my back, and she sat on my stomach, looking a bit troubled but touching my chest. Yep, I was right Tilda. I'm not that beautiful. Then look behind you. When she did, I chuckled, seeing her body jump a little because of noticing the spear between my legs. See, I'm not lying. Should I? She asked with such a weak voice I almost missed it. I would be thrilled if you did. That night, it turned out to be it was my time to be fiddled with. Like how I did it to her previously. This time, she took advantage of the situation and played with my recorder. I couldn't help but get hypnotized by her swaying hips and glistening valley. So when she was least expecting it, I pulled her back and took a deep lick. Tasty Tilda, I mumbled with her on my face, drawing out surprised and panic moans, but I wasn't letting go. Luckily, she is a quick learner, when she realized I wouldn't stop. She copied me, and my personal popsicle landed in her mouth, she was immature with it. She even scraped it with her teeth multiple times. But damn, it felt good. The pure, raw passion behind her actions, the loud slurping noises, the wildness in her, wanting to please me just as much as I was doing it to her. It was the best blow job I have ever received. To top it off, she never let it go, not even when I warned her. She simply took it all in, drinking it without a fuss. When no more was coming out, she didn't let go, only continued cleaning it up from top to base before finally sitting up and looking back at me gasping for air? It is really bitter. I bet. I answered, just as out of breath as her. You are something else. With a chuckle, I grabbed and hugged her close while she snuggled up to me. Will we? She asked, letting me caress her body while she put her leg over me as if clamping down on me to not run away. Not here. Not in a tent. Wait until the winter, when we have our own room, and then we will do it there. It will be the perfect blessing for our new home tilde. Um. Okay. She smiled, looking way too cute with her innocent eyes. I am curious about something. What? She asked at once, already in a chatterbox-like mood. Do witches give birth to magical children, or not? Exclamation mark. She had gone mute at once, her whole body turning pink and burying her face in my chest, no longer wanting to talk to me. But somehow, her hold on me got even stronger, and I was sure. Something extremely sweet was tickling my nose for the rest of the night. 74. Chapter 20. Progress. 2. I don't know what happened. It was probably because I died, but it seemed that my luck got reversed or something because the wind too held back its survival right until the point the inner palace was finished. I won't say it is perfect or furnished. It wasn't pretty. But it was finished and livable. That is when the first snow arrived, and winter officially began. I am honestly worried. I kinda believe in karma, and if this many good things are happening to me, there is no way I won't have to pay it back. Is it the cold? Sashu asked, coming up to me while I stood on the balcony of my room, looking at the unfinished garden. It was not a real garden yet as nothing had been planted previously. But that didn't show because of the snow covering it. Why do you ask? I turned towards her while she put a thick coat on me and pulled her own tighter around her neck. Your face looked troubled. Ah. No, I was just thinking about. Stuff. You worry too much. Everything is going well. Yeah, that's it. I chuckled, walking back to the room and closing the door behind me. For now, it was still bare bones. We had a few rugs. A bed, and a big fireplace where, right now, orange flames were dancing nothing else and no real luxury to speak of, except for the fireplace. It had a magical formation put in the bottom of it, and with a bit of experimenting, I perfected it. Right now, no matter what we put in there, it came to life with a thought from Sasha and started burning at full power. What was even better is that it produced no smoke. I was so mesmerized by this magical fire that I even tried using snow and operating it as its new fuel source and it worked. I watched snow catch on fire and burn, warming up our room. If someone told me this a year ago, I would have slapped him across the face for taking me for an idiot. Sasha didn't find it weird, saying it is what magic does, but that was not an answer for me. So I started studying it and developing theories about what was happening. 
My final conclusion was that magical fire is different from normal fire in that no matter its source, it consumes it and transforms its pure essence into heat, right until nothing remains. And I mean nothing, as not only smoke was missing from it but the ashes too. When the fuel finally ran dry and the fire went out, the fireplace remained empty and clean. Will you install something like this in others' homes too? She asked while putting a tray above the fire and a pot onto it to start making tea. When I first started experimenting with the flames, it very quickly turned out that she was kind of immune to it. She could put her hand into the flames and feel nothing. Her clothes would catch on fire like any standard fabric. But her skin unharmed. Nope, they do have their own fireplace, I answered. But that's it. I can't have you and Merlin go around igniting magical fires all around the city, or you will do that until the end of times. Not everyone can get everything, you see. They are already grateful. She smiled, leaning against the undecorated, raw stone fireplace, watching me. Having a home, even if they have to share with others right now, is something we never dreamed of. Not when we were in the forest. Even the villagers here. Homes made out of stone with a fireplace? That was an extreme luxury and a sign of nobility. They think you are humble about building your home from wood and theirs from stone. Ha. Fine by me. I like well-made wooden houses. It feels cozy. I like cozy. If they think like that, I won't tell them my real reasons tilde. I won't go against a good image. It is important to lead them without issues. I am curious where you will lead us. What if I lead you to the bed now? HMPH Pervert. She giggled, but we were interrupted by the teapot's whistle as she began preparing it. As I watched, my mind started to wander again. And I got really curious, which she also noticed when she put the steaming mug in my hand. What did you think about now? I recognize when you have an idea brewing. I do want to test something. I whispered, sipping on the tea. I'm just unsure if I should wait with it or go ahead and test my theory out soon. It includes Merlin, and I don't want to traumatize the kid. Is it dangerous? She asked softly. A hint of worry in her voice. I can do it if it is. Kinda. But you will have to do something else. You see, I have been thinking about this. About magic. About how it seems it has multiple elements. When you concentrate it, you summon fire. And seemingly, you are impervious to any fire damage. Well, it does feel hot. The longer I keep my hand in it, the hotter it gets, and it gets painful. I think after 10 or so minutes, I would start showing damage. I can try if. Nope. I shook my head at once. You can test yourself, but don't go and injure or burn your body. You hear? I am fine knowing you can withstand flames for a certain period of time. That is enough. I don't trust our current medical knowledge to heal you. That is why many think you are someone extraordinary. So many people get sick in the winter, in the forest. I saw it many times. Getting a fever and dying. It was frequent. She whispered, her eyes growing distant as she remembered it. Um. But now it is different. Watching her, I saw her shaking away the thoughts and returning to the topic. So what do you want to do with Merlin? I want to see if he is resistant to fire or is it your, well, your unique element or not. Of course, I won't throw the kid into the fire. But I would want him to try and get close to it. If he can't bear it, we will know. For me, just standing close to the magical fire makes me sweat. The heat coming off it is way stronger than any regular one. I see. If he can't stand it. What will you do? I will have to look for what he specializes in. When yours surfaced, you left behind a formation. I want the same to happen with him. This is the only way I can study magic. I can't travel to the capital city and start asking questions now, can I? It is not feasible without me ending up on a cross or something. I heard they do that. I don't want that to happen to you. Wait. There are crucifixions in place? I asked as I just jokingly mentioned it, but seeing her nod, I had to accept it. Thinking a little, it shouldn't be that weird. Torture is universal. And of course, people will come up with it here, too. I heard that there are even worse things done to traitors. I bet. Well, that is why we are doing things. Here, where nobody really comes and looks because it is a backwater place with muscles for brains as leaders. You are not like that. She chuckled, 
hugging me while I hugged her back, rubbing her head. I was talking about my father. Especially in the winter, all the blood from his brain wandered down to his crotch, banging my mum day in and day out. Well, there was really nothing else to do when beasts weren't attacking. They. They did. It. All the time, she stiffened up but still remained hugging me. Yep, right next to my crib. Wait. You remember it? A uh, whoopsie. That. Slipped out. Don't tell anyone, okay? I do remember my baby years, but I never told this to anyone. Not even my parents. I won't, I won't. She replied with shining eyes. The fact that she learned a secret of mine seemed to completely excite her, and well. Her shining, innocent look excited me. Soon, my lips sealed hers, and I pushed her down on the bed a moment later. She didn't resist, even opening her legs, welcoming me. It didn't take long to throw off our clothes and continue immersing ourselves in a passionate, long exchange of saliva. When our lips parted, it was connected with their long, thin bridge that only broke apart when she sheepishly looked down where I was poking against her slippery slit. I, want it. You are not the only one, I answered, and after a bit of fidgeting, I pushed on. There was little resistance to finding my way in and her body was so excited the sheet under us was already soaked down to the bed frame. When I felt pushing against the soft resistance inside, I leaned ahead, kissing her and thrusting forward, going in deep with one move. Sasha loudly moaned when it happened, wrapping her legs around my waist as I lay on her naked figure. I don't know if it is because I am reborn in a new body or because she is a witch. But she was extremely hot, literally, I mean, can I? move I whispered, not wanting to hurt her, and she nodded almost immediately, it stings a little. But that's it, it isn't bad. It is. Very. Great. Ah, she stuttered, gasping for air every time my body moved and twitched, and I was the same, she was taking my breath away. I never felt anything similar before. Okay, I didn't have that much experience to boast about, but I wasn't a virgin, but Sasha here? She was like an angel. I had never felt something so soft, hot, and yet tight. I don't know how many times I could move my hips while continuing to kiss her neck and body before I shot my load into her womb. But I was trying my best to not be a quick shot. In the end, I wasn't thinking about pulling it out, not even for a minute. If she gets pregnant, I would be happy, and the way she was holding me and moaning in pleasure when feeling how her body got washed with my seed told me she was just as satisfied. None of us said anything and just lay there, still connected for the upcoming half an hour. You are still. Stiff. She chuckled, and it seemed something did awaken in her as I found myself lying on my back and she sitting atop me, slowly moving her hips, grinding against mine. What did you expect? You are too wonderful to calm down. Well. If that is true. We can do it through the winter. There is really nothing else. To do. She smiled seductively, and at that moment, I knew. I hit the jackpot with her. 79. Chapter 21. Problems. Winter. When most things stop, hibernate, and nothing really gets done. A time when I remember how my parents were trying to make a little brother or sister to me. Well, times have changed. Now, it was my turn to do it with Sasha, and we were getting pretty good at it. She even started initiating it when night came. This. I could get used to it. Sadly, not everything can go on forever so smoothly. The first problem came knocking in right in the middle of winter. We had a day when the cold was so severe that some of the exposed pipes cracked. The water froze solid in them expanded, and destroyed parts of the aqueduct, especially around the foot of the mountain. Those that were buried survived without any problems. The earth itself was a good insulator and would not let the water freeze. The problem was those that were above ground. Is it really bad? Sasha asked as I was returning at sunset, taking off multiple layers of clothes while patting the snow out of my hair. Manageable. I chuckled, letting her help me undress. We built it in segments so it is easy to replace parts of it. Luckily, not the whole line is busted, but it will set us back around a month or so. Hopefully, next winter, it won't come to this. You have an idea what to do to prevent it? We can use straw and hay to insulate them. But my best option is to keep the water flowing. Still, water freezes much more quickly. That is what happened now. 
We checked the castellums, and they are fine for now, it's not a big deal, so I wouldn't really worry about it. What I had to worry about came in the spring, the moment the snow started to melt and we began warming up. I set goals for my people and sent them to start working, we couldn't miss any day now. Not if I want this year to be the opening of my city. Yet, once again, only a week in, disaster struck. Back at the mines, while going at the Orvain per my orders, the wall broke through. We hit an underground cavern, and the worst thing was hidden behind it when it opened up. Water, freshly melted, ice cold water. It was the first time I lost people, four in total. The hypothermia got to them before we did. TSK. I felt horrible, not because the mine was destroyed and turned into a mine lake but because people died under my watch. Nobody blamed me. Although, I have a feeling they would dare to do it either way. I made sure their families were looked after, and while thinking about what to do now, I also had to look for a place where we could open a new mine. Ha. This was not good and it was making me tired even refusing Sasha's advances and opting to simply snuggle up to her instead when we went to sleep. I thought about why it hurt so much but couldn't find an answer. I was a soldier before, I saw death. Multiple times. I lost good friends, too, but now it made me lethargic. I didn't get it. Back then, in my world, it wasn't something newsworthy. People died in accidents daily. Hell, it would be celebrated if only four workers perished on a day and not twenty. Leon, I looked up from Sasha's chest in the morning, letting her play with my hair. Woke you up? Um, but it's okay. You didn't sleep well? Nah, I did. I just. My brain is working non-stop. It wasn't your fault. Maybe. Hard to tell. I shrugged, sitting up with a yawn and a stretch. You would be a good king. It is rare when someone thinks so deeply about his people. I never saw something like that. You never really had a chance. Did you not? My little wood elf. I chuckled, making her smack our pillow into my face, which made me laugh even more. What is an elf? She asked in the end, pouting. Oh, they are legendary creatures, beautiful beings who live in the forest, in tune with nature. Oh, well. You can call me that then, she added, with a much more happy voice. After breakfast, we were about to go and oversee rebuilding the broken parts of the aqueduct, Oleg was already waiting for me. Don't tell me someone died again, grunted. But he just shook his head. It's Merlin. He did something. Sound ominous. So, will you tell me, or should I start guessing? I grunted, not in the mood to play games. The water in the mines. It's gone gone sasha and i asked looking at each other now getting why he was acting so weird not finding the words to say i decided it was best to see it first so we hurried to the site where a great hubbub waited for us merlin was trembling afraid he did something nasty and when he saw me just like a kid he burst into tears saying he didn't mean it i'm not angry kiddo on the contrary, I am amazed. I sighed, rubbing his head, and I wasn't lying. I was barely able to keep my mouth shut, on the ground. Just like in Sasha's case, a magical circle was etched into the muddy earth, but this one was active. It was glowing in a blue hue, resonating with the ones the church had left behind. It acted like some kind of control formation or... Master key, I don't know how to describe it, but it increased the other's effects. The water that flooded the mine was rotating in midair, completely weightless, and the scene reminded me of video feeds from outer space. Looking down, the mine was dried up, and the water behind the hole in the wall was just as weightless, its natural surface tension halting it from flooding in. We copied it, my lord. The other guards came forward, presenting me with a paper and a drawing and I was surprised, to see it was exceptionally detailed. I made a nod, glancing at Oleg, who quickly knew what I meant and led these men away. As he was going to be my general, he needed people directly under him, and I just marked him some valuable guys to consider. Of course, I would still go over the formation, checking their drawing and redoing it for myself. But I was more than happy to see how their minds worked. Somehow, I was starting to feel much better. Did you learn anything from it? Sasha asked me two weeks later while I was sitting in our room, finishing a drawing of a replica of the formation that Merlin's mana had left behind. So far, 
I can be 99% sure that mana surges in an individual follow their desires and correlates to their mental concentration. Both yours and his happened in the same circumstances. The only difference was he was trying to think about something to help me and get the water out of the mine. Ultimately, I decided to put the water back in place. I turned off the formation by disrupting it and watched the extensive body of water drop back like a weird, magical waterfall. The mine was not something I could just reopen like that. Nobody would feel safe to go in and start working again. I had no choice but to look for an alternate place and start up a new one. I already had Oleg go out and scout for a suitable place. This hindered us a lot, but I could do nothing about it. Until he returned with a report of possible locations, I didn't have much to do. I was happy that our progress captured many interest in our small region, and almost 80% of people were now interested in working for me. Why? They got wind of those lucky ones who already had a stone home here with running water and their own fireplace for the winter. The problem lay in those who held some power under my family's rule. I had to do something about them before they went behind our backs and caused some major trouble. Leon, sorry. I shook my head. I feel troubling times coming. I told you, I was too lucky so far. It had to come back and bite my bottom sooner or later. That is karma for you. What about Merlin? She asked, not wanting me to think about the problems. Yes. So. From what I could gather, what he is good at is enhancing. The one that was left behind by him is extremely complex. So much so I only decoded around half of it. So he is smart. And talented. She murmured. But I just pated her head. From my current standpoint. He is someone who can boost already present magic formations. While yours seems to veer towards the element of fire. His specialty seems to be boosting magic that is already present. It would also explain why he always activates all the formations he gets close to. That sounds dangerous. It is. So there is something I need to get my hands on. I sighed, rubbing my head and playing with my hair. My first book of magic talked about something that all mages use. Magic crystals? Yep, it always made sure to hammer home. A mage has to have one. It helps focus and guide the mana in their bodies and bolster the strength of their spells. Now I am starting to think it is more than that, to me. It seems mana can be volatile. No, that is the wrong word. It is reactive. Your emotions are its fuel, and it can go out of control when you fall into deep concentration. My bet is on the crystal acting as something that helps you take control of your own powers and give your mana an outlet and not just let it explode around you. And where are we going to get that? Even I know that it's something guarded behind closed doors, hidden by the empire, by the church. They won't just lend you any of it. I know. My plan is to get some, under the table, through some other, not so legal way. Bandits? She asked, raising an eyebrow, thinking about it before nodding. Good idea. But I don't know if they would be crazy enough to attack a caravan belonging to either of the two parties. That is also one of my main fears. But. This is where my parents come into play. Let's go. I stood up, stretching, smiling at her. I told them I would be back after this winter and give them a report. Which was postponed because of the troubles. Oh. And I also need to inform them we are a bear, whore. It was funny watching her go pink in the face, but it warmed my heart. All the hurdles I was facing somehow looked insignificant at that moment. Hey, I never knew being in love could feel this good. 61. Chapter 22. Plans for the second phase. The meeting with my parents were surprisingly formal even for me. They welcomed me as if I were an envoy and acted formally. Which I was not used to. It threw me into a loop. To be honest, Sasha wasn't faring any better. She felt as if she wanted to melt into the ground and run away. My mother scanned her from top to bottom whenever they looked at her. It was nothing like our previous visits. Not at all. We read all your reports. My father started while we sat in the castle's conference room, facing each other over a wide mahogany table. Do you have anything to add? Um, I blinked. My eyes flusteredly, no, I haven't. I already told you everything. So you are going through with it? He pressed on further, crossing his muscular arms before his chest, looking at me with the eyes of a predator, ready to strike. 
What the hell was going on here? Did the Empire contact them? Or what? Yes, I answered in the end, starting to feel annoyed and getting aggressive myself. Even if you have problems with it, my ideas are right, and it would greatly benefit our land and people. It would. And it would concentrate the power in our family's hand. My mum interjected, turning her head from Sasha, finally looking at me. And? I asked back, now feeling defiant against their accusatory tone and looks. So what? From what I have seen, they are living in a pigsty. Our castle is not much better. The moment I said it, I thought I saw a dangerous flash go through my mother's eyes. But it was no time to start backing down. The local nobles won't like it. Father continued, and in turn, I couldn't help but chortle. So what? They have power because of us. They were appointed to lead some sectors, oversee food production, hunting, the security of the towns, and so on. Are they really nobles? I don't really see them that. They are the same as any other civilian under us. The only difference is that they pocketed benefits for themselves, skimming off the top that is coming from our rule anyway. Are they unhappy? Why should I care? They have power. Bullshit. I slammed at the desk. They don't. I have the power here because all the people who have been working with me in the past summers realize what I am doing. Especially now that the skeleton of my work is getting visible and they could experience the bare bone functions, keeping them warm through the winter, they still have influence over many and can raise an army. An army? I smirked at my mother, we have the army right here. Which is under my rule. Father boomed and they won't leave the walls. If these so-called nobles, I shouted back, recruit peasants to fight for them, I am confident in standing out and calling those people to my side. They won't have any army to speak of, they can hire mercenaries. Mother added nonchalantly, which I had no answers for. Yet, I am still confident in dealing with them. I will deal with them. It has been set into motion, and if you are starting to doubt me now, then I am sad to say it is too late. I will go through with it. These nobles can suck my dick, if they want. They can join me to start their own businesses. I won't stand in their way to make a fortune. But if they think they can stand in my way, then I will grind them into the ground and make them into the fertilizer for a better future. Ha! Mother exclaimed softly, forming a smile and elbowing my father, who was also trying to hold back a grin. He inherited the best things from you and me it seems, I told you, let's push him a little and place some pressure on him to see if he buckles or has the backbone of mine, bwahahaha, good kid, good kid, uh, was, was this some kind of test, I stammered, looking at Sasha, who was trying to look invisible, already sinking below the table, dragging her long hair into her face to not be part of the family feud, yes, yes, it was, my parents said simultaneously before my mother stood up, continuing, some of the local nobles are here longer time than our family, you see, they are complacent in holding their current powers and don't want to give them up, they won't give it up, whether our region is small or poor, they count as the top dogs here, you accompanied me multiple times, and you saw me handling them carefully, the reason is simple, they do have control over their little areas like how a cock struts around their little pen, and you won't help me deal with them, I whispered, and I wasn't accusing them, I get it, they just can't, if they do, the others would send for help, telling the empire we are rebelling, you are at the point where you have to start worrying about their reactions, they have started taking notice as more and more people slip out from under their fingers, going away to do some weird project of ours, some already came to us, demanding an explanation, they did, I asked, leaning back and watching my mother, who smiled and nodded, for now, I dealt with them, but this won't hold for long, <clears throat> okay, I expected something, but not so soon, I whispered, my brain going overdrive, nibbling on my thumb while doing so, had any plans for this stage, I hope you did, father spoke up after a minute of silence, interrupting my thoughts, yes, I did, I was just undecided, but now I got more information, out with it and be clear, mother ordered me, leaning forward, wanting to hear everything, first, I will draw away the people, that will not change, what about the food production, 
mother immediately stopped me, and her gaze was like knives, I won't bring everyone away, but things will change, I am planning on changing it up, our crops yield so little because we are on a highland, so we need to switch to those types that can withstand the worst soil, with that, I pointed at my report papers, which I had already detailed on multiple pages, I am no expert in the field, but this should do, then we can try terracing, but, that will need much work, I would try it more confidently if we had earth mages or something, but, oh well, I read that, my mother whispered, holding back her excitement, but I caught it in her eyes, that is not something we can accomplish right now, I am more interested in the part about the livestock and crop rotation, and then you already know if we focus on what I outlined, we need fewer people in the countryside with a more significant yield, if my industry gets to an operational level and I can churn out superior tools, their life will also get simpler, it is a win-win situation, plus, I continued, looking at my mother, maintaining eye contact, we can import food from your homeland, we already do it a lot, in fact, even if they are somewhat subordinate to us, they won't just give away food, I wouldn't ask for it free, I am planning to open up more frequent trade routes towards them, you already know what I want to sell Tilda, scented soap, exactly, I giggled, watching her lips curl upwards, I am not going to give them cheap, and I have other ideas to produce some luxury items that are cheap to make, but for now, yes, my main item would be that, aiming it at the wealthy, could work, but, I'm not finished, I added with a raised hand, I only answered what I want to do with the food side of the problem, I am going to address the nobles now, with a smack of my lip, I couldn't help but shake my head at what I was about to say, you gave me an idea, about mentioning mercenaries, okay, I will hire my own mercs, and how do you plan to do that, father raised his voice along with his eyebrows, I spoke poorly, I will hire bandits, what? not just my parents rose from their seats but Sasha, too, heard me right, I looked at them, deadly serious, I will hire bandits, thugs, scum, I will aim their weapons at our nobles who wouldn't back down and use them for the dirty work, we can clean them up in one fell swoop when they are finished, this silenced them quickly, and I let them think about it while sitting there calmly, when nobody wanted to say anything, I cleared my throat, continuing, I'm not naive, the world is not kind, and I am not a saint either, I want to create a place where I can enjoy life, and if others stand in my way, I will deal with them, in this scenario, we only lose those who, even if joining me, would try to cause trouble, I don't need partners who can't play nice, on the other hand, we get rid of scummy ones, our territory has very little in terms of bandits, even if there are some, they are equipped with sickles and pitchforks, father grunted first, nodding at me, giving me the green light to continue with my idea, nope, not yet, I shrugged, this only came to me now, I was thinking about how we could play it off, and even if someone reports it, we would only scold it for not keeping our borders clean, we would have no link backs to the connection to the bandits, trust me on that, I can point you the way, mother, I perked up, curious, but she shook her head, give me time as I need to exchange some letters first with my family, I will do it along with traveling back home and bringing some of the scented soap with me, it should take a month or two, but I'll be back by the summer, then we will speak about it again, I knew I could count on you, I grinned at my parents, who simply shook their heads, now, about another important news, she turned back to her serious mode, looking at Sasha, making her yelp and go stiff, are you pregnant or not, not, she replied like a soldier, I almost imagined her standing up and saluting, tsk, then work on it, she grumbled, making me twitch my mouth, I can see the change in you, my son already made you hers, right, then start giving me grandkids, I want four, no, make it six, whoa, whoa, mom, let's not put weights on her, okay, it happens when it happens, I waved my hands after seeing Sasha turn as red as fire, afraid she would accidentally summon a blazing inferno, yeah, father joined in, feeling just as troubled, glancing apologetically at Sasha, don't worry about it, I am sure it will happen, yes, we are doing it regularly, I blurted out, making it even worse, resulting in me quickly escaping to my old room, dragging Sasha behind me, 
still hearing mother yelling from afar, saying she would herself come in and instruct us in which pose makes it most efficient. Ha! Geez, I thought my father was a beast in bed. Turns out my mother is worse. 72, Chapter 23, Lothlia. While my mother was away, going on a trip, bringing away the first batch of soap, and doing some scouting for me, I was back on the construction site. We had a lot to do. First, I marked out the new area where we were ready to open up the new mine of ours. It was not easy, and everyone finally realized how much of a blessing the magic formations were in transporting the rocks away. This time, it fell to me to etch a similar formation down when the new mine. I could only do it when it became big enough to start producing stones for us that we needed to continue building the city. That is when a new surprise welcomed me in the form of Merlin. The youngster watched as I worked, and when I finished the first one, observing it activate and work flawlessly, he asked me to let him try. I didn't expect much, but oh boy, was I wrong. He not only put it down, but he perfectly matched my version. They were identical. I would have adopted him right there if not for the fact her parents were watching excitedly. This meant that I could leave them to continue establishing our new mine, letting Merlin put down the formations, and I could go work on the city. This was the best news possible. Before leaving, I promoted him. Well, his parents, to be exact, to oversee the mining group before I returned to the scene of my new city. By now, multiple houses were standing ready, and I was guiding them on how to build around the pipings. I was going around in the meanwhile installing primitive valve systems. We should have no issues, not after reinforcing and repairing the damages we had in the winter. We should have constantly flowing water, and because of the pressure, I didn't need any fancy doodads. Only a simple open and close gate at the end of the stone pipes in the homes. When someone opened it, the pressure did its job, and water was flowing into the tub. And there it was, a primitive but working bathroom. Same with the toilets. Turn a simple knob, open the seal, and let the water wash it down into the buried sewers, carrying it away. For now, the sewers led out of the city, pretty far away, but that was only a temporary solution. After mining is back to its fully operational level, my long-term plan was to make it go far into the river a few kilometers away. But that can wait. I should focus on where we are now. What was a pleasant surprise was how people got used to it almost instantly. I even caught some discussions between them, mentioning how weird it felt to go back to town and watch others throw the waste on the streets. Good. That is the thinking I want to take root in their minds. Better hygiene, longer lives. Is this really necessary? Sasha asked as I showed her my plans for a fountain in the square that I planned to be where all trading would happen. It would be not just a market square but a whole block. The houses here were different because I was making them out to be shops. They were not for living in, and I think the people here were also realizing it as they got finished. Yep, we need places like this where people could come, look at something, and say, yes, this is only possible here. I want them to be proud of their achievement. Also, wouldn't it be nice to walk around here with a fountain that is always on? The real problem is that we need people who can sculpt. I don't want it to be extra fancy but. It shouldn't be ugly either, that is why many in the mines have been chiseling some of the faulty blocks like there is no tomorrow. She chuckled, remembering how many of the workers, even after their shift ended, were trying to make some statues out of stone slabs that were chipped or broken off badly and deemed useless. They do that? Hey, good. I did announce that the one who gets the job to make the statues for the fountain gets his full name put on it. Oh, that is really generous. She blinked her beautiful eyes with surprise. I know that people would be happy to have a headstone after death. It was still a luxury here, but having their names placed on a work in the middle of the city, that was akin to becoming immortalized. I was about to answer her when Oleg came into the palace, gasping for air, clearly in a hurry. Lord, he bowed. A letter. Oh, I took it hastily as I recognized my mother's vax stamp on it. The two patiently waited for me to read it. And after I did it twice, I closed my eyes, thinking, Oleg, go prepare a squad of the best fighters far there assigned under me. Yes, with a salute. He asked no questions but rushed away, fulfilling my command. What's happened? Sasha asked, a bit afraid but also curious. Mother found a bandit group I could use. 
They call Yuri's Bane Wraiths, which I think is hilarious, eh? It sounds scary instead, Chiyuni, if you ask me. What? Nothing. I shrugged. Mother says it is a group led by a young but vicious woman, going by the name of Yuri Bida. What a weird name. Oh, it is an Easterner's name. A what now? I looked at her. One eyebrow raised to the top of my face. I read about them. She explained happily as, besides lovemaking, she was reading a lot through the winter. I had to move many more books over from the castle and start building a library wing ahead of time just for her. They have an empire in the east, and ours clashed with them multiple times. From what I read, we occupied half of their country before the current peace treaty. So, there are a lot of Easterners living under our rule, but, they rarely should appear here, they tend to stay in their old land and lead multiple rebellions against us. I bet none were successful yet. Figures. I murmured, thinking, already imagining a fair, Asian-looking girl. Huh, this should be interesting. Well, these brides, I mean, wraiths, are a criminal gang that came to power in my mother's birthplace, the region has been having a problem with them for a decade or so, and she writes here that they became even worse since a new leader of theirs appeared. She is this year I Bida who renamed the whole gang after herself, what will you do? Sashu asked me, holding onto my hand, and I could feel she was extremely nervous, set up a meeting with them then try to recruit them. If I can manage to convince them to serve me for my goals, it would be great. So far, from what I heard from father, none of the nobles are interested in any change. Good for me. I can sick my new hounds on them without remorse. You are already talking as if you convinced these evil people to serve you. Confidence, my dear Sasha. I grinned, holding her waist and giving her a deep kiss. I conquered you, no, bully. Ha 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 Tilda. Maybe I am one. Anyway, while I'm gone. What? I am going to. She shouted, looking at me with enlarged eyes. Are you a fighter? I asked, flicking her nose. Listen, I am going because it is my idea. I have the cards. My plans are in my brain, and nobody else could do it besides me. I will go with soldiers who are trained against beasts, which are much more unpredictable than humans but I won't bring you. End of the story. Sasha, you are not a warrior nor a fighter. You are smart and my wife, even if there was no ceremony yet, it is my duty to make sure you come to no harm's way. So you will stay and coordinate the construction in my place. Your strength lies in your head. You understand what I want from this city, so keep helping me build it, okay? But, but, spells, magic, she sniffed, her eyes going wet in an instant. You can't even cast a fireball yet, no? Come here. I chuckled, hugging her close and stroking her head, and I could tell she was afraid to be abandoned once again, reverting to that of a little girl. I will be careful and back before fall. Promise. Promise. She whispered, not letting me go. Pinky promise Tilda. I grinned, showing it her how to do it finally drawing back a smile onto her face. Riding a horse was still a bit uncomfortable, but I was getting used to it. Armed and ready, we were heading to the borders and would soon be crossing over to the home of my mother's family, Lothlia. It was my first time coming this far, and I was excited to see how it fares to my home. And it did surprise me, a lot. First of all, it was like crossing a strange barrier, the mountains were gone quickly, and the hilly, bumpy lands soon turned flat, just as flat as Sasha was when I first saw her. Next, the forests were replaced with a sea of gold as wheat was swaying in the wind, dancing like some kind of otherworldly ballerina. The villages we were coming across were all small, housing the families working the fields and a minor noble who was responsible for collecting the tithe and delivering it. There was nothing outstanding, only the identical wooden houses that made up our towns. When we arrived at their capital city, it was finally time to see something that was more aligned with what a fantasy-esque medieval city should look like in my mind. Of course, that doesn't mean that all buildings were made of rock or bricks, but there were significantly more than in ours. Surprised? My mother chuckled, welcoming me at the gates and leading Oleg and me in while the rest of the soldiers I arrived with were housed in a different part of the city. A bit, is it more, advanced? It's hard to pinpoint what I feel. Yet I know this place is ruled by a baron while our family is a viscount. Our territory is focused on battling the beasts, 
so all efforts in building it up were concentrated on our castle, this place is not so single-minded, so. Of course, it had more time and resources to grow bigger and be a better city, also. The population in this region is double that we have. Huh, I see. So. Am I going to meet with my grandparents then? I asked, grinning, changing the topic. No, mother sighed, shaking her head, they long passed away, you are going to meet with my eldest brother, the current Baron of Lothlia. I warn you in advance to not let him push down on you, he is a bastard through and through. Even though we outrank him, and they are decreed by the emperors of the past to serve us in our efforts of defending the passage, it also made him cranky. Huh? I grunted and I also realized why my mother never mentioned my grandparents or her side of the family, so it wasn't all nice and lovely. Figures. Noble families and their intricacies. I already hate it. Why? Because he always dreamt about being a knight in shining armor but never achieved it. He wasn't even accepted into the imperial army, let me guess. It is our fault, somehow, what I am saying is to not show weakness, or he will try to exploit it. Also, he does not know why I am here for real. He thinks I only brought the soaps and want to sell them, introducing you is just the excuse to let you explore the city and make contact with the gang. Though, I will be careful. I shrugged, but then she just patted my shoulder, smiling and whispering into my ears. I'm not afraid of that. I wanted to say I would not be angry if you lit a little fire under his butt. You see, I have a younger brother, too, and I would happily see him sit where my idiotic eldest brother resting his useless bottom right now. Ah, I couldn't help but stop and look at my smiling mother. As I said, noble politics. I hate them. 69. Chapter 24, Pig, the city of Lothlia. What a contrast to ours. I mean, to the one we have currently, not the one my people are building. There were more stone buildings here, especially in the city center, behind the secondary wall. No wonder, as the nobility made their homes here, they weren't keen on living in shabby, wooden homes like the rest of the populace, but, with a capital B, the smell of shit still permeated around most of the town, most people were still throwing their waste onto the streets, and I didn't see proper sewers anywhere, ha. Huh. It looked bigger, it looked nicer, but it was still smelling just as bad. Shame. I was focusing on the buildings, roads, and people here while we walked, mainly to not let my honest thoughts show on my face. Yes, we all walked as I asked my mother to do so instead of taking the carriage. It was good to see that, in the outer city, most houses, even if they were cleaner and more colorful than those I saw back home, were still primitive. The only difference was that they kept it renovated and somewhat decorated. After passing the inner gates and finally entering the nobles' quarters, this couldn't be said to be true anymore. This part of the city was leagues above ours. Clean roads, clean houses. And I even saw servants being out, making sure that the horse shit that some carriages left behind were shoveled onto a cart and carried out of there. Money speaks as they say. And the nobles could afford to live in a cleaner place it will sell. My mother smiled, finally speaking, interrupting my thoughts and scrutiny of the homes of wealthy people. I thought the Baron would have bought it all for himself, I answered with a small smile, and she returned it with a soft giggle. He did, but news travels fast, he simply wants to resell it himself at a higher price, he may be someone I think is a bastard, but he is a shrewd one, he knows how to make money, you do, too, no? I whispered, looking around, and my mum didn't disappoint with her answer. Of course, even more so. So, I sold the batch to him at a higher price than I originally wanted. Then, I met with a few old friends and families, giving them a sample from my own cash. I already wrote up and signed six contracts with six families who placed an order for a batch at a reduced price, without him knowing. I added, looking at her with twinkling eyes, and she just shrugged. Why should I tell something to him when he is just a baron and I am a viscount? Touche to. What? Sorry. It. It is a magic word. Exclaiming victory over another. It has a nice ring to it. It was a good idea to let you study magic. How's Sasha? Is she pregnant yet? Uh. No, not yet, mom. I answered, feeling immediately troubled as her eyes were strict, questioning, and almost angry making me feel as if a spanking was in order, 
you should get a second wife, someone who is not a whim but she stopped, looking around, quickly changing her words, who is not special, we must know, know what, I asked, grunting, hating that we have to go over this again, that it is not happening because she is, she, or because of you, I feel like I am perfectly fine and functioning right, I countered, but I could understand her reasoning, son, you are our only child, and I couldn't get pregnant again, believe me, we are trying to this day, I am afraid you inherited your mother's curse, ha, huh? how do you know it is not father who is faulty, I groaned, rubbing my temple in frustration, he is not, she shrugged, sounding defeated, he had two bastard daughters before you, they are currently young maids back home, I made him test his weapon out, sadly, he was so potent that the girl gave birth to twins, they were taking care of you while you were little, and we were attending to our duties, you see, of course, you wouldn't remember that, I remembered that, but never noticed, holy hell, mother, you are something else, tsk, but now you also made me worry, what if, ugh, I don't need this information right now, not that it depresses me, but, it could cause problems later on, without an heir, it could be, dangerous in the future, damn it, okay, calm down, Leon, just put this on the pile of deal with it later and move on, fuck, the meeting with my uncle was worse than I expected, first, I was made to wait, so much so that my mother got more agitated than me and dragged me to the side room, ordering the maids to serve dinner, I decided to go with the flow and let her deal with everything, if the others see me as just a youngster who has nothing to him, not even his own backbone, all the better, I don't want to be troubled either by relatives or by the empire, at least, not until I feel ready to stand up to any of them, so, I sat in silence, waiting for food, and avoided any eye contact, even with the servants, I wasn't stupid, I knew some may have been tasked to relay any and all happenings to this douche, so I sat there, squirming here and there, being nervous, I think mom picked up on it quick as she never addressed my strange behavior, even playing on it a little, telling me to relax already, when he finally appeared, he did so after a maid loudly announcing the arrival of the baron of the fertile fields, Benedict, or something like that, in my head, I was thinking about him, going around the wheat fields, shitting on the ground, fertilizing them by himself, all alone, maybe that is why the city smelled just as bad, huh, what stopped me from laughing was the procedure I had to perform, bow, introduction, whatever else, even though I was the future Viscount, that title was yet to be bestowed upon me, so, he was above me but also not, it's a weird situation if you ask me, but I can deal with it, his attitude and the way he carried himself, that was much harder to not comment about, he very quickly waved a hand at me to stop and get back to my chair but continued to ignore me and sat down with a wheeze, I now fully knew why he was not recruited, he barely fit through the double sided door, I couldn't tell where his neck was as he looked like a snowman who half melted then got refrozen, or something, he was sweating grease and smelled like someone who hadn't bathed for a year, leaving giant patches on his expensive clothes by the simple fact he had to come down from his room, I tried looking for similarities between him and my mother but found nothing, as his face was distorted by the fat rolls attached to it, I color couldn't tell, hair, long and either black or brown, but that brown could be grease and not its natural color, what in the actual fuck was going on, I know people could let themselves go, one of my old friends in my old life did the same, the poor fellow got his legs blown off and went off the rails, but even then, he was aware of his situation and never was, rude, this thing that calls himself my uncle, he was berating the servants left and right the moment they were late with the food, worse, he was constantly cursing at the cook, saying he didn't use enough salt or the food wasn't cooked well enough, yet he was stuffing his face continuously, I hate when people talk while eating and chewing, and I felt sick to my stomach just listening to his slurping and belching, I wanted to throw up, when I was at my limit and looked at mum, she was not there, no joke, I could not see a light in her eyes, I never saw her like this, but I get it, she was tuning her brother out, already forgetting to be angry and to berate him, instead, she was like an automaton, sometimes saying yes, or agree, or something else, 
just so she didn't have to interact with him while he was eating. Fucking A plus, mom. I need to learn that skill. In the end, I had to tell him about my life a little, so I made up some stuff, how I like the simplicity and how I am training to later take after my father, the usual stuff, the moment I brought it up, he began explaining to me his genius plans and tactics. For the next. Four. Hours. I think by the second one, poor Sun Tzu would have asked for a cyanide pill just to escape. When I was finally let go, thanks to my mother dragging me away, I felt like I was tortured for days. Bastard. Both of us exclaimed the same thing after getting to our room. Don't mention that outside of this room. She warned me with a smile, ha. Huh. I totally forgot what I wanted to discuss with him. Damn it. Anyway, I will deal with it tomorrow while you go into the city. Here, take this. I raised an eyebrow, taking the small letter from her and reading it through before I tore it apart and threw it into the fire that was burning inside our fireplace. Is the information accurate? It is. Son, be careful. Even if you bring the soldiers along, this city is their home turf. They have an advantage here. We do suspect that some city guards are on their payroll. Don't worry, mother. I'll be careful, and I am going there to make a deal not to fight. If it goes south, don't worry about consequences. Safety first, the rest I will deal with. If something big happens out of it, try to make it even bigger. Huh? I flinched, looking at my smiling mother, who now looked like a fox, ready to pounce. He is still a baron who is below us. And I could use it as an excuse to start pressuring him so much. Even he starts feeling it under that blanket of fat he wears. 62. Chapter 25. Duel. The next day, early morning, it was time to head down to the marked location. Of course, I wouldn't go alone, that would be stupid and reckless, so the people I brought along all of them were accompanying me. Being a noble had its advantages, as now I had a sword on my side, and nobody could question me why. And, after entering the district where their base was, I was pretty sure they would be used. It was in the northwestern part of the city, and it reeked more than the other side. It wasn't horse shit that troubled me, it was more of the stench of cheap pale and unwashed bodies that passed by us. It was like walking into a changing room of rugby players after finishing the most brutal match of their lives. TSK, wherever I looked, the wooden houses were old and faded, and some were in complete shambles, propped up by sheer luck and will of their occupants. I knew there were city guards, but probably they rarely ventured into this part of the city, or if they did. They only came when there was a reason for it. I was sure of my conjecture after we walked pretty far, and the watchful eyes doubled, then tripled. Every big city has its streets where the dregs of society gather and where laws become suggestions. Nobody bothers with places like that as people need it. It is like the sewers, where those who can't fit in get flushed down by the rest of society. As long as they are policing themselves and the shit doesn't overflow to the streets, they won't bother with it. Well, I was determined to never let such a slum develop in my city. Lord Oleg leaned closer, speaking in a low tone, if trouble comes knocking, stay with us. We will escort you out as soon as possible. Thank you for your concern. But if all goes well, we won't need to kill anyone or too many. Don't forget that my father also taught me, and I was good at it still. Lord, you never really fought before. This is not like training. Well, I know. I shrugged in answer. Yes. And no. In this life, I did not take anybody's. Not yet. Also, he was right in that my father did teach me a lot, but I was not that versed in his techniques. What I was confident in was my previous military training. Even being a techie, basic training didn't skimp out on any soldier. I had to go through the same stuff that a grunt or a marine had to, at least in the first year. We were all taught close combat techniques, be it unarmed or knife fighting. Well, I had a sure sword, so it could be applied to it, but we will see. If it comes to that, I can fall back on my knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat and use it here. From what I have seen so far, here, it is less developed than in my time. What my father taught me resembled the basics of budding martial arts, but it was still not there. It was born from his experience, and although it's a good technique, it wasn't stream aligned. Well, it is up to him to refine it, I can't and won't get in his way in that. I will use what I am familiar with, and I am confident that the people here won't be able to cope with it. 
simply because it does not exist yet, about taking a life. I don't think I would have an issue with that, it wouldn't be the first one, and when I was deployed on the front, I saw people becoming a mist of gore. I know how it sounds when you stab someone in the back and hear the air escape from their lungs. Keep alert. Oleg hissed, his hand gripping the hilt of his sword, and it was his voice that brought me back to reality. The street was empty, and the houses on both sides were all boarded up. We also reached the very end of the district as the high, grey city walls were casting a shadow on us. When my feet stopped, so did my soldiers, and I listened closely. Even though we were standing still, footsteps were still echoing between the houses, and looking back, the entry was closed off by five figures. All women. Ha! Huh, I hummed, looking at their leather and fur armor, swords, and shields while two of them had crossbows in their hands. In the front, six others appeared in similar dressings, except one. She was a woman with a striking body and posture, with porcelain-like white skin, in contrast with her nasty, reddish scars visible on her almost naked torso. She wore a metal plate over one breast that was intact while the other was missing entirely, replaced with a nasty scar, just one of many that filled her body. I was thinking about what was she wearing under her tight, leather pants, a dick or a pussy, probably both. Looking at her grinning face, it was also scarred, with one of her ears having a chunk bitten out of it. I knew that because her black hair was shabby, looking like a bird's nest, revealing it. What was more striking was the twin daggers she was playing with, dark red from the unwashed blood sticking to their edges. Lost? She asked, remaining where she stood, showing she was not that reckless and probably wary of any throwable weapons we may have had on us. Oh no, no. I smiled standing firmly in my place while my soldiers were ready to fight, separating into two groups, one looking at the girls behind our back and one at the same party I was talking with. I was looking for you, Monsieur Ibida. And why would be that, Mr. Nobleman? She asked back, but she couldn't mask the surprise in her voice. Was it because I knew her full name? Maybe, maybe not. Because I have a business proposition. Simple. Are we looking like people who she started laughing mockingly? But I cut in with a smile. I need killers and robbers. Easy. What? Is it not what you do? Maybe you are freedom fighters? Lost in the lands of your hated enemy? Should I call you terrorists instead? No, no. Your Ibida raised a hand, scoffing at me. I don't care about that. So you are going in the wrong direction, boy. I was just surprised that a noble like you would say something without coating his words with honey looking shit. Ah, I see. Well. I hate drawing things out, so here is the deal. Let's sit down and talk without resorting to any bloodshed. Mm, too bad that I love bloodshed. And I don't trust nobles. Ha, I see. So, I shrugged. My grip tightening on the hilt of my sword. But I like your style, kid. Here is what we should do. You and me, one on one. No rules, just go at it. And if you survive, we'll talk. Lord. Oleg cried out. But I silenced him with a hand and walked forward. Come, just don't regret it later. At least your balls have dropped. Good. With a quick burst of speed, she had already rushed at me, wielding her two daggers and aiming to stab me in the groin as her first attack. I expected her to be wild, looking at her injuries, but she was as dirty as this place. When my sword met with the edge of her blade, it twisted and turned while using momentum, she changed aim to stab at my neck with her offhand weapon. When we separated, there was a slight cut on my neck, only enough to let out a thin trail of blood, not dangerous enough to be threatening. Young Tilda, she grinned, licking her blade while looking at me. I will cut off your cock and eat it for dinner. That is no way to speak to your master, I countered, looking into her dark eyes and seeing sadistic flames dancing inside. She was not right in the head. I am my own master, she roared, attacking again while I mostly dodged using foot techniques from my old life to keep a distance between us and let her exhaust her explosive energies. You will be my mad hound, and you will do what I say. And you will enjoy it. I continued, sidestepping, feeling her daggers pass by my chest. I will enjoy making new underwear out of your skin, bitch boy. She cried again, turning on her heels, kicking back like a horse, going for my groin again. Okay that warrants a punishment, one that will remind you who I am. I grunted, 
foregoing my sword, which surprised her and the spectators. And who are you? She giggled even when I caught her ankle. I had the perfect chance to break her leg. But I needed her able for what I was planning to do. Leon, your owner. I spat at her while bringing her leg up, and without any hesitation, I punched her in the pussy. Straight on, without holding back. Who said they are not as sensitive as boys? Because she sure dropped her knives as pain coursed through her body. Of course, I was not done. Bringing her to the ground, I hurriedly brought her into a chokehold, turning her face redder than her scars. Yet she wasn't giving in. Instead of fighting back against my arms, she stretched out with her bare feet, trying to reach the dagger. So, I continued choking her, whispering into her real like an abusive lover, here is the thing. I need a group to rob and kill other nobles I have problems with. I can't do it myself for obvious reasons, but I can let a capable group of rabid dogs do it. And even keep half of the riches. Sounds fair, doesn't it? ghmgh.fhf.gh I couldn't tell what she was saying, but she sure spat all over my arms as I pulled her further from the dropped daggers, watching her face turn purple. But she was still struggling. What surprised me was that her people didn't attack. Was this some kind of honor thing? Weird. Stop struggling if you are in. If not, I will break your neck and find someone else to do my work. She just wouldn't stop it. By now, she was gurgling, and her eyes rolled up. Yet she still tried to bite me. In the end, I choked her unconscious. When I stood over her limp body, the others were finally drawing their weapons while I stepped on their leader's neck. She is not dead yet. If you lower your weapons, she will survive. As I need her for a job, I shouted, looking at them unperturbed, ready to fight to the death in this shabby, empty street. Keep aiming those crossbows at us, and I will kill her. Then kill all of you, too. Choose quickly. I am out of patience. 73. Chapter 26, Leon's Laws. Inside one of the ramshackle homes, I felt like I was back on the front lines. As if we had just occupied a village and were squatting in a destroyed home, the only thing that was missing was the dead bodies. But I did have an unconscious woman lying on the floor with me, and, to be honest, it could soon have dead bodies in it, too. Most of our men were outside, staring down the other group while in the house, Oleg was sitting next to me. Looking at their, probably, second in command of the unconscious barbarian, she was examining Uri Bida, and after making sure she was indeed alive, she said nothing, just looking at me with those dark eyes under her black bangs. All of the girls were Easterners, and it showed in their looks. I won't lie, I liked what I was seeing, but, their eyes were like savages. Twisted. Dark. Huck. It was then when Uri Bida was waking up. Her moan replaced with a coughing fit, and when she finally managed to sit up and breathe, she looked at me with the eyes of a madman, madwoman, nah, with the beasts, little bitch, she spat, her voice hoarse, rubbing her bruised neck, afraid to off me, eh, I need you and your hounds, I said, looking ahead, staring into her eyes, and I am told your group is perfect for my goals, I am somebody who has a purpose, and I want to achieve it in the most optimal way, but if you continue proving difficult to deal with, like you would have the balls to kill me, you spineless fuck, she giggled, and I had enough, with a nod of my head, Oleg acted without hesitating, he was faster than his bulky presence would suggest, surprising both women, and me, his sword flashed and came out of its scabbard without a noise, then went through the woman's chest standing behind Uri Bida. It was a perfectly delivered execution, impaling her heart, and with his hand on her mouth, she couldn't even scream while life left her body. Her blood spilled onto the head of Uri Bida. But she didn't flinch. We kept looking into each other's eyes, ignoring the killing happening right next to us. Oleg gently laid down the dead woman his sword now pointing directly at your eyebider, letting blood flow from its edges onto the tip of her head. If she made a noise, he would kill her without hesitation. Then, my people outside would finally engage the rest of her people, and we would massacre them. It was at that point when I realized father's soldiers were eating beast meat. Beasts that could breathe fire. I was sure it was what made them this big yet this fast. I will have to gather evidence of it. My conjecture was now almost certain, they were no longer ordinary humans, 
Listen, I opened my mouth, speaking calmly, as I said, I want your expertise. I am not afraid of killing you, I just don't want to go through the same hoops and loops to find someone perfect for my goals. Got it through your thick skull. Or should I skull fuck you so your brain connects the dots? That sounds like a wicked death. She grinned, wiping a bit of blood off her face and tasting it. Speak, I am listening. Finally, I sighed with an annoyed, tired voice. Here is the deal. You come with your group, move to my border territory, and you will have to raid some nobles' little provinces. You can start with their trading routes that I will mark for you and keep half of the stuff you got your little bloody paws on. But the main course would be killing those nobles I send word about. Ha! Huh. And why should I do it? She laughed, licking her lips. But I saw it in her eyes. She was intrigued by the idea. You will earn a lot, and I will get what I want. Win-win. And when the Empire notices it, you will kill us all. How nice. She smirked, catching on quickly. You can survive. The others? I smiled back, lowering my voice. Heads will have to be presented to the envoys. Yes. No deal. Unless. Go on. I urged her listening while Oleg kept his blade pointing at the now agitated woman who stood before me on all fours, wiggling her bottom like an actual dog. I want the power of one of the off nobles. Make me replace him. If you do that, deal. I will wag my bitch ass for you, and we will fuck up every last one of them. I will make a necklace out of their balls and pillows from their dits. I don't need either of that. I grimaced but then fell into deep thinking, which was interrupted by Oleg. You can't consider it, my lord. A rabid beast can't be trusted. Strength is everything. Your eye by the countered. Still looking at me. I want a noble's power. I know which hand to bite and which hand to lick. Give me what I want, and I will lick your hand, your cock, whatever you put before me. I wouldn't trust you with that. I would be afraid of you biting it off. I snorted, hearing her remarks. Yeah, I may do that. But isn't it more exciting that way? Let's do it my way, I murmured, thinking about it, I will see how your group operates. Keep within limits and only hit the targets I select for you. Only them. Be a good bloodhound, and you may get your own doghouse. Deal? Woof Tilda. She grinned, and I felt she was someone I could barely read. When we left, I was in deep thought and ignored Oleg, who was trying to persuade me to not do this. That it was way too risky. But... It was my quickest option to deal with the nobles who were sure to oppose us. She got you? Was my mother's first question, noticing the thin line on my neck. If she did, I wouldn't be here. No, it is nothing. Your father would have gone after your soul and spank you if you lost to a mere bandit. She added in a strict voice, but I knew she was simply worried. Hey, worry not, mom. I can defend myself. Anyway, that woman is crazy. Probably her gang, too, they are not right in the head. And you will use them? She questioned me, and I knew this type of tone. She used it when she was testing others. There are things that can't be done honorably and must be dealt with under the table. Every empire needs forces that can be deployed and tasked with missions that will be forever forgotten, never to see the day of light. Empire, you have big ambitions. She chuckled before pulling me into an embrace and rubbing my head. You are definitely my son, ah ha ha. Uh, really? What about? Your father wouldn't dare look that far. Not by himself. Eh, okay. I chuckled, shaking my head, and was surprised by the letter she pressed into my hand. You were too busy with building the city and now with this, so you probably didn't follow what was happening back home. We enacted some new rules, and it slowly drew out the nobles who gave us pushback. Out of the eight noble families in our region, six did it. Dewuam. I grunted, looking at the multiple pages detailing their names and their assets. That many, vying for power is as such. They want to be the new Viscount after we are replaced. That is what they are thinking about. Tough luck. Okay. The moment my newest rabid strike force is ready, I will sack them onto one of these idiots. I hummed, putting the letter away for further study. This meeting also made me think about laying down a new governing system and laws. I will write it up while I am here and give it to you to look over it. I am still an amateur, so I need some extra input tilde. I wouldn't call you that. She smiled gently, caressing my face. I am curious what you will come up with next. Well. She didn't need to wait for long. As I just couldn't sleep, 
my head filled with thoughts, and I wrote up my laws, presenting them to her in the morning. 1. The law of two. There are only two ranks, the sovereign, the ruling family, and the citizens, the people living under the sovereign. The latter is not forbidden from gaining wealth and power on their own merits, but in the empire, no nobles exist besides the sovereign. 2. The law of loyalty. Loyalty to the ruling hegemony is the highest virtue. 3. The law of skill. All positions of power and influence should be filled with skilled members and masters of their crafts. 4. The law of ambition. Citizens are encouraged to be ambitious and to constantly strive to improve their own and their fellow citizens' lives. 5. The law of prosperity for all. The sovereign shall oversee and promote an economy that generates wealth and opportunities for all of its citizens. 6. The law of progressive taxation. A fair and progressive tax system shall be implemented to fund public services and welfare programs while ensuring that the wealthiest contribute proportionately more to support the less fortunate. 7. The law of workers' rights. Comprehensive labor laws will be enacted to protect workers' rights, including minimum wage standards and safe working conditions. 8. The law of accessible health care. Universal health care shall be provided to all citizens. 9. The law of education equality. A high quality and equitable education system will be established, offering free education from kindergarten to high school level, empowering citizens with knowledge and skills. Higher education will be provided for free for those who show exceptional skills and talents. 10. The law of philanthropy. Encouraging individuals and guilds to engage in philanthropic efforts, contributing to social welfare and community development. 11. The law of fair competition, businesses will compete in a fair and regulated marketplace, with anti-monopoly laws and consumer protections to prevent exploitation. 12. The law of innovation and entrepreneurship, encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation by providing resources and support to individuals and businesses striving to create economic opportunities. 13. The law of empowerment, encouraging citizens to participate in their communities fostering a sense of ownership, and providing opportunities for civic engagement. 14. Centralized military authority. The sovereign has direct control over the military. Soldiers receive their pay and benefits from the sovereign and will remain in the sovereign's service even after leaving the armed forces, be it due to age or injuries. 15. Military loyalty. The military is expected to pledge loyalty to the sovereign and uphold the sovereign's authority. 16. National security. The sovereign can use the military to protect the nation's security and interests, ensuring stability and safety. 17. Defense and deterrence. The military's primary role should be the defense of the domain and deterrence against external threats. 18. Humanitarian military interventions. The sovereign may also employ the military for humanitarian purposes, such as disaster relief or peacekeeping missions. 19. Professionalism and training. A well-trained and professional military is essential to ensure that it serves the nation's interests. Any soldier must go through basic training and evaluation before joining the military. 20. National Defense Council, a body of advisors, military leaders, and experts who help ensure military decisions are made with absolute certitude. 21. The Law of Magical Registry. All individuals with magical abilities must register with the Royal Magical Authority, providing information about their powers and capabilities. 22. The Law of Magical Education. All witches and wizards must receive formal magical education and training under the supervision of the Sovereign's Magical Academies. 23. The Law of Magical Military Service. Witches and wizards are considered a vital part of the kingdom's military forces and are subject to conscription when the ruler deems it necessary for the nation's defense. 24. The law of magical research, magical research and experimentation are considered top priority for any capable witches and wizards. 25. The law of magical oath, all witches and wizards must swear an oath of loyalty and obedience directly to the sovereign, pledging to use their magical abilities in the service of the empire. 26. The Law of Magical Council. 
a council of magical advisors, including representatives from different magical schools and disciplines, assists the sovereign in making informed decisions about magical matters. 27. The law of magical equal rights, non-magical citizens are protected from magical abuse or discrimination, and any use of magic to harm or exploit them is strictly prohibited. This is also true in reverse, no magical individual can be the target of discrimination. 28. The law of magical citizenship, witches and wizards are granted a unique status as magical citizens, allowing them certain privileges and responsibilities within the kingdom. 29. The law of magical rehabilitation, individuals who misuse their magical abilities may be subject to rehabilitation and re-education to ensure their loyalty to the sovereign and the empire's well-being. 30. The law of magical inheritance. Inheritance laws may govern the transfer of knowledge and artifacts, ensuring that they remain under the control of responsible individuals. Is. Is this all? She looked at me, blinking her eyes rapidly. Nah. This is just the first thirty. I am still writing the other parts and expanding on them. This is just. The rough sketch. I answered with a huge yawn, rubbing my eyes and trying to wipe away the giant bags under them. You do know that there are words in here that I do not recognize. You should start writing your own encyclopedia for your made-up stuff. She laughed, hitting my head with the papers playfully. Your brain outshone your mother's this time. Ha. Good. Good. It is best if you are more like me. I will chew through this again and get back to you with some modifications. Things you mentioned here will only be possible if you build a striving empire. Son, I'll be honest with you here, I don't see you succeeding with half of this. Not to mention the crazier parts with educating the masses and paying them for their work. From where? We can barely keep our soldiers fit and ready. It will happen. I smiled confidently, it won't work from the start, of course not, but give it time. It will work, and when people get a taste of it, they will be the most loyal servants, never wanting to leave my little corner of the world, the only place where they will have these benefits. 65. Chapter 27, Elliot. While my mother was still doing some rounds with the nobles, making deals behind my uncle's back, I was left there to entertain him which meant I was sitting there, listening to him endlessly about his ideas and how he could change warfare forever. But they just don't get his genius ideas. Like, dressing someone up in complete plate armor, leaving only his eyes visible, making him impervious to all damages. I was not even attempting to try and reason that the poor bastard would be unable to move at all. I was groaning heavily, feeling my head would burst at any given moment, escaping my uncle's clutches at the last minute. Damn it. Yuri should hurry the fuck up because I am on the verge of lobotomizing my uncle or myself. Would my mother be angry about it? Probably not. But I would surely get into trouble. I told Oleg and the rest to keep a close eye on the district and not let anyone leave it without questioning them. I also briefed them that I allowed every method they knew to use while interrogating and deciding on what to do. Either they would bow to me, or I would send them in and eradicate this gang of crazy bitches. While I was hurrying back to my room, I turned a corner in the castle, just so to run into someone, knocking our heads together and falling onto the ground. Ugh. Sorry. I groaned and said the exact words that my unfortunate partner parroted at the same time. Looking at him, I saw he had a girly face, very similar to my mother's. The only difference was that he had short, dark brown hair with his green eyes. Simply by guessing, I would say he had to be between 16 and 17. And if not for the male clothes, he could have fooled me. No, no, it was my fault, he repeated, standing up as we looked at each other. Let's say we were both at fault. I smiled, patting myself down. My name is Leon. You are? Elliot. He bowed a little, so you are my sister's son? Ah. That is why you look like my mum, huh? Thank you. He smiled serenely, taking it as a compliment. Shit, he needs longer hair, and that smile would be like a charming young lady's. I am a man, he exclaimed, speaking out of nowhere, making me flinch and shudder. Was my gaze that oblivious? Yes, I. I just couldn't find anything else to say. I am a man. I am used to the looks you just gave me. Ha. And no, I am not into boys, and no, I am not young, I am already twenty-six. 
that is still not old, I mumbled, now feeling awkward, but, he was more approachable than my uncle, that is for sure, thank you again, Leon Tilda, it is good to meet you, he stretched out his hand, and I grabbed it quickly, that was when we both heard my other uncle waddling towards us from the corridor I had just come from, shit, the warthog is out of the pig's tie, come, without a question, he pulled me along, and after a few hurried steps, I ended up in the castle's library, here we should be good, he rarely comes here anyway, thanks, I think I heard enough of the abysmal battle scenarios that he plays out in his head, he only wins them because he thinks for the enemy, too, I moaned, still tasting the greasy, sweaty aura that he was surrounded with, I think I hurled a little then and there, ah ha ha, true, true, Elliot laughed with me, patting my back, and led me to one of the tables, I was about to go back to my room to nap a little, but oh well, that can wait, wine, thanks, I nodded, seeing that there were still snacks and wine lying around with multiple open books, studying, you could say that, he nodded, giving me a cup, you see, even though my elder brother is the one who has the last say in things, he is only interested in those that fill up his personal coffers, I am left with dealing with the mundane part, how mundane, I questioned, honestly curious about his part in the family, all the rest, the boring, economic part, I heard you visited the gang of those crazy ones, why, I stopped him, looked into my cup, and then glanced back at him, this guy was, dangerous, was he not just like my mum in appearance, but in mine too, it's fine, Elliot grinned, taking it from me, sipping up a little bit of wine before giving it back as he licked his lips, making me shiver, ahahaha, <laughs> sorry Tilda, just so you know, I am also not into men, I already have a girl, good, good, you should, he nodded agreeingly, I, too, have three maids I sleep with, pfft, what, not to your liking, he asked with a half grin lingering on his face, and now I knew he was playing with me, damn you, you baby faced bastard, shit, I think I like this guy, it's much better uncle material than the pig, okay, okay, you got me, was our meeting a coincidence at all, I grunted, wiping my nose from wine, that it was, although I was going to look for you sooner or later, it is about your plans, plans, I stiffened, did my mother leak it, no, no way, it is my deduction so far, but I guess you will use them to be your hidden weapons against a rival noble, yes, you could say that, I murmured, looking at him without blinking, slowly sipping my wine, what if I, help you out, mother did mention she had a younger brother she would like more to sit where her older brother does right now, was her hand in this, or was this some kind of dirty play between nobles I read about so much, he didn't press on after his question, letting me think, whenever I looked into his eyes, he never looked away and just smiled amicably at me, was this a trap, my instincts told me it wasn't, and I trusted my gut, then, this uncle of mine was someone with ambition and someone who was ready to jump into the fray to grab power for himself, but how far would he be willing to go, why, I asked a simple yet complex question, and now it was my time to wait, I watched him refill his cup, tasting the wine before leaning back in his chair and answering me, because I tolerated them here for the same reason, I was using them to slowly gain more and more power over the city guards, you see, I am planning a, mmm, let's say, a hostile takeover over my eldest brother, he is unreliable, unfit, literally mind you, and worst of all, going completely senile, if he remains leading my home, he will drive it into ruins, I was totally floored by what I was hearing, for one, he was speaking so candidly and openly that I was at a loss for words, then, there were the phrases he was using, what the, hell, surprised, he asked with a slight chuckle, yeah, a bit, so, I spat into your soup, kinda, but I can adapt, I already did and came up with a new idea, care to listen, please, I'm all ears, it was better to have an ally who is competent, than one who is a pig, so let's see what he has to offer, here is the deal, whatever you are planning will sooner or later drag the empire's eyes onto our little corner, now, 
We don't want that to happen without providing any solution right after. Any sign of destability here would make them dispatch the military and replace us with new puppets. The thing is, they don't really care who sits here. As long as their back is protected and we pay our tithe every year, they have time for that. Or the manpower? I asked, genuinely curious about their resources. Of course, anyway. What I am saying is that we will work together. I already had much evidence planted within those animals to lead back to my good old brother. What makes you think he would take the fall? He would have no say in it. Elliot continued. The evidence I would provide to the Empire's agents would be enough. If you are backing me with it, then it would be done even more quickly. They would take him away, make me the new Baron, and everyone would live happily ever after. Are you a fox in a man's skin? I asked but he just laughed at it, not answering. What if they decide you or we are too much of a hassle and decide to kill us all? The Empire is pragmatic. Putting me into power is much easier than raising a completely new family. Yes, that could happen, but the chances are slim, but not zero. Risk is with us in every facet of life. I could have run into you while you held a knife, and bam, you just stabbed me to death. What a specific example. I shrugged, shaking my head while Elliot continued smiling, looking at me. It was how the 17th Empress was murdered, and her cousin took over the Empire. So, it is not as far-fetched as you would think. Huh, I see. You are ambitious, huh? Not overly so. With a yawn, he stretched, looking so relaxed that I couldn't help but yawn myself. I know my boundaries. I just want this region, and it will benefit you too. We work well together, and I really love my sister. We could trade more openly and profitably, and I have some friends in other regions. I could open up more trade routes than my brother. Case in point, the pig is looked at warily and hated by many because he is too shrewd of a businessman. Always squeezing out as much profit as possible. I am much more mellow. Much more easy to work with. Well, you are selling yourself expertly. You can think about. No. I shook my head standing up and patting myself down, I am already determined to go through with my plans, and if you are lending me a helping hand, I will take it. I am doing something essential, and any aid is appreciated. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Aha ah ha ha. Good to hear it. He jumped up, stretching his hand out, which I grabbed as we shook on it. If you want, you can scratch my back in the bathhouse. Er. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Joke. It was a joke, he added with a wide grin. But, I somehow was not sure of it. Or, oh, shit. This guy is insanely good at confusing someone. I will go and speak with Louise and tell her everything. Then, we can sit down and work out the details. Mm, sounds good. I am still waiting on the bandit's answer anyway. It is better than listening to the pig one more time. How we should tie four crossbows together to make a repeater. Yeah. And you didn't even hear about his idea of giving wings to knights who would jump down from the walls, gliding above the battlefield and throwing javelins. 54. Chapter 28. Hellfire. Leaving the room of Elliot was. Weird. I mean, I felt weird. The guy was. Weird. Shit. My family is weird, as I think about it. Uag. Whatever. If my mother says he would be a better ruler, I will trust her on it. His ideas did sound nice. If he really has connections to people and I could import critical resources through him, that would be perfect. Plus, if I invent, I mean, let's be honest, if I steal and implement some ideas from my previous life, I could sell them through him, make him the inventor of it publicly. I was beginning to like the idea more and more. Lord, it was Oleg who waited for me in my room, saluting at once, presenting me a letter. He was wise to say nothing as there could be spies here. I read a lot about ancient castles having secret passages and hiding holes between walls. Although that pig couldn't fit into them, that is for sure. Good job. I nodded as the letter was a clear report that the crazies had agreed to my terms and listed everything they wanted, including a base from where they can operate and ambush their targets. And have it as soon as possible. Here. What I gave him was a prepared order that he opened and read through twice before. Eating it, I looked at him strangely, and then I couldn't help but nod towards the fireplace, making him smile sheepishly. My instructions were clear. He was to remain here with the rest as a connection and oversee their preparations. 
only return by escorting them over and keeping an eye on the group at all times. I will return home and repurpose the old logging site where Sasha lived previously. I am going to lay down some magic formations hidden from them, and if they ever rebel, a firestorm will welcome them one night, burning them to a crisp. It was a relief when we began heading home with my mother. I finally didn't have to listen to my uncle and could relax my mind. I heard everything went smoothly. You could say that. We will see later. I met with. I don't need to know about it. But, mom. It is best if you do it your way. Don't make me worry with the gory details. Oh okay. I nodded with a small smile, rubbing the ridge of my nose. Don't worry, it will go without a hitch. On the way back. She didn't ask about it anymore, and I took it as her confidence in my abilities. On the other hand, the one who asked a ton of questions was none other than Sasha, jumping on me the moment I appeared. I am also happy to see you again. I grinned after a kiss and held her by her bottom, and I could tell she was excited as she didn't reprimand me even when others were watching. I will tell you about it slowly at dinner. Instead, it's your turn. Tell me how things are. Did I miss something big? Yes. Please say it isn't some accident. It isn't. She giggled, holding my arm happily. We finished the school building, and you won't guess who is teaching the people how to read and write. Merlin, how did you know? She yelled, surprised as she wanted to surprise me with the strange news. Sixth sense. The kid is weird, and he was also teaching people back at the mines. I am not surprised he got a knack for it. My surprise is more because the people listen to him. Well. He is funny as he can only reach there. Um. What its name? Blackboard. Yes, that. So he can only reach it while standing on boxes, but you know. I get why no adult is complaining about it or mocking him. I'm all ears because it is still a mystery to me. How would you feel if a small kid who is yet to get hairy can read and write better than you? Uh. Okay, point taken. I answered by twitching my mouth, but then again, I was in an excellent mood, seeing how well my city was coming along. Magic speeded up things way more than modern technology. With my new inventions, blocks that should weigh as much as a modern day car were lifted up like they were nothing and put in place effortlessly. It was like building a city from Lego sets. It meant I didn't need to focus on it any longer, and people could take care of it by themselves. Good. What is it? Sasha asked, noticing my smile and snuggling up to me. I am just happy. Seeing how all is coming together, I can focus on different things. You will come with me tomorrow as I am going to try to set up my very first smithy. You mentioned it before, so I was taking some liberties. She said proudly, her eyes sparkling. We finished the building. You did. Now, I was really shocked. She did it all by herself. Perfect. I couldn't help but hold her close and kiss her deeply. You are full of surprises. I am loving you more and more. Poor Leon. She moaned, turning bashful but wiggling her butt happily. You spoke about it multiple times, and you had some drawings, so. I talked with Merlin, and he had some ideas, too. After that, I made sure everything was compatible with your sketches, and we built it. So, I didn't do anything out of order, yes? No, you didn't. I was hoping for this, my people making their own decisions. Perfect, more than perfect. Let's go, show me. Not far from the palace, in a street where multiple, for now empty houses stood, I arrived at a completed blacksmith's workshop. Of course, it wasn't furnished. Only the building was ready, along with the kilns and the forge. Everything else needed to be put in place. There were still many things I had to get and install before I could call it prepared to start operating. But that didn't matter. Good job, Sasha. This is perfect. It is still bare bones. She murmured yet beaming with happiness. It's enough. Most of the completed houses, along with our palace, are pretty empty. But not for long. I got ourselves some dogs to send out and hunt. So when they start doing their job, we will start building up our treasury. And we will buy resources and furniture from what they get their hands on? She asked me, trying to put it together. And she was correct. Mostly. Partially? Yes. The gold will go towards that. But I am guessing we will have many items I do not need, like jewelry. It isn't very helpful to me right now. 
So those gold and silver knickknacks are going to be melted down right here, along with the scrap metals. I will have to create molds to reforge the tools we need. But that shouldn't be hard. The furniture part will be easy, you see. The fountain competition also helped show me who are those who have a good hand. I will recruit them to start making wood furniture pieces and help them set up their first businesses. But now, let's focus on this forge. I will have to make it ready for a formation. I already put a formation of fire in the main forge. I hope it works, she added after hearing that. And I immediately looked over. More than that, I climbed into it. Hi, uh, Leon, what if it turns on? She held onto my leg that was sticking out and pulled at it with all her might. I would worry about that if Merlin was here. But with you, nah, I'm safe. I laughed while checking it and crawling back out after a few minutes. Nice. Superb work. Let's test it. I grinned, throwing my boots into it as fuel. When Sasha circulated her mana, it immediately came to life and the fire burning inside was more intense than I anticipated. Whoa. I was forced to take multiple steps back, shielding my face from the heat. Turn it off. Quickly. I shouted as I still felt the heat rise, and only she was unbothered by it. Why yes. It took her more effort to halt its workings than to start the fire. But after a few seconds, she managed to cancel it out. Luckily, by now, Sasha's control over fire and her mana was way better. D did I do it wrong? What? Happened? She asked nervously, looking at me, seeing if I had any injury. I have a theory. I muttered, watching the glowing insides of the forge, the formation still flashing with a bright red color. You remember what I taught you, yes? About how the mages use a conduit for their spells? Yes. Would it be able to control the heat? Here are my current thoughts. Mind you, I could be wrong. The formations I put down are relatively weak when activated because I am magicless. I copy the laws of nature but do not have any genuine effect on them. They work at their minimum capability. A fire formation put down by you. Just look at how hot it was burning. I think it would easily melt tungsten. It was like fires straight out of hell. Awesome. What is that? Tungsten. I mean, not important now. A type of metal. But this is a small problem we will have to deal with. No human could work in here if the forge is on with this kind of fire. Haw. So I did mess up. No. No. You didn't. This just shows that we are missing a crucial ingredient. This showed me that if I was the one to place down the formation, it would not be strong enough for what I needed it for. Yours is way better, but it is untamed. We need something that helps you focus your powers. I bet if we have those focusing crystals or whatever they are called, you could lay down formations that you could easily manipulate. So, in short, I will have to get my hands on some. Where could we find any? We can't just walk up to the Empire or the Church to ask for it. No, we can't. But I know a group of crazies who can steal some for us. Aha ha. Come, I will need you to lay down some similar formations, all hidden from untrained eyes. But if they will make this kind of fire, it is exactly the kind of fire I want. I do not trust them, so they will become mush if they rebel. Sasha, my dear. This uncontrollable hellfire is what I need against the dangers of this world. I grinned, hugging her close and sharing a kiss that she returned with much more passion than I anticipated. 59. Chapter 29, Hounds. The old campsite where Sasha and the rest lived got cleaned up, but not overly so, as I didn't want to waste too much time with them. With a few hastily built cabins, I deemed it good enough, especially because their floorboards were all decorated by Sasha, drawing up a fire formation on their underside. If they ever rebel or reinforce their little camp, it would mean nothing. You are inviting. No, you are hugging danger. You know that? She asked me, sounding worried. I am completely aware of it. But do you know why I'm not worried? Because you are stupid? She countered quickly, pouting. Maybe, but mostly because even if they go rogue, I am not really afraid of them. My father and the army that defends the opening within the mountains are way more potent than their little bandit group. If all comes to worse, we will wipe them out and ask the Empire for resources to rebuild our forces so it won't affect our job in defending the region. I don't know how the Empire works. I just hope you are right. Me neither. I shrugged with a grin, but I know how powers like this operate. 
Throughout history, many empires like this had different people delegated to lead the regions while their main forces concentrated on expanding their territories or pleasing their emperor's immediate needs. They didn't bother with anything else as long as a region remained stable and worked efficiently. Of course, later on, this led to the rise of strong warlords and sovereigns who no longer obeyed their emperor as they became stronger than them. I trailed off with a smile, not really explaining further. I don't know if this place had anything happen that was similar, but if not, then, soon, they will have a precedent of it. I hope you are right. Let's focus on our immediate plans, okay? I chuckled, looking at the future camp for the bandits. Their move was more peaceful than I anticipated. When Oleg's message arrived a week later, I went for a visit, bringing Sasha along. I was surprised that their camp was filled with about 50 bandit warriors, all women, while they brought around another 50 males. Were those enslaved people? It was hard to tell, but they were acting weird and subservient to the women present, groveling before them from what I could see. What's this? I asked while Uri Bida walked forward, grinning at me savagely. Jealous pretty boy. HMPH. Sasha snorted, momentarily drawing Yuri's eyes onto herself before I interrupted the bandit leader's thoughts. Nope, I'm just not going to feed your pets. Don't worry, we feed them well, and we will rob enough food for us. Bwahaha. So, when do we start? Tomorrow, I answered firmly and gave her a letter. Read it, memorize it, then burn it. What if I don't? She smirked, and without me having to say anything, Sasha flared up in a way that I never saw before. But it was hot, literally. Then I will burn your people. Her breath was searing the air, surprising Yuri, and I was a bit afraid that the formations may combust right now and right there. Wait a minute, Yuri whispered, furrowing her brows, looking into Sasha's eyes, who maintained eye contact, not wanting to back down. I was looking at them with great interest because how Sasha acted confirmed my suspicion. It seemed that the nature of their elements influenced the wizards and witches more than I first assumed. While Sasha could quickly get angry, changing her mood just as fire changes direction depending on the wind, she could also be mellow and warm, beautiful like a fireplace on a cold winter night. You are a witch, Yuri exclaimed, making Oleg and the other soldiers draw their blades, ready to jump on them and protect us. So, I laughed, raising a hand to stop them. Is that a problem? No, she murmured, biting her lips, drilling her eyes into Sasha's, who withstood it with such pride that I wanted to make her mine right there. I am more than a witch, she sneered at Yuri, grabbing my hand and pulling me close, and I could feel her body's heat that made me think she had a dangerously high fever. I am his wife. Now all things are clear, Yuri whispered, turning towards me, I want to change our deal. Fuck you. That was my immediate and straightforward answer. One she should understand. You can fuck me if you want. She nodded, or I fuck you if you are into it. We do have some things that can be put on. Pretty boy. I will, burn. You, Sasha said through gritted teeth, holding my hand even more firmly. Whatever, Yuri waved her hand, ignoring her and watching me solely. You are planning a fucking rebellion. Now I am 100% sure, you are not just power hungry, you will stick it to the empire. Are oh, you want me to? Fuck if I care about the conquered lands. Don't bring that up. She interrupted me immediately. I asked you to make me into a noble because I want power. Fuck that. Make me your bitch, eh? It was not just me who said that. Sasha and even Oleg joined in our little exclamation of surprise. Being a noble is nice, but if you are planning to create your own empire, I want to be on the top. Make me into your concubine, then. I can ride you like no other girl. Fuck. If you want, you can stick it into me anytime, anywhere. I don't care if others are watching. Fuck me in the public square. Who cares? But I want in on the big ones. Sit on those massive balls, she said heaving heavily, wanting to grab me by the crotch, but I drew my sword, holding it against her neck. This is fine too. You can be rough with me. My Prince Tilda. You are out of your mind. I whispered, what about your followers? Every queen can have their own little guarding force, no? As if, Sasha shouted at her, but Uri Bizarda didn't even flinch and just kept looking at me. Think, baby, I will be your rabid little bitch, and I will go and kill anyone you want. No questions asked. In turn, 
you make me into one of yours, and I can enjoy a life of utter luxury and power. Sweet deal if you ask me, you are not running ahead of yourself, Yuri. I whispered but slowly drew back my blade, you are flying. I won't promise it. Not when I am not even ready for a breakaway. I am willing to risk it. She grinned even wilder when I acknowledged her guess. You brought us here because you need a dirty little whore for your dirty little plays. Every emperor has a hand that is covered in shit. She heaved as she grabbed my arm and started licking and sucking on my fingers. Shocking Sasha. I could tell that she was fuming like a chimney but held her tongue. Unlike Yuri, I don't mind. I will lick it off. Listen closely. I shrugged. Grabbing her tongue and pulling on it. Keep to the original deal and plans. If everything works out fine. We will sit down and talk about the future. I won't promise anything now. I am not someone who builds on a foundation held up by empty pledges. Prove yourself that I need you so bad that I risk putting anything of mine into your holes. Capis, I knew she didn't know what that last word meant. But she still nodded, moaning before I let go of her tongue. Perfectly. With a moan, she read the orders I gave her and then tore it up and ate it before blowing a kiss towards me and hurrying back to her people. She's like you, I mumbled, seeing her eating it, but Oleg was not getting my reference. No way I would tolerate her in our home. Sasha cried out after we were leaving, pulling on my clothes, that is a complete maniac, you can't trust her. Her head needs to be on a pike and not between your lap. Whoa, whoa, I laughed, trying to calm Sasha down, easy there, my love. I haven't promised anything to her yet, we don't even know if she survives it. On one part. That crazy bitch does make sense. I will need a group that could be used for black ops, I mean, murky, nasty operations. We are loyal, my lord. We can also. Oleg started, but I shot him down. I don't want to use you for things that would trouble your consciousness. You are a good man. You are my first general, my lord. Enough. I dislike heavy topics, so don't bother with it. For now, I will take it as if everything is going on as planned and I will deal with the crazies when all is settled and we are seeing the results. What I didn't mention to them was that an old saying popped up in my head while leaving. Never put it in crazy, but, ah, uh, oh well, I will let fate play itself out and stop worrying. Only two days later, it was Oleg who came up to me with hurried steps while I was directing my people to install the first fountain with the winner's work. It was something genuinely artistic. A collection of statues that made me question whether he was indeed an amateur. Where the primary pipes were, stone trees were being erected, three in total. The water would push through at their tops, while different figures would enjoy the water under their shade. There were sculptures of beautiful women, a group of half-naked warriors, and a handful of children at the last one. It reminded me of something out of a Roman era fountain, straight out of a history book. I was already thinking about appointing the man as my chief architect. My lord. Oleg interrupted me, and seeing his eyes, I knew it was important. What is it? I asked, walking away with him, and when nobody was near to earshot, he laid it out plainly. The crazy bitches completed the first raid. They left no survivors? It was a complete massacre. I expected as much. Refugees are coming down from the northern villages, afraid of the news of the slaughter. Divert them here. I need their workforce anyway. What else? We are already collecting them. The thing is, the woman sent a messenger directly to me. She says they looted something. Well, unique. Did she say what? No. The message only stated that Lady Sasha would love it. That daughter of a bitch. I cursed. Surprising Oleg, who waited for me to explain. She either got her hands on some magic books or the crystals I was looking for all this time. Gather the men. I am going to see them. Now. Yes, my lord. 53. Chapter 30. CC. Before going, I grabbed Sasha, telling her to be ready because it could be that she would have to activate the formations under their base way sooner than I anticipated. But I really hoped that wouldn't be the case. It would be such a waste of time and resources. After we arrived, some female bandits waited for us escorting the group into their home, which was now littered with hundreds of boxes as they went over their fresh loot. Surprisingly, they were well organized, and I could see a pile of parcels, untouched, separated from the rest. Yo, laughed Yuri, coming to greet us. She was still covered with patches of dried, blackish blood, 
we already separated some for you to take away, you will love them, my dear hubby, I am not your hubby, and don't call me dear, it makes me wretch, sure, baby, sure, she grinned, ignoring me, glancing at Sasha, but she was now playing her game differently, disregarding Yuri as if she wasn't even there, come, let me show it to you, I was sure she did not say come, I could swear, but I was not here to argue about it, when we walked over with my guards and saw what was inside the crates, I wanted to swear, I was sure of it as Sasha's brows were constantly furrowing, relaxing, and then contracting again, giving her a pretty funny appearance, where did you get these, I asked in a firm voice, leaning forward and picking out one small block from the box, they were all like an oversized plum seed, the smallest was comparable to a mobile phone in my old world, while the biggest was comparable to a coffee table, to the touch, they felt like rough, unpolished stone and were milky white in color, the noble we killed and ransacked, had it, they were sitting in the basement of his little courtyard without any marks, so they are not the church's property, well, they could have been once, but who cares, have you ever robbed them, I asked, weighing the strange stones that, even though their sizes varied, none felt heavier than a kilogram, the church, Yuri asked, tilting her head, a few times, yes, they are nothing special and are just another arm of the state, they are responsible for searching for mages and collecting resources for them, preaching is just secondary, why, are you afraid of them, she grinned widely, thinking she had something on me now, no, I just want to deal with them later, I already have plans to kill them silently and replace them with my own people so they can send back reports that all is well here, Snicky Tilda, I am getting wet, want to fuck, no, I answered before Sasha could because the moment she opened her mouth, I felt the stone in my hand turning hot and becoming slightly more orange colored, and we will take these, now, hey, I knew you would love this gift, I do, and delegate a few of your bitches to keep an eye on the looted region, I want to know where these came from, you do know how to talk to a woman, eh, Yuri moaned, licking her mouth, then performed an exaggerated noble's bow, we will do so, with Sasha, we coordinated the others to carry the boxes out, and soon, a carriage arrived to pick them up, I brought them to the scene of the old mine where we could test them out without worrying about destroying something, especially after it was flooded, Oleg, send some trustworthy soldiers to the city, I want them to observe the church and their people at every passing minute, I said as we were traveling, and I was immersed in my thoughts for a little while, yes, my lord, he nodded, riding further up, speaking with two of his men who sped away, heading towards my budding city, Leon, and I smiled, looking at Sasha, who was still squirming a little, these stones are weird, I feel a slight vibration in my body whenever I look at them, is it uncomfortable, no, it's nice, that is the problem, Haw. Oh, it tingles, me, you know, oh, I blinked my eyes and barely held back my laughter, making her pout, not funny, it is, uncomfortable, they are just rocks, why are they like this, well, they are not just stones, but I get you, I am sure they have a ton of official names, but I will start calling them, CC, CC, why, control crystals, in short, CC, a good and short designation that is easy to remember, and I will appoint them as a resource that nobody but I can deal with, you say it makes you tingle, we don't know what other effects they may have, and what if they are problematic for a mage, could they be addictive, I wouldn't be addicted to them, HMPH, of course not Tilda, I hugged her closer, giving her a deep kiss, I would make sure that toys like this wouldn't satisfy you, but this can be dangerous, so I will monopolize them just as I monopolized you Tilda, poor, bad, you are bad, I know Tilda, while sending most of the loot to my city, I took one box with us to the flooded mine, after choosing one that was easy to hold, I gave it to Sasha, telling her to try and focus on it and see what happens, I had no idea how to operate something like this, but, live practice is the easiest way to go about it, it tingles, makes my fingers numb, she explained as she looked at it, trying to concentrate her manner on it, from here, it seems to turn more orange the more you focus, I shouted back, standing a few meters away at the behest of Oleg, who held my shoulders with one hand, 
It is warming up nicely, it is good to hold but it seemingly plateaued, I murmured, and then an idea came to mind, think of Yuri flirting with me, it had an immediate effect, and the crystal turned bright red in just a few seconds. I saw a glowing, crimson magic formation appear behind Sasha, who then shifted towards me, oblivious to what was happening to her. Like I would let it happen, that woman is a beast in human clothing. She snorted, but that seemed like enough of an activation for the new formation. I felt a firm grip pulling at me as Oleg flung me away before dodging himself, and a fireball whizzed past us hitting a tree, making it explode as if a cannonball shot through it. I watched from the ground as flames erupted, consuming the tree and leaving only ash behind before starting to spread. Oh shit, not good. Sasha, try thinking about recalling it. How? She yelled, panicking at what she did as it quickly turned into a spreading forest fire. Just think about slurping it up like some soup. I don't know, you are the witch. Well, I didn't expect it to work, but it did. Like trained dogs listening to their owner's whistle, the flames returned to her, now swirling around Sasha's body like a whirlpool. It was interesting to see fire act like this, but I couldn't get close as the heat was still continuing to rise higher and higher. How is it now? I shouted, raising my arm, feeling it hard to breathe because of the heat waves. Fine, she yelled back, it is like taking a hot bath on a cold night. It feels so satisfying. I bet the formation in the air behind her was glowing intensely, and I could see the multiple intricate signs inside slowly turn, realigning themselves as her thoughts changed. I was so glad for my brain to still have its functions from my previous life as now I could record them and look back later on while resting. I felt like I was taking a glimpse at how this world's laws were working in real time. Think of calming down. Try turning it off. It was hard to shout feeling as if I was breathing right next to a blacksmith's oven, burning my lungs. I was glad that it was Sasha who I was working with, as even though she was a bit panicky, she was surprisingly adept when it came to learning and handling magic, she was a natural. But maybe all witches were. I watched as the flames began cooling down, retreating and dissipating, leaving behind a completely scorched area around her, my lord. Now I understand why they are whisked away and used sparingly. That fire was like flames from the underworld. Unleashing that on an enemy would be more deadly than a well-equipped army. Didn't you get used to it fighting beasts that breathe fire in the winter? I asked, looking at Oleg with raised eyebrows. The monster's flames don't feel this hot, my lord. You may be right. I whispered, finally being able to approach Sasha and realizing a problem. She was naked. Okay. It was not a problem, but a bonus. KHM. Oleg had already turned away, not looking, and it was what prompted her to cry out. My clothes, they are gone. Duh. I grinned, exploring her curves to my heart's content. You have grown. Seeing you now in natural sunlight, I must say, a good diet is all a girl needs. You you ooh. I can't go back like this. She continued shrieking, trying to cover herself but didn't know where to put her tiny hands. Why not? You are perfect Tilda, with a grin. I couldn't help but start tickling her as she protested and laughed at the same time, hugging me. I will crawl under your clothes then. Sure Tilda, but enough playing. I whispered, kissing her and giving her my clothes as I didn't mind heading back in nothing but my underwear. What you did here was eye-opening. Was it? Of course. I whispered, taking the completely intact CC from her hands. No wonder this is important for mages, in a battle, it can significantly enhance and focus your spells. Didn't you notice how much easier it was to control the flames? Still, it has a wind up and cool down time, it wasn't instant. What are you thinking about? She asked, looking curiously at my face, holding a sweet smile that made my heart melt more than her fires. Just some fancy idea, something unreasonable. Like, and don't laugh. What if I can store mana in them? What if I can program them somehow and activate their effects at specific times or in different conditions? Could then they be used by even someone like me? Or more importantly, could I make them to be the energy source of some particular machines? 50. Chapter 31, Experimenting. Back home, the construction was still going on, entering the phase when people were building the outer city where most future residents would find a home for themselves. 
these houses were less spacious and not meant for those who had been there since the first day. Still, they were leagues better than what most people were used to, and the moment they were finished, we could begin erecting the first wall around the city. That will be an actual undertaking. As groups were emerging, with enough experience to take over in delegating the work and showing the newcomers how it was done, I was free to start studying my newest resource. My first problem showed itself when we were still returning with Sasha, and I tried breaking one of them apart. It just didn't work. Even if I beat it against a slab of stone, it remained whole, without scratches or dents. Then I tried cutting it. Nothing. Smashing with a hammer. No results. I threw it into a kiln. Of course. It withstood it without a problem. It didn't even get hot. Is this the most resilient piece of ore in the world, or what? Well, this is a problem. I shrugged, visiting Sasha who was in the middle of designing the interior of the palace, and she was wholly immersed in how it should look, working on it with none other than little Merlin. What problem? they asked, turning towards me. I am running out of ideas on what to do with these cc's and how to split them apart. How are they mined? Merlin asked, quickly narrowing it down to the question also floating within my head. It is a good question. I shrugged, rubbing his head, but I can't really go to the empire, ask them. Hey so. These strategic resources that only you can access. So, how are they mined? Why? Oh, I'm just curious, that's all. I see. He nodded, thinking, you are right, my lord. And magic won't be of use as they react to it then. <clears throat> Why not hit one with another? Fuck. I stopped as I exclaimed, wanting to hit myself instead, that's it. Leon. Not before the child. Sasha grumbled. But Merlin just looked up at her with an innocent smile. I heard worse. I know that coarse people use it to express intense feelings when they can't do it otherwise. You little shit. I grinned, pulling on his face, stretching it. Are you calling your daddy here uncultured? No, my lord. He giggled, answering without complaining. TSK. You win this round, kiddo. I don't know why I never thought about that. It is evident in hindsight. I started out small, beating two at each other, and the moment the impact happened, both shattered into a dozen pieces. Okay, so this needs to be refined, or I will destroy my stash. For the second try, I picked out basically the same sized cc's. And this time, I put one on a table and hit it with the second one. Success! I exclaimed when only one was smashed apart like a glass. How quaint! I couldn't help but wonder about the properties of CC. What happened right now partially ignored a fundamental natural law in my previous life. So I had to develop some tools to help me study it. This led me down a road that kickstarted some extra development I didn't expect. First, I needed a universal weight system as I couldn't go on with my feelings alone. I could have used what was present in the Empire's books, but they were using past temper as body parts as a base. Screw that. So, how did I decide about what was a kilogram? Easy. Thanks to my memory, I could quickly determine how long a meter, centimeter, etc., was, and I had already used it while building the city. It was normal for me to draw the plans with those included, and Merlin had already taught it to the masses. The little genius didn't even question it. Accepting it at face value and deriving the rules of the decimal system, correctly guessing all the exchanges. I was still somewhat doubtful he was not a reincarnated person. Oh well, less work for me. Going by the same method, I grabbed a bucket and drew the scales on it after recalling a simple image within my brain box. When it was done, I filled it up with water. And there, one liter of water equals one kilogram. Of course, I knew it would be off because of the weight of the bucket, but, oh well, I am creating it now, in this world, one kilogram will be this from now on, and if one of my old teachers pops up here, he can suck it, now, it was time to make my weights, and as they were nothing but lumps of iron, it was easy to make the best thing to train my future blacksmiths on. I quickly gathered individuals who either showed interest or even had some background in making horseshoes, fixing tools, and the like. After reworking Sasha's formation inside the blacksmith's workshop, it was burning with less intensity, making it bearable for us, mere mortals, to exist. 
for what I needed now, this was enough. I began introducing them to my new invention as I was explaining it. It was less challenging than I expected, and I saw Merlin lingering close by, watching intently, nodding his little head occasionally. After a few tries, the first, ideally one kilogram plates, were made. I left a set for them to replicate and gave them my first scale to measure the completed pieces. I was glad to see that Merlin jumped at the occasion that there was something new to learn and teach, and by the time I left, he was explaining to the others again why it was crucial to develop a new, unified system. Now, where was I? I murmured, snapping my fingers as I remembered. Yes, I wanted to weigh the CC fragments. After a week's worth of detour, I was back at my initial experiment, putting them on my new scale with the correct weights, and there it was. No matter what I did, they all had the same weight, 1.5 kilograms. The one that was as big as a ring, 1.5. The one that was the size of a head, 1.5 magic, I murmured as it was inconceivable yet real, even if I broke one apart, the two new sides were identical, 1.5, the other weird thing was that when breaking them up, the stationery was the one that always broke apart when hitting them against each other, even if I smashed a smaller cc against a much bigger one, was this a perfectly elastic collision, where did the kinetic energy go, what the hell was happening, I didn't know, what I did know was that they acted like nothing I had knowledge about. I was never a scientist, only an engineer, so it baffled me, but it was not enough to make me stuck. So what if their weight remained the same? What if they don't indeed follow the laws of energy transfer? These were fucking magic crystals. Hee <laughs> hee. After developing a more sophisticated version of breaking them apart, I could start determining their efficiency. Are the big ones better? Or could the smaller ones do the same? That experiment happened once again at the abandoned mine. Oleg made sure to surround the area with his men, keeping everyone from coming close to sabotage us while doing the tests. I brought Merlin along this time, and he was so excited I barely recognized him. I had never seen him chatting and babbling so rapidly, asking a hundred questions about CC and magic, to which I had no real answers. Merlin, we are here to explore what they can do. So, if you want answers, you must also start experimenting with them. Okay, yes, my lord. He nodded while jumping up and down in place, saluting towards me. Calm down for now, this can be dangerous. Last time, Sasha shot a fireball at me, it was an accident. She shouted back, hearing me despite being almost a hundred meters away. Understood. He grinned, hiding behind me, you little. Hey. Okay. I shrugged, waving at Sasha. Do it. She was standing with a lump of CC in hand, almost as big as Merlin's little head. After focusing her thoughts and mana, a formation appeared right behind her once again before a fireball flew out, hitting the water in the flooded quarry this time. Whoa. Both of us exclaimed as Merlin's eyes were shining brightly. Of course, Sasha was not finished, as she was switching to a smaller piece about the size of an almond. The fireball came out once again, but as I had expected, it was weaker noticeably weaker, it broke, shouted Sasha, and after turning off her magic, she rushed to us, showing the tiny CC continuing to crumble until it turned to dust, so there is a size that makes them into a one-use item, I nodded, maybe the big ones are also eroding, would using them multiple times end in them breaking apart, hm. this will have to be tested, I will do it, Merlin yelled, and I couldn't help but laugh, you just want to play with them, no, yes, Honest boy, I grinned, ruffling his hair and nodding. Leon, is, is this, you know, Sasha murmured, feeling shy, but he may be too young to feel that way when holding it. So far, he didn't mention anything weird when standing close to CC. Ah, well, right until Sasha gave him the big one. The moment it landed in his hands, he dropped it, falling to his knees, his face turning bright red, and it was the first time I saw him close to crying. I peed. He sniffled, looking up at us, panic-stricken. He's yours. I shrugged, and to my surprise, Sasha, like a good mother, quickly ensured Merlin was cleaned up and changed without any awkwardness. On the second try, he was now much more collected, expecting something strange, and with a serious face, he resisted, nodding his little head. I withstood it. You are both meanies. 
you didn't tell me about it makes you pee. Uh, holding my laugh, I chortled, unable to fully keep it under wraps. We thought it would not affect you as you are still too young. Um. Now I should. Do. Magic stuff, yes? He asked, quickly forgiving us as he was keen on learning something new and exciting. Yes and but it was too late. A massive, blue formation appeared right under our feet, spinning way faster than Sasha's. Look at that, I murmured, memorizing the symbols as fast as I could. Leon, cried Sasha, and I watched her panic as a red formation materialized behind her, responding not to her mana but resonating directly with Merlin's. A new fireball was forming in the hand of Sasha as she began sweating and breathing heavily. I could not feel any heat coming from it, which just made it more dangerous. Lord, I heard Oleg's shout, already rushing in, but that would be useless anyway. Aim towards the sky, I said, holding Sasha, helping her aim. When Merlin managed to snap back to reality, he quickly began reining in his powers, trying to turn them off. The moment his formation disappeared, Sasha's spell blasted off, throwing all of us to the ground. Looking up towards the sky, I watched a bright sphere soar higher and higher, just like a rocket launch. It had to be a few kilometers high when it finally exploded. The sound reached us a second later, and it was like a dragon's roar, echoing through the whole region. Holy shit, I gasped, sitting up. That was fucking awesome. The ball of fire was still flickering and glowing in the sky, dying off very slowly. Lord, I arrived at Oleg with another shout, inspecting me first like I just survived an assassination attempt. We are fine, fine. I waved my hand, checking on the two mages, and Merlin was at the edge of tears again, feeling he had done something terrible. Chin up, kiddo. I grinned, patting his face. This is what experiments are about. This is progress. If this is progress, Sasha moaned, unable to move. I want to rest before we make another advancement. I feel numb. Like when we shut up. She groaned, turning red as a tomato. Not before Merlin. What is it? He asked sheepishly, returning to a good mood after my encouragement, and I couldn't help but tease them a little more. Nothing Merlin tilde. Sasha here just peed herself the same. I did not. But you usually do when? No. Don't listen to him, this time, I didn't hold back any laughs as I was not just happy but excited, magic, damn, I need to harvest its forms, if I can manage it, I will have rockets that can escape the pull of gravity before I invent any type of combustion engine, 45, chapter 32, unexpected trouble, for the next few days, I was holed up in my library, using my newest, shiniest giant tables filled with drawings of the magical circle that appeared under us. My goal was to gain some understanding of Merlin's ability as it was clearly some strengthening type. He was a natural support character. Previously, he made the formations of the mine work better now, with his mana being focused, which forced Sasha to release her own spell without any chance of saying no. Looking at the hundreds of new runes inside of it, I finally got an even clearer picture while replaying in my mind what really happened. You should rest a little. It was Sasha who arrived, gently rubbing my back. But I was too excited even to register her words. This is awesome. I began blabbering like a little child. Looking back at it, Merlin's magic is acting like an amplifier. The moment it activated, it sensed your presence. And look at this. After a bit of rummaging through the dozens of big papers filled with my drawings, I found the one where I circled a dozen or so runes. Look, this is precisely your formation. Mine? You mean, the one I left behind on the ground once? Exactly. Merlin's own rotated and threw out the unnecessary runes right until the point they matched yours. It automatically synced up with yours. Do you know what this means? It means Merlin's magic formation has all the runes. I have all the building blocks of magic, right here, right on this table. Are you sure? She asked, feeling it hard to believe. No, but I am pretty confident. The fact that it mimicked yours and amplified your strength means that Merlin can use his inborn gift to boost any other mage's output. He is like a little dynamo. What's that? A little mechanic thing that converts a doesn't matter. What I'm saying is that if your spell has a strength of 10, with Merlin's help, it will have the strength of a hundred. He is invaluable. Is he? She murmured, sounding dejected. 
smiling in a somewhat sad and jealous way. Don't be like this Tilda. I giggled, hugging her waist. You are just as invaluable to me. I whispered, kissing her cheek. I will still need to study these runes a lot as I can't really reference them, and putting them together willy nilly could cause problems. I don't want to blow us up. Yeah? Me neither. Anyway, it explains why he is good at learning and teaching, his natural disposition is to help others get better. I think the moment he becomes a teenager, I am going to make him my prime minister. It is best to delegate tasks so everyone can focus on the things they are the best at. He is already teaching a lot of the others. He will help me select the perfect person for the post sign need. And what will I do? You will be my empress, of course. So you will help with my personal projects, Tilda. This immediately drew a happy and satisfied smile onto her face. And I was about to kiss her when a knock disturbed my thoughts, and Oleg entered, saluting at us. I have a report to make, my lord. Yes, it's from the Hunners. Question mark Sasha looked at me questioningly, and I just chuckled, telling her I gave that nickname to the gang of Yuri. I felt it to be reasonable. What happened now? They had their second raid, and they found. Don't tell me it is another stash of CC. I shouted, my heartbeat increasing. I can't have this land to be a secret source of their crystals, or I would be fucked if I disturb the flow of their rare resource. They will come in force to establish order, and that is the end of my dreams. And no, Oleg answered, surprised by my fearful voice. Phew. Hallelujah. That would have been catastrophic. Why? Sashu asked. But before I could continue, Oleg interrupted me hastily. My lord. They found evidence of collusion between the church and minor nobles. They are mining CC and selling them to other regions under the table. What? There. Fuck. What a nice place I will live in. Cool. You won't be living here. Sasha said coldly, watching Eurybasida looking around my half-completed throne room. I think the white and gold is coming along nicely. A bit of red would make it pop. I only slightly looked up from my chair in the middle of the raised platform, watching her spin over and over again taking in the room's appearance. I was somewhat satisfied as this place would be where the future of my own little empire would be decided. Right now, only my throne was prepared, and the space before it was still empty. Still, soon enough, there will be a long table where my future ministers can sit down, have their debates, and present their conclusions to me afterward. It's not real gold. I spoke up, interrupting them my eyes returning to the stacks of papers in my hand. It's just paint. Really now? Yuri hummed, walking closer to one of the golden pillars, touching and knocking it and feeling that it was made out of wood and painted to look like solid gold. Is this made with magic? It is so real. You can think of it like that. I shrugged, not wanting to explain it to her. That was when Sasha chortled, looking down at her. It is made out of beasts. It's pretty easy if you have a little basic knowledge but that would be too much for you. Enlighten me then, my Queen Tilda. Yuri grinned, turning towards her, and before Sasha could react, she slapped her butt, we will be having threesomes a lot, so don't be shy. Educate me, and I will educate you on how to please a woman. Why 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 you? Enough. I snorted, but deep inside, my mind was already picturing some really wild images. Damn it, brain, get a hold of yourself. I found out when young that the beasts from the mountains other side are strange. Some of their livers produce paint-like fluid in this gold color when they are being disemboweled. It is odorless, which is weird. Anyway, I painted my throne room with animal guts. Happy now? That's badass, my dear. You are making me wet again. Yuri grinned, letting Sasha go, walking before my throne, and looking up towards me with a grin. Once again, she was barely wearing anything, letting her scarred and somewhat mutilated body be on display. Brain, stop. Don't be horny. Enough. Whore. Sasha spat, walking past her and sitting on the armrest of my chair, gently caressing my hair, providing a very seductive image, clearly provoking Yuri, my dear wife. This does not help my horny brain right now, and I need to focus on the new pieces of information. This thing was troublesome, extremely troublesome, it seemed that the previous village's governor, who was offed by Yuri's gang, had been secretly working with the church for the past two years without notifying anyone else. 
they found a vein in the mountains, and they have been slowly chipping at it, gathering cc up and slowly selling them away, their stash was as full as we found it because it took a lot of work to find a buyer, and they had to be careful, very careful, if I didn't deal with this carefully, this could be bad, so, any rewards, some extra, you can knock me up, I will give you an air, I will pass, I answered before Sasha could, you brought me trouble, not joy, with this discovery, I groaned heavily, I'm up for a spanking too, I am hungry for some quality fun time besides cutting some poor fucker, she grinned, and I could swear her eyes were glittering with delight, I will reward you if you go and work with Oleg and begin openly arresting the remaining nobles, I said in a firm voice, putting the papers down and looking directly at her, only kill those who resist, their heads need to be intact because I will need them for later, Roger, that is why you called us here, yeah, Oleg is waiting for you, follow his orders, can you do that or not, woof, I was watching her wiggle her butt towards me while leaving, and I couldn't help but shake my head, trying to throw out the evil and perverted thoughts, I can do it better, Sasha murmured, which finally made me chuckle, for sure Tilda, ha, this news really took a dump on my dinner table, what will we do now, she asked, feeling nervous as she didn't want to be discovered by the empire, I already had a talk with my parents, father has mobilized our army and is closing down the border crossings, we will conduct a raid on all the nobles and arrest them one by one, that will, it's not the end, I continued, raising a hand to halt her thoughts, I determined to be proactive, I planned to sacrifice Yuri and her gang, but, now I am thinking otherwise, they are proving to be useful, so I will retrain them to be my knife in the dark, I don't know if they can be trained, I will just need to keep Yuri in check, and she will deal with her goons, working with Oleg is the first test, if they fail, I instructed him to kill them all, but I need a group for my dirty work, one that I can deny any connection to if they are caught, anyway, back to the problem at hand, we will capture the priests, too, and bring everyone to the capital, of course, those who are in the know of why, their head figures, well, only their heads will come with us, so that the empire doesn't come and do it themselves, are you going to use this against your uncle, too, you do learn quick, I grinned, giving her a kiss, making her smile happily, yep, they wouldn't believe it could have been done without a proper noble's help, mother is already on her way to visit Elliot in secret, they will plant evidence in my pig of an uncle's treasury and also into those nobles ledgers who are firm supporters of him, then we will let the empire clean house and reward us for being good puppies, if they believe our story, I will be persuasive, I laughed, but yes, that was an unknown factor, waiting to be seen, and you will need to hide the fact that there is a mine here, yes, that is why the top figures will be made sure to be dead, and only their heads will come with us, I nodded heavily, we will make it so that my uncle is the mastermind, sourcing CC and making a big profit for himself, this also means when we go to the capital city, we are bringing along all the CC we have, we need to show our loyalty to the empire, this is a risky move, but, I think pulling it off will ensure that they don't bother us in the foreseeable future, why not just work with the church, Sasha, my dear, I never expected you to ask something like this, I grinned, knowing she hated them, I am not unreasonable, she pouted cutely, making me tickle her and pull her into my lap, I won't work with them because that would make me an accomplice, and if things go down, I would be easily blackmailed, no, I will pretend to be the most loyal subject and make sure this backwater region remains out of the focus of the big and scary empire, at least, until we can defend ourselves, 46, chapter 33, Yuri's story, traveling to the empire's capital city would be long and exhausting, I knew that, and my estimations told me that I would probably miss a good chunk of the year, so I ensured everyone had their missions and tasks delegated while I was gone, when I returned, I made it clear what I wanted to see finished and left everything to my mother and Sasha, take care, Sasha murmured, standing next to my carriage when I was about to board it, I know you want to come, but what if they discover your gift, I smiled at her, giving her a long kiss, I'll be back before you know, don't worry, I will satisfy him, echoed Yuri's loud voice from the side, 
sitting atop her horse. HMPH, don't knock up that crazy one, she whispered to me, almost making me choke on my saliva. I am sure she has some disease between her legs. Well, my dear Sasha, your jealousy is something else. I didn't wait any longer as it would be a tiresome trek anyway, so it was time to move out instead of further delaying it. First, we would visit my uncle's place, and Elliot would join us, at least on paper. We will conduct an official visit to the capital, all because of some new trading rights, that is what my uncle Piggy would be told. It was a half-truth, as our cargo would be the heads and his life, not that he would want to come, as leaving his castle is already a strain on his great figure. Your bandits were surprisingly obedient. Father chuckled, sitting at the opposite side of me, taking up the two-seater, looking out the window, watching Yuri ride her horse along with Oleg following all the orders of the soldiers. Hey, I didn't think it would be possible. I was also surprised, but it shows they are trainable. Vicious and bloodthirsty but controllable. As long as I know what Yuri wants. MMHM. She is a sick woman, but that makes it interesting. Those scars on her show remarkable will to survive and continue living despite her appeal being destroyed. Jeez, you are ruthless, dad. Anyway, make her dress up properly when getting to the capital. There are laws in place that dictate how much skin she can show. Really now? I asked, as it was my first time hearing about it. Nothing serious, but a long dress or skirt is preferable. Bare shoulders are allowed, but the way she flaunts her almost naked torso would be thrown into a pillory, naked, and offered for public use. What? I choked, taking a sip from my flask, filled with fruit wine. You mean, there is a dress code which, if breached, the offender is punished by public indecency, what is this, Nero's laws, no, Emperor Nero ruled further back, his most famous law that is still remembered is that you can't marry within the family for more than two generations, Emperor Eusborn made the public shaming law some 200 years ago, he loved watching it happen, since then, it remained in effect, what, there, fuck, you see, old laws established by the other rulers are rarely revoked or changed, maybe they get slowly forgotten about, but, changing it goes against the image of the empire, our monarchs are chosen because they are the best of us, their bloodline contains the righteousness of gods, so their decisions can't be wrong or questioned, that is how it is, well, going by their church, the righteousness doesn't last long, eh, I groaned, shaking my head, the massacre that happened a few days ago was surprising, when we confronted the local church, they were fighting viciously to escape, even killing multiple innocents trying to use them as hostages or meat shields. It was a total shit show, so we left none alive. By the end of it, their headless corpses were dragged away by the ordinary people, being paraded around the town. The church's brutal act quickly turned everyone against them, so at least I don't need to find excuses for why we did what we did. We exchanged letters with Elliot. After a brief silence, father added, he will bring the evidence that supports us. The little bastard is really crafty, your mother said his forgeries would fool even her. Is he a bastard as in bastard or? I asked, ready for some juicy gossip, but I was disappointed. Nah, he is alright, I just like calling him that. Anyway, if everything goes smoothly, you will be named the new ruler of our region, and I can finally relax. Huh? Da, he laughed, taking out his own flask and swinging it hard, everything will be your achievement, I will step down, and you will take over, don't worry, I will live in the castle with your mother, beating back beasts in the winter and fucking like bunnies, it will be like when we married, why am I not surprised, I moaned softly, rubbing my face, but it wasn't like I wasn't doing that already, no wonder they were content with letting me do what I wanted. They were enjoying their early retirement. Bwahaha. You will do fine. You are already doing it. Our little caravan was an interesting sight throughout the journey, but it kept most people away when they saw my family's flags. It was a simple but recognizable symbol as it was the image of a white rock before a black mountain, the identifying mark of the frontier region. Our journey went through the middle regions of Ischilia, a very flat land dotted with nothing but thousands of square kilometers of farmland. I thought this whole world was nothing but wheat fields while passing through. What is the long face for my dear? Want me to suck you off? Yuri asked, riding next to me. Just bored, 
nothing more, I answered, not wanting to entertain her offer because it sounded way better than looking at another wheat field. I expected more but, damn, this was just as boring as watching paint dry. Let's do it on the back of the horses. I sit in your lap, and we start galloping. We can fuck by matching the rhythm. Why are you so horny all the time? I asked, looking at her with one eye. I was now questioning if it was a good idea to borrow a horse from one of the soldiers and decide to change up the monotone journey a little. Because I am also bored. So are my girls. At least they can have fun with the guys when we make camp. What? I chortled, looking around, but it made sense. And you are doing nothing? Are you pulling my leg or something? I am keeping myself for you. Yeah, sure. If I lie, fuck one of my eyes out, she said forcibly, and I was surprised by how serious she was. I can't risk it. My young baby daddy, stop calling me weird names. It's the truth. If some other dick yielding blabberfuck makes me pregnant, how am I supposed to bag my princess status? To hell with me if I risk that. I am not fucking around here, literally. You take this extra seriously, aren't you? I shrugged, sighing again. Of course, I learned quick enough that power is everything. My sweet prince, you are my ticket to the seat of ultimate power. Are you seeing me as a vibrator? I don't know what that is. What does it vibrate? Sounds fun. Whatever, I waved a hand, not wanting to get into it, were you always like this? Pretty much, only I was more put together, I still had both of my breasts until I turned 13, then one was mangled so much in a fight it had to go, what type of fight? I asked, curious about her past, life or death, most of my battles were that, she explained it without issues, telling me everything without wincing or looking hurt, I was sold away early, my first memories are about being railed in a cheap brothel, so but before I could even say the word, she waved her hand, nah, it happens, I don't care because I made my own fortune, by the time I was 10, I had 7 kills under my belt, and I robbed the fuckers blind, it was easy to get into their bed as little bitch, good sex, and I slit their throats while doing it, they never suspected a thing, and then I just had to leave with the money, you do realize that this makes me more reluctant to get naked with you? Don't worry, my prince, she laughed. I wouldn't hurt my ticket to a good life. No wonder you are this wicked. Shit, you have been disfigured in the head. I'm liking it like this. She countered me with a hearty laugh. I am me, pure and undiluted passion. I wear no fake masks and say no honeyed words because I am what I show. Have a problem with it? Too bad. Aha ah ha. How did you collect the rest of the girls? I asked before she would go on another tangent. Train them myself. The first of my partners is no longer alive, but she accompanied me to a guy to serve him, and when I offed the old brick, she got hooked on it there and then. We did multiple heists together, and it was awesome. Later on, we gathered more girls, and, well, here we are. What happened to her? Blown up. We had a botched run in with a mage. We realized it too late, and when she struck down while riding the guy, an energy field blocked her swing and blew off her torso. Instant death. Luckily, he thought it was her idea, and I could play it off as a scared little girl. Wait, wait, wait. I almost yelled out, and Jury just shrugged. It was a quick death. It was always a possibility in this type of work. She began speaking, rolling her eyes. What energy field are you talking about? Oh, that? It took her a while to continue, recollecting her memories. Yeah, I think it was the necklace he was wearing. It lit up before turning into dust. It blocked the strike, and the rebounding force tore him apart like a paper doll. Was it CC? I asked, not really expecting an answer. MMM. It could have been. I don't remember too many minute details. My mind was focused on playing the crying, terrified little girl persona to not get killed. Are you sure it was a mage? Yep, he used a long incantation afterward, cleaning up the mess with a spell. It was the first time I saw magic. It was pretty awesome, but I wanted to avoid running into another one, so we moved to your region. I guessed that in a backward place, there were easier targets. It had to be a one-time use artifact, I whispered, already thinking about multiple possibilities. So they have artifacts developed, one-time use trinkets, maybe even weapons? I guess I won't really be able to find out more about them, not even in the capital city, 
but that doesn't mean I won't try. 33. Chapter 34, Luna. While traveling forward, my mind was stuck on thinking about the usage of CC. So, techniques that gave them different properties and made use of them were already developed. My next question was, how far did they go with it? What could I do with them? How will I get my hands on some samples to reverse engineer it? I discussed this with my uncle, too, while traveling, having exciting debates with him throughout the nights. The perfect reason to ignore Yuri, who was trying to rape me. No, I'm not joking. One night, I woke up to her sneaking into my tent, all naked, trying to tie me up. It was the harshest beatdown my guards received from Oleg and me especially from my general because I made him responsible for failing to guard me, and he took it to heart. Good, because Yuri is a wild card, and what if she decides that she wants to relive her old habits? I had a feeling that it all happened with my father's blessing because I had seen him laugh, turning his back to me. We are getting close, my lord. It was Oleg's voice that disrupted my thoughts, and he was talking to my father. Leaning out of the carriage, I could see a massive city in the distance. It was right in the middle of a flat field, and a circle of 30 meter high walls surrounded its central part. Before that monstrosity, I could see a secondary city and then a circular moat. No, it wasn't a moat, that was a river. I was sure it wasn't natural as it was a perfect circle where the city stood while flowing from the north and heading down south. I know of no river that does a roundabout by itself. From the land, nine bridges connected to the secondary circle, and we were on a stone road, heading towards one of them. Now, this is what I expected. I whispered as this was the type of city I imagined when I realized I had been granted a new life. It is unique. Father laughed, patting my shoulder. This city has never been conquered and has been standing here for thousands of years. At least, that is the legend. Yeah, sure. Yuri scoffed her eyes more interested in the passing by caravans, and I knew she wanted to rob them. Although her scarred body was now hiding behind standard leather armor, I could see her fingers twitching on her horse's rein. The outer city is where 60% of the population is concentrated. Father continued explaining, the nine bridges are all numbered and lead to different regions of the Empire of Ishilier. Our first stop will be at the foot of the ninth bridge. They will be examining our identities and until they are confirmed, be mindful. I am a Viscount, but that means nothing here. I know, I don't. Yuri added, and father looked at me, telling me with his eyes that she would be my responsibility. Come here. No, I will go there. I grunted and climbed out of the carriage window, quickly hopping onto her horse and hugging her from behind. Oh? Are we finally fucking? No, I answered, holding her waist down as she was already leaning forward ready to press her bottom against my crotch. I am here to tell you what you need to know, and you will listen to me. I am saying it directly into your ear, so you can't say you didn't hear it. TSK, go on, she grunted, sitting back properly. First, you and Oleg are my personal guards. Only speak when I permit it. Hey, are you playing the role of the owner of my leash? I am your owner, I replied coldly, and I could see her shiver a little. Should I choke you out again? Yeah? That made me come so hard. When I heard what she said, somehow, I didn't doubt Yuri. Listen to me. I raised my voice before she went into a degenerate chanting once again. We are a Viscount. Above us here are still Counts, who rule the neighboring land, and Earls, who oversee certain parts of the city. They are more or less equivalent here but they are above us. Even if an Earl here has as much land under him as a village in our region, he is still above me in rank. Okay, okay. Don't piss off my boss's boss. Got it. Not just that. There are still the ranks of Marquis and Duke above them. Piss off the wrong people, and I will toss you to the wolves. Want to be powerful? Yeah? She nodded, grinding her crotch against the saddle. Powerful enough to piss on the current Emperor's head? Oh fuck yeah. She moaned even louder, shuddering. Then follow every word I say while here, and you can get closer to that power. Screw this up, and I abandon you without fucking you once. Got it? Jeez, you know how to speak to a woman. I'm wet. No. You are fucking crazy. I shrugged, turning her head away as she wanted to kiss or bite my face. I couldn't really tell. Focus on the road, got it? Yeah, my master. Ah, shit. Talk to me like this next time, too. 
If you spark my fantasies this hard, I will get pregnant from your voice alone, son. I turn towards the carriage, seeing my father flash a thumbs up at me. Keep her in line, just like that. Don't worry. A few concubines are normal for an emperor. Thanks, daddy. Yuri cheerfully shouted back at him while I couldn't help but shrug. This was building up to be a disaster. The stop at the bridge went smoother than I first expected. The structure itself was around 20 or 30 meters wide and had two lanes, separated in the middle by a waist height wall. The left one was for the regular people and merchants to use, coming and going in great quantity, while the right side was for nobles. Thanks to this, we didn't have to wait for long. A handful of soldiers appeared at a moment's notice and conducted the inspection of our identities from Mythic Codex. Watching their armor, it was clean, new looking. It consisted of black cloth undergarments with shiny, silver plates strapped to their arms, chest, and legs, giving the feeling of a knight, but not one that would be useful in battle. Mainly because these were highly decorated and way thinner than they should have been, with golden accents and the image of a sun plastered everywhere on it. You don't use armor like this for battle, not when the soldier would drag it through mud and guts. Show offs. I murmured as silently as I could. But Yuri next to me clearly heard it because she let out a small chuckle. Luckily, it didn't bother anyone, and after father proved who we were, including my uncle, before we were let into the city, my follow-up surprise came from being assigned a whole courtyard to stay in, with a fully supplied stable and maids waiting for us. It wasn't as big as my newly built palace, but it was still impressive. At least being a noble had its advantages. While we entered, I tried scanning the outer city, and I could tell that most buildings here were made out of stone, and people were well dressed. Most important of all, nothing smelled like piss and shit, which meant the frontier region was just that. A shithole. Well, not anymore. Ha, I will trump this city with mine. What are you grinning for? Yuri asked. But before she could poke my sides, Oleg grabbed her wrist with full force, making her moan. You are gonna break my wrist, big guy. How will I jack off my prince then? Don't touch him. I wasn't in the mood to interact with the two, so I left them there and began exploring our temporary home. Since my scolding, Oleg has become hypersensitive. The best course of action was to let him cool down. As for Yuri, probably, euthanasia would be the only solution. As nobles, my father, my uncle, and I had a different wing to ourselves in the mansion that reminded me of a renaissance era chateau. My room was on the first floor, and opening its heavy, thick wooden door greeted me with a lovely view. It was pretty spacious, having my own huge bed, a separate garden that was only accessible through my room, and a fireplace with a wide couch before it, and right on it slept a young girl. A teenager? She was totally out and defenseless, and she was wearing maid clothing on top of it. Walking closer, I got a better view as she was lying on her back, a half grin on her face, drooling a little. MMM. A gift for the nobles? I asked myself, examining her heart-shaped face that was ripe for placing it between my palms and mushing it a little. Damn, she was cute, like a little kitten. She was compact. That was the best way to describe her, as she wasn't tall. Nor was she thick, but she wasn't as thin as Sasha when I first met her. Although, I couldn't really tell her three sizes, not with this many clothes on. Damn it, Yuri's effect has been poisoning my mind. While I was leaning over her, it seemed my presence disturbed her sleep because it made her wake up and open her mismatched eyes. Oh, we both said, but hers was frightened while mine was amused. Her left eye was green as a polished emerald, while her right eye was the deepest amethyst I have ever seen. A unique beauty. Good morning, sleepyhead. Hiya? With a scream, she scrambled to her feet, climbed over the couch, and fell onto her head, giving me a perfect look at her blue striped panties. This city has better clothing stores and a proper fashion sense. Unlike mine, huh? I already guessed so because of how the people were dressing here. Now I felt like a hillbilly coming to town. My home was centuries behind the capital city. Is this a joke? Are you okay? With a chuckle, I walked over, helping her up, fixing her clothes and messy, long black hair while using the occasion to get a quick, subtle feel. She was soft. Why why yes, um. I was cleaning the room and. Who are you? 
My name is Leon, and I am here on official business with my family. Which family? She asked, looking confused, trying to figure it out. But I looked out of place with my red hair. Since coming here, I have seen nobody else having it. My father is Kalush, Lion of the Frontier. Hiya, the barbarians. Ah, I couldn't help but stand still, feeling my eyelids twitch, watching her get teary-eyed and begin trembling. What she did was probably worthy of flogging. Name? I asked, trying to sound unbothered. But now I finally had a first-hand experience of what the others think about my home, and it made me sound irritated, because I was Luna, my lord. She answered, bowing with elegance, I won't bother she wanted to leave, but I reached out with a hand, stopping her physically. Good. I need a personal maid who follows me around and does what I say while staying here. I will notify the Thank you for volunteering, Luna. I. I did. Didn't. I. She sounded like she was on the verge of a mental breakdown, but I wasn't budging. You did. Just right now. So, Luna. I smiled and probably looked like some kind of cliche evil noble from a soap opera. Please. Show me around the place. 33. Chapter 35. Mugs filled. Next. Who's the little foo? Did I permit you to speak? I asked before Yuri had a chance to finish the sentence. Thought so. She is Luna, a maid who volunteered to show us around. Gee greetings. She curtsied, looking shy and reserved, but I knew that she was probably crying in her head. They are my personal guards. Yuri and Oleg. You can ignore most of the things Yuri says as she is sick in the head. I am not. She answered, but after I gave her a doubtful look, she simply shrugged her shoulders. Whatever. You're the boss. Leon. My father's shout reached me, and as I looked around, I saw him hanging out from one of the windows on the first floor. Heading out. That was my plan. I want to look around the city a little. Don't stray far. We may be insignificant, but that doesn't mean some other nobles wouldn't want to use us in some idiotic ploy. We are only staying for a few days. Don't stir shit up for your old man. The meeting will happen tomorrow. The first thing in the morning. Getting an appointment with the Empress herself was hard, so I want no problems. No worries, Dad. I got it. I am not worried about you. Whatever. We will go over most things with your uncle, and we will have a meeting after dinner. Be back by then. Sure. You. You will have a meeting with there. There. The Empress? Luna asked, stuttering, feeling her legs wobble like jelly. Yeah? Why? I asked not getting her sudden dizziness and why her face had abruptly turned whiter than chalk, meeting the Empress of Envy. I wouldn't dare do that, not even if I am a noble. Huh? We looked at each other before now surrounding Luna. What do you mean? You are really clueless, aren't you? Ha. Huh. Bar KHM. She flinched, holding back her tongue and looking at me with pleading eyes. Can we go to a place where nobody can listen in? I don't want to end up without my head. Please, this sounds juicy. Yuri grinned, licking her lips, and I couldn't help but agree. I'm hungry, Luna. Take us to a place you think is fine, and we will sit down, chat, and have a fulfilling lunch. I have no money, she whispered, which was a surprise. I thought she would catch on quicker. I will pay. Really? It was as if a switch had been flipped. She looked much more eager and ready, the shaking evaporating at once. Her legs standing firm and travel ready. Okay, this isn't a prank, yes? No, I answered seriously and honestly. We are not barbarians. That made her blush and fall silent, looking at the ground, drawing circles with her toes. Now that we have established our first goal, let's go. I am interested in what you can tell us. Maids are nice. Yuri grinned, watching her from behind as we began walking. They can get into nobles' beds and gain some juicy information. I am not that kind of maid. Luna protested, looking over her shoulder. Her face turning red like an apple. Those types of maids always say the same. Yuri countered, but then I interrupted them. I still needed Luna to spill the beans. The best course for this was being on her good side. Just look at her walking, her speech pattern, and how she carries herself. She is a proper maid, and you are a street kid, Yuri. Surprisingly, she didn't shoot back, and watching her eyes, I saw she quickly caught on to what I was doing, playing along. I should remind myself that although she acts crazy, she has sharp senses and a quick mind. Or she wouldn't have lived this long. 
my compliments quickly did their job as Luna walked much more happily next to us, feeling proud, leading us to only a street away from our mansion, right to a two-story restaurant. Mugs filled. Oleg murmured, reading the sign above the front door as we walked in. Filled mugs. Weird. They have been here for more than a hundred years. Luna explained proudly, but I wasn't really listening. On the way here, I was inspecting the roads and buildings, all made out of stone and bricks. There was not one that was made out of wood or any much easier material to get and work with. The way the city was built was a minimum of five or six centuries away from what was present in either our territory or my uncle's region. Not to mention, I didn't see any mines nearby, so all of it had to be transported here from elsewhere. This also meant that the technology that the Empire was sitting on was way more advanced than I first thought about. I just never guessed that there could be this much of a difference between regions within the same Empire. Is he? Okay? Luna asked, and her question knocked me back to reality. He is fine. When my boss's mind gets ticking, he goes into this ultra-focused mode. Then why are you squeezing my thighs? I asked Yuri who quickly withdrew her hands with a grin, not explaining anything, making Oleg snort and Luna blush, let's switch, my general suggested, but we were already seated at a private booth on the second floor, reserved only for nobles, leave it, I shrugged, looking around, examining the empty tables as right now we were the only ones up here, you can't turn a wolf into a sheep anyway, woof, you are weird, Luna whispered, making me look at her, she looked even tinier, with Oleg sitting next to her. Before I could question her, the waitress came up, wearing an article of red and white clothing with an apron, reminding me of how waitresses used to dress in old movies, at least. In my old life, that is, she was young, a teenager maybe, and clearly nervous but also happy that she could serve nobles. Was she expecting tips? Is tipping a thing here? Damn. I truly felt like a country boy coming to the big city for the first time. In the end, I let Luna order for all of us, and going by the names of the dishes, I was sure we would get some chicken and beef with either rice or potatoes. I wasn't sure and couldn't deduce it from the names alone. While the dishes were being prepared, the young waitress suggested we order drinks, and I was expecting the usual. Oleg and Yuri didn't hesitate to call for some wine, while Luna only asked for water. Me? I was feeling mischievous, coffee, most certainly, she smiled, bowing and hurrying away, leaving me or struck, coffee, the others asked, looking at me, and they were just as dumbfounded, I didn't know it would work, I said honestly before shaking my head, I will need to get me some for home, I almost added that I was missing the taste of a good coffee but managed to hold the last part in, I didn't know about any nobles who drink, coffee, it is the ordinary people's drink, it seemed Luna rarely could hold in her thoughts, speaking them out loud again, making Yuri nod, yeah, and soldiers, they say it is the workers and slaves drink, it keeps them functioning longer, bullshit, I scoffed, now feeling angry, it is the best drink, period, Oleg, no, I don't care what you want to say, coffee is the best, I didn't try to say anything, he murmured, glancing away, looking troubled, okay, while we wait, we can have a little chit chat. So, Luna, please explain. I said hurriedly, ending the conversation. Well, this place is. Don't play dumb. I chuckled, seeing her try to divert the topic, Empress of Envy. Why? Please don't say it out loud. It is not something you want others to hear, she pleaded, looking around. But luckily, the waitress hadn't returned yet. She ascended the throne twelve years ago, and since then, they say whenever she found something she liked, it simply disappeared, taken away and placed into her private collection. I know that there have been some laws made that prohibit other nobles from wearing certain colors, like purple, or black, or crimson. Only the royal family is allowed to appear at events, donning those colors. PFT. I could barely hold back my laughter after hearing it. It isn't funny. Luna complained, pouting, turning silent while our drinks arrived. It is. It is precisely what I imagine that some self-centered noble would do, I countered, lifting up my mug and enjoying the aroma I had subconsciously missed for all these years. Oh yes. This needs to be imported, like, immediately. They say people who meet with her try to look mundane, so she doesn't find something interesting about them and takes it away, 
There were rumors that she stopped momentarily, looking around twice before whispering, even people have gone missing. Spooky. But I wouldn't worry. We are here to report, and our family is tasked with guarding the frontier. I don't think our barbarian lineage has anything worthy of an empress. That's true. She nodded, agreeing without hesitation before her mind realized what she had done, turning white and teary-eyed. Barbarian, Oleg scoffed, his fingers squeezing the metal mug in his hand, leaving imprints on it. What a brave observation. Have you ever visited the frontier? And no, Luna answered, looking up at her leg, gulping multiple times, shaking like a lonely leaf in the wind. I bet she never even left the city. Yuri added, leaning back in her chair, enjoying her wine. Why yes, that makes me curious. I interrupted them. What is your background? I am just a maid. Um, nobody important. Explain. I pressed on, resting my chin on my crossed fingers. I can learn it in multiple ways. I just want it from the source first. Haw. Well, I am Luna Gottfried. My family were the servants of Earl Sigismund, but that line died out forty years ago, so since then, we have been dwindling in reputation and numbers. Families that lose their noble backing usually fall further and further down if they don't find a new family to serve. I just finished my training and this was my first job, taking care of an empty mansion. You 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 ooh. I didn't know guests were coming. Why don't you strike out to do something else? A new profession? I asked, honestly curious about her situation. Do what? She moaned, lowering her head in dejection. You don't know what it is like here. Huh? It is all about background, prestige, rank. Families like mine have no chance to rise or change. We have been servants since we wrote memoirs within my family hundreds of years ago, and we will die out as one. Well Sigismund's enemies are still present, and anybody taking us in would also say they are the late Earl's supporters. I thought they died out? Yuri asked, baffled, but Luna just sighed again. That doesn't matter. Not for nobles. Lucky me and my birth. I laughed, looking towards the stairs, seeing our food arrive. I wouldn't want to live here. Luna didn't really get that. But that's fine. I didn't try to explain it either. Instead, I focused on the nice roasted chicken and mashed potatoes. I need to bring back some recipes. They know how to cook. I was just about to finish my meal, enjoying the last bites of food when loud noises interrupted it. Looking at the stairs, I saw a group of young men coming up, wearing flashy blue, gold, orange, and green colored silk clothes. They were like a clown troop, stinking from cheap cologne. Are those silk pants? I moaned, holding my head, rubbing my temple, not believing my darn luck. My lord, Oleg asked, not getting me, and neither did the two girls at our table. Of course they are. Of course. There are silk pants here. Why wouldn't there be? I continued ignoring them, praying for fate not to do it, but of course, it wasn't listening. Or it was and was laughing behind my back. Who's the weird guy? One of them laughed like a hyena as they approached our table. Of course, they are approaching me. Why the fuck wouldn't they? Six. 